Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Harry's New Game Plus Chapter 1 The Beginning of a New Journey Tilda Surrey, cupboard under the stairs, the boy. On a quiet and lonely night, a bright light begins to shine out from under the door of a peculiar house in Surrey. The light poured out from a small closet under the stairs. After a moment longer the light slowly begins to wane and then fades away completely. On his knees from within the small cupboard was a young boy of about 9 to 10 years of age whose eyes were closed as took a few deep and steady breaths. After a moment more he opened his eyes and looked around himself to gain his bearings. So I'm back here again. Even after all that time away, it still looks the same. He mutters to himself quietly. Shaking his head he looks down at himself and quickly notices that he's a lot smaller than he remembered himself to be. I see. It's all coming back to me. That night when everything changed. When I found out the truth and where my long journey began. He wryly mutters to himself. After a moment more, he closes his eyes to concentrate on the fleeting memories of a past he deeply wishes to forget, but knows that in the end, it was his past that has made him who he is. Dash. Flashback start. In the same small and dark cupboard under the stairs, was the same boy on the floor weak and hurt. Ugh. I'm so hungry. Ouch. The boy gasps in pain when he slowly shifts his hands to clutch at his empty stomach. He simply allowed the tears to fall slowly from his eyes as he was barely able to move his arms without causing more pain due to the injuries he'd received from his uncle and cousin had just recently inflicted upon him before roughly shoving him into his prison without food once again. Many people would perhaps wonder what this child might have done to deserve such treatment. Many more would be horrified at finding out the answer. Which is, nothing. Absolutely nothing, his only wrongdoing, according to his so-called family, was that he was born different from them. Not that the child even knew he was different, nor how very different he really was. But he would soon. Dash. Tilda Underworld, Throne Room, Death Goddess. Sitting atop a black throne was a young woman whose face was twisted in anger and despair. The woman was a truly beautiful looking specimen of her gender with her long flowing blonde hair and deep ruby red eyes which were currently staring intently upon a crystal ball that floated lazily in front of her. My poor, poor master. She mutters depressedly. Why are those humans such horrendous beings? And that meddling old fool? That arrogant dark lord? Why? 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 She angrily yells. In response to her growing anger, it seemed like the shadows throughout the throne room seemed to whip and flail from side to side. No more. She screams as she suddenly jumps up off her throne. Moving quickly she walked towards the large solid black marble double door entrance which slammed open as she neared. If no one wants to help my master, then I will. I'll help him get so strong that no one will use or abuse him ever again. And I know just how I'm going to do it. She said as a slow and vicious smile slowly spread across her gorgeous face. Humans. They may live for only a short period of time, well comparatively, but their ingenuity and imagination is both inspirational and something to be feared, she thought contemplatively just as she passed through the threshold of the doorway and was suddenly covered in a shroud of foggy darkness and, for the briefest of moments, she is both at her throne room and somewhere else, and then it's gone and her throne room is now deathly silent. A moment later she steps out a matching marble doorway and with a quick wave of her hand, she banishes it back into nothingness. Taking a moment more, she makes sure she's presentable for her first meeting with her master. Because, no matter what anyone tells you otherwise, first impressions actually matter, she thought with amusement as she pulled off the padlock locking the cupboard door, and looked upon her master in the flesh for the first time. Dash. Tilda Surrey, cupboard under the stairs, the boy. Holding back his sobs and moaning as best as he possibly could, as he was terrified of making too much noise and possibly waking his uncle up. He struggled to sit up against the cupboard wall. Unfortunately, just as he was about to succeed, his arm bangs against something, causing him to yelp and rock forward away from whatever he had banged into. But the pain is too much for his weakened and beaten body. Ugh. 
he grunts in sudden pain. Why, do I? Giving up and he sighs in resignation. At this point, he simply gives up trying to sit up or move at all really. So laying almost face down on the thin mattress, he decided that he would just continue to lay there staring sadly at the door of his small room, cupboard. I'll just rest my eyes for a moment, he thought tiredly and before he realized it, he'd fallen into the restless sleep. He wasn't totally sure what had woken him, his mind groggy with a terrible mixture of pain, hunger, and what might be the beginning of a fever. To him, it felt like it was just a moment ago that he'd closed his eyes to rest when he noticed the briefest flash of light, a loud snap crack sound, and then the gentle and soft hand brushing across his sweaty brow. TSK, those blasted humans. He heard the soft lilting voice of a woman he'd never heard before. It was at this point that his brain decided to catch up and his eyes snapped open in alarm only to stop and stare into two sad ruby-colored eyes staring into his own emerald green. Wah w who? A-I-U-M miss? And how he did? He stuttered and fumbled over his words in shock. For a long moment, the young woman continued to only smile sadly at him while slowly lifting his head onto her lap and gently brushing his back hair with her hand. He knew he should scream for help, or maybe even struggle to get away, but for the life of him. He just couldn't work up the strength or willpower to pull away from her warm embrace and touch. After another minute or two of simply staring at each other, the strange woman decided to talk to him. Hiya Harry, I've been waiting a long time to meet you. Her voice was soothing and gentle and he could honestly say he'd be happy to listen to it for hours if he was given the chance. She smiled softly as she continued to caress his unruly black hair. It was beyond relaxing and he almost found himself drifting off back into sleep, which the strange woman prevented due to her softly giggling at him. His eyes snapped open once more with a deep blush spreading across his face and he realized what had almost happened, he shyly asked her the only question that sprang to mind. Er, uh, W why did you want to meet me? I'm no one special, I'm just your local freak H Harry. He finished lamely only to flinch at the look of almost pure loathing flash across the beautiful woman's face. Her teeth grinding in anger, she replied. You're not a freak Harry James Potter. You're an incredibly special person just like almost everyone in your direct family tree was. Well mostly on your father's side that is. Your mother's side was also special, but it's through your father's side that I am bonded to you. He looks at her confused, but after a moment, his young mind grasps onto him what is the most important thing for a young and lonely child. His missing parents. Why you knew my mom and dad? He asks with some hope sparking through his eyes. The look of hope in his eyes almost makes her cry. It was so innocent and pure. It only made her hate for the monsters who had so far ruined his life grow. He could see again, the wrathful look passing over her face, but after a few deep breaths, the beautiful woman was able to wrangle in her emotions once more before answering him. Yes, in a way, I suppose you could say that I do, or rather did, know them. She smiles sadly at him. Your father, James Andrew Potter and your mother, Lillian Potney Evans, were quite possibly the two most talented magic users of their generation. His brain must have melted under her touch, because he could have sworn she said magic users. But that's impossible. Magic isn't real, he argued to himself. But before he could fully convince himself that was suffering from fever-induced delusions, the beauty continued. You see Harry, you're a wizard, just like your father and his father, and his father's father was and just like your mother was. In fact, your family, the Potters, are one of the oldest surviving magical families left on the planet. Your family has had magic in its veins since even before Christ. To have survived to this day and age is an incredibly rare and special achievement. I'm almost convinced your family was blessed by Mother Magic herself. He was flabbergasted. His family, his, were magical. He honestly couldn't believe it. But now that he thought about it, it would explain so many odd things that had happened to him and why his relatives treated him as they did. Because they knew. They knew he was a wizard, that he was magical and they hated him for it. All those strange events, from Harry growing rapidly in one night, to somehow ending up on the school roof. It all makes sense now. He thought bitterly. And now that he knew, he wasn't sure how he felt about this. The Harry that had been beaten and starved of love and food found himself wondering if he didn't have magic. Would they have loved him? Treated him like family? But there was another part of him, one that was growing stronger each moment as this new information sunk in. I have magic. I have magic, that part of him, a part he never knew he had felt, like something had finally clicked into place. It felt right, good even. While he'd been internally monologuing, the beautiful woman continued on with her explanation. But that's not all Harry, you see, 
You yourself are known as the master of death. My master, I've waited for eons for you to finally be born. Waited and waited and waited. She smiles triumphantly at him for a long moment, only for it to fall off as suddenly as it had arrived. And then I find out what has been done to you, my little master, my Harry. Tears leaked from her ruby red eyes and her hand gently strokes his jaw. Like most young boys, seeing a woman, a beautiful one at that, cries more alarming than a train derailing in front of them. In a desperate attempt to distract her from whatever thoughts had caused her such distress and to bring a rather important question forward he asked her a rather important question. D death? Why your death? He squeaks out in some alarm. She shakes her head negatively no. No I'm a goddess of death, one of many that exist within this universe. Oh and there are reapers as well, but they are more like our little helpers. But you, my little master? You have the pivotal bloodline. You've become the master of the conceptual aspect of death and as such, you're the master of all death gods and goddesses. The tears were gone, thankfully, the beauty looked at him happily, almost expectedly. The Peevils? Who are they? Harry asked confusedly. Her smile grew a little stiff for a moment, before softening once more as she continued gently combing his unruly hair. Right, I'm sorry little master, I briefly forgot that you've been locked in this cupboard for almost your entire damn life. Taking a moment to gather her thoughts she continued with the explanations. The Peevils are your ancestors, Harry. The Potters are the direct descendants of the Peevils' bloodline through marriage of their last living heir and due to numerous reasons, war, diseases, etc, etc, you're the last and only living heir to both their once great families, and only you could claim the title, Master of Death, and its heritage. She answered. Of course. He had no idea what any of that really meant, but he nodded his head and tried his best to remember everything she said. But enough of that for now Harry. I've come to you to help you, and to grant you the means to not only protect yourself but to escape this awful place. The blessing should hopefully allow you to become one of, if not, the strongest being in the universe if you work hard enough. She explained loudly with her nose pointed high and arrogant, which he honestly thought was a bit cute. As if suddenly remembering something she smacked a closed fist onto her spare open palm. I've not introduced myself. Her cheeks flush red in embarrassment and she quickly looked away from Harry. Mm my name is Ishkigal. And I am a goddess of death and control the underworld. Well a part of it, that is. She finished demurely. After acting shyly for a moment more, she turns back to Harry and winks playfully at him. Then she reaches down and gently helps Harry sit up against the wall outside his prison slash cupboard slash room. Now that introductions are out of the way, now let's get you all healed up, she says with a gentle tone. With a quick wave of her hand in front of Harry, a warm soft light shrouded him for the briefest of moments and then instantly all of the pain he had been feeling, all of his injuries, old or new, that he'd received from his so-called family were gone. Then now Harry, we're almost done. I just need to give you my blessing and then we'll get ready to send you to another world, the first of many hopefully fun adventures. While you're traveling around the vast cosmos, I want you to have fun. To have as many adventures as possible. To make new friends. But most of all. Most of all, I want you to grow up healthy, happy, and strong. So strong that no one will ever hurt you, use you, or manipulate you ever again. With that little speech, she turned that 200 watt smile his way and he couldn't help but feel his brain turn into so much mush. But slowly, once he regained his wits, he couldn't help but grow excited and hopeful at the future this beautiful woman, his heiress, was painting for him. Once you become the strongest, you'll come back here, to this exact spot, at this exact time and will be ready to tackle the world. And with that, she takes out a small orb of light that glows with such intensity it was blinding. It flashed so rapidly that it looked more like a wildly out-of-control disco ball than anything else. An intense, migraine-inducing rainbow disco ball, as Harry struggles to not have his eyeballs burn in their sockets, Eris slowly pushes the tiny sun into his chest. Blinking away tears, that had nothing to do with them being seared, it's warm. He says softly while smiling at the feeling and then looks up at her expectantly. She smiles at him. I worked really hard on preparing that blessing. Honestly. I was inspired by humanity who've written all kinds of stories and created so many interesting video games. Which I have, of course, thoroughly played I mean, researched, when I visited the human world. Trying her best to move past her slip of the tongue she continued, based on my vast amount of plow research, I've gone ahead and modified my blessing so that it would grant you a trustworthy, reliable easy to understand, and useful system. Harry blinked slowly at her, amused somewhat by her continued verbal blunders. 
but still somewhat confused at what her actual blessing is. He knew of course what video games were since Dudley would never pass up the chance to rub him being spoiled in my face by showing whatever new game he got, all the while taunting me that freaks couldn't play games. So intellectually, he knew vaguely what Harris was talking about, but as in, he never actually played them himself, he's not fully confident what stories, games she's referencing when she's talking about them. Of course, he got a pretty solid clue a moment later when a semi-transparent box appeared in front of his vision. Ding ding. Welcome to the Gamer System user. Harry stared at the floating box of text in utter confusion and shock before turning to look at Harris. Did it surprise you? He he he. She giggled, this is my gift to you Harry, the Gamer System, or for short, TGS, Eershkigel's version. I modified it personally for you myself. Its main purpose is to help you and even grant you some special perks and equipment to help get you started, she explained. A moment after that, the box suddenly vanishes and a new one appears in its place. Ding ding. You've received special gifts from Goddess Eershkigel to help you on your journey. Let's look at what you got. He looked confusedly at the glowing box that was currently floating in front of his eyes and he stared at it for a long moment before shrugging and giving in to the urge to poke at it with his finger. Like any child would do when confronted with a weird and wonderful, probably. Congratulations. You've received the following. Items, X2 Keyblades, Kingdom Key and Kingdom Key D. Active Skill, Dual Wielding. Active Skill, Digimon Tamer. Passive Skill, Mana Aid. Passive Skill, Dragon Mana Core, DMC. Passive Skill, Perfect Control. Passive Skill, Universal Energy, EP. He looked at the box in bewildered confusion. Click each one to get a description, Eershkigal suggests, orders him. He looks at Eershkigal and nods in understanding. Taking a moment to work out the controls, he raises a finger and then clicks on the familiar names. He knows what they are because there was a time when this particular game was all the kids could talk about and he's seen pictures of this key-like weapon on posters. Keyblade, Kingdom Key. The keychain attached draws out the keyblade's true form and power. This keyblade is an iconic weapon of the Kingdom Hearts series. However, this particular blade is slightly different from the original video game version, in the fact that it evolves and changes form as the gamer, you, grows and evolves, growing ever stronger, thus completely getting rid of ever needing to get new weapons. It also grants the user the ability to wield the element of light. Note, increase all rep gains with all white knights. Harry stares in awe at the weapon description and immediately clicks on the other. Keyblade, Kingdom Key D. A keyblade to the side of darkness of Kingdom Hearts. Another iconic weapon of the Kingdom Hearts series and was wielded by one of Disney's most famous mascots. This blade is also slightly different from its original video game version, in the fact that it evolves and changes form as the gamer, you, grows and evolves, growing ever stronger, thus completely getting rid of ever needing to get new weapons. It also grants the user the ability to wield the element of darkness. Note, increase all rep gains with internet trolls. Wow. They're so cool. Harry exclaimed excitedly. He clicks on the next description on his list. Skill, dual wielding. This skill allows the gamer, you, to be able to equip two one-handed weapons in each hand. It also negates the damage reduction of using two weapons at once and instead increases damage. Note, because one sword isn't as good as two. As Harry continues to read, Eershkigal claps excitedly. Dual wielding keyblades is very fun and awesome Harry so I decided to make you into a mini Roxas. For her efforts, she receives a deadpan stare, but she just smiles at him. Okay. He says as he forces himself to shove that odd reference to the wayside for now before he decides to move on and click on the next description. Skill, Digimon Tamer. This skill allows the user to tame, train and raise creatures known as Digimon, which is shorthand for digital monsters. The gamer system will now act as a digital interface that will help in summoning the gamers, your, Digimon. These Digimon will be treated as familiars and as such, they'll have no limits on how strong they grow. Note, gotta catch em all. Pock I mean, Digimon. Digimon? He asks with some trepidation. He wasn't sure, but weren't monsters generally bad news? He looks worriedly at Hirschkigel who is nodding happily. They're these fantastic creatures who live within a digital dimension. It took me forever to find them and then quite a bit of effort to connect the gamer system into their dimension but it was totally worth it, she explains while doing a couple of fist pumps in the air.
Not only can they grow to be very powerful, but they can also be your best friends. He smiles happily at the thought of having friends. Irsh Kiggle then pulls out a big, and oddly colored, egg and hands it to Harry. And here's your first one. You're going to love her, I just know it. The goddess gushes enthusiastically. He looks at the white spotted and purple egg in wonder but then a box appears in front of it. Ding ding. You've received a Digimon egg. The gamer system has registered ownership as yours and as such it will keep it until it hatches. Note, you will be notified when it does. The egg vanishes into tiny motes of light. I can't wait to see what Digimon hatches from it. Whatever it is, I'm sure it will become a powerful and loyal friend for you, Harry. Eershkigul says excitedly. Unknown to him, a wide and almost blindingly bright smile spread rapidly across his face, and Eershkigul couldn't help but tear up a bit at witnessing such an innocent smile and only for a brief moment was she surprised when he suddenly hugs her and it doesn't take long for her to hug him back. Go on, Harry, check the other skills. Okay. He lets go and clicks on the next one. Passive skill, mana aid. This skill grants the, the gamer, you, a 50% faster MP recovery rate. Note, it's the best kind of skill for magic users, for example you. Eershkigle pats his head. As a wizard and as of now, a keyblade wielder, magic is an important stat for you, so I gave you a few skills to help you in that area. He nods and continues on to the next one. Passive skill, Dragon Mana Core, DMC. This skill evolves your mana core into that of a dragon. As such your max total MP gets a boost upon leveling up. This skill also has the secondary effect of granting you the race, Dragovian. Dragovians are an intelligent race of half-human, half-dragons from the world of Dragon Quest VIII. This version of the race grants all the benefits and is changed so you don't outwardly show any physical changes unless you allow them. It also grants the gamer, you, a dragon lord form and the ability to use breath techniques, even if the gamer, you, are currently in their human form. Note, however you must unlock your dragon lord form first. I'm a dragon? He exclaims in shock. Eershkigal giggles at Harry's expression. A half dragon, Harry. She corrects him before continuing, it is a very powerful skill, but you'll have to grow stronger first before you can enjoy its many benefits. Harry nods in understanding and continues reading. Passive skill, perfect control. This skill allows the gamer, you, perfect control over every source of energy the gamer gains. This includes mana, ki, chakra act, etc. It also grants the gamer, you, perfect control over any elements the gamer gains. It also reduces the amount of energy needed for skills, spells, and techniques. Notes, this skill is op. Passive skill, universal energy. This skill transforms all forms of energy that the gamer, you, had or has access to into a singular type of energy, EP. As such, any and all skills, spells, and techniques that use any form, different energy to function, will now use EP as its energy source, regardless of what type of energy it's used in its original form. Note, all your energy belong to us, I mean you. This skill will help you when you're traveling in other worlds, by allowing you to learn any skill, spell, or technique regardless if they use some weird energy type or not. He nods and smiles. And now let's move on, Harry. Next, you simply say, status or if you want, think of that word within your mind. The goddess instructs him. Okay, S status. He stutters out. And instantly a new box appears in front of him. Name, Harry Potter. Race. Dragovian. Wizard. Titles. Master of Death. Keyblade Wielder. Level, 1. HP, 200. EP, 500. Strength, 5. Vitally, 5. Dexterity, 5. Intelligence, 5. Wisdom, 5. Luck, 5. Eershkigil claps excitedly and looks at Harry. I'll explain what you're currently seeing, Harry. As you can see I simplified this system compared to what you might normally see in video games and those stories I've mentioned before. The reason for this is that this system was created to help you become strong and not to hinder you nor put you through hoops for the entertainment of some other omniscient beings. She paused to allow that to sink in before continuing. Your title of the Master of Death helps you with that now this window shows your growth and the titles and races you obtain. Go ahead and click on them. Harry then clicked on his name. Biography. Harry James Potter. Harry James Potter, is the only son of the wizard, James Andrew Potter and the witch, Lillian Potney Evans. Both of his parents loved him deeply. Sadly, 
Harry's early life has been fraught with abuse and being starved off and on throughout his early years, leading to mild to severe forms of malnutrition that may cause growth and health issues later in life if not treated soon. He has often spent long hours of his young life wondering why his relatives hate him and what he could have possibly done wrong to deserve all that hate, never realizing that he was never the one to blame for their cruelty. Thankfully for Harry James Potter, his bonded goddess of death, Eerschwigel, queen of the underworld has chosen to intervene on his behalf and has granted Harry a heavily modified and powered up version of the gamer system that was created by her to help her master grow powerful, in the hopes that he could choose his own path and thus Harry the gamer was born. Harry blinks at the rather odd and condensed summary of his life and couldn't help being even more thankful for what Hirschkegel is doing to help him. Fighting back tears, he then clicked the next description to read. Race, Dragovian. A race of half-human, half-dragon from the Dragon Quest VII universe. This race allows the use of various breath techniques which will unlock upon leveling up. In addition, it also grants the ability, Dragon Lord Transformation, upon reaching a certain level. Grants 5 to all stats per level up. Grants 100 to max MP per level up. 100 to max HP per level up. Note, if you aren't sure how to kill something, fire is usually a pretty good bet. Most things die if you set them on fire. Race, Wizard. Wizards are born with the natural ability to use wand magic. Grants 3 to both wisdom and intelligence stat per level up. Grants 50 to max MP per level up. Note, you're a lizard Harry. I mean wizard. That's the main reason I gave you the dragon mana or Harry. The extra stat gains that it grants you as you level up are a bit of a cheat but you'll probably need them as you travel and when you come back, you see. This world has powerful and terrifying beings Harry, but I promise you, you'll one day stand above them. He shivered a bit at the mention of those powerful beings but at this point, he trusts her completely so he continues reading. Title, Master of Death, Mod. The one who has this title is the master of the conceptual beings known as death, as such he's protected by it. All omniscient beings will instinctively know not to mess with the bearer of this title as no matter who or where they are, death comes for all, eventually. This title also grants the bearer true ownership of the items known as their, deathly hallows and as such they can never be used against the bearer of this title. The title also grants the bearer of this title immunity to instant death spells and one-shot kill skills, spells, and techniques. Note, Eerschwigel is the best death goddess. Title, Keyblade Wilder. This title is given to those chosen to wield a keyblade, or two. This title allows the bearer to call their keyblade to their sides at will and allows travel between worlds. Note, I see a red door and I want it painted black. As you can see, the Master of Death title will protect you from those meddling beings in other worlds. Death itself will come and end them if they try, so you're protected and the Keyblade Wielder title will help you move around to new worlds or old worlds you've already visited. She smiles as Harry nods and continues. Level, LVL. This shows your current level. Every level up you gain 5 to all stat increases and may learn new spells, techniques, and or skills. Hit points, HP, if they reach 0. It's game over man. Energy points, EP, the source of power of all spells, skills, and techniques. Strength, STR, this stat affects the damage of all physical type skills. It also increases carrying capacity. Vitality, VIT, this stat affects the damage taken by physical attacks and max HP growth. It also increases endurance. Dexterity, DEX, this stat affects all speed and agility based skills, spells, and techniques. It also affects reaction time and body flexibility. Intelligence, INT, this stat affects spell damage and resistance. It also increases the user's ability to understand complex issues easier. Wisdom, WIS, this stat affects max EP growth and the effects of healing skills, spells, and techniques. It also grants the user better resistance to mental attacks. Luck, LUK. This stat is peculiar as it affects item, mob drop rates and critical hits rates. It also subtly affects the world around you causing all kinds of weird, wacky, and wonderful events to occur to or around the gamer, you. As Harry finishes reading the box contents he takes a minute to digest what he has learned and then looks at Ishkigal. Are you done reading Harry? He nods with a smile. Okay then, I guess you're ready to start your new journey, Harry. We won't see each other until you're back but when you arrive I'll stand by your side and together we'll put this right, Eerschkegel says with conviction.
Knowing his time with Ishkigal was running out he looks at her sadly and on impulse rushes up and hugs her for all he's worth, causing the surprisingly shy goddess to blush. Thank you, Eris. I will never forget this gift, it is to be one of the nicest things anyone has ever done for me that I can remember. She looks briefly surprised by the nickname but smiles happily. You're welcome, Harry. Now get ready, you're going to a world with an easy difficulty to start with, so you'll be able to grow up safely until you're ready to go to another world. Okay. He says excitedly. With a wave of her hand, Eris summons a gateway that looks like a large black marble door that slowly opens up. Go, Harry. Go and have a grand adventure. Eris says while waving him on. Before passing through the gateway threshold, Harry pauses, then turns back towards her and takes one long last look at her and the much to her surprise. There was a look of fiery determination that had appeared on his face. She couldn't help the smile spread on her face at the sight. I'll be waiting here for you Harry, my little master. She smiles softly at him. I look forward to it Eris, I'll see you when I come back. And with one final look at her, he nods once turns back, and then without pause or any hesitation, he walks on through the portal and was gone in an instant. Eris, now alone once more, sadly smiles. Safe travels, little master. Then she vanishes in a shroud of darkness and shadows. Flashback end. Dash. We see Harry looking at his hand with a gentle smile on his face when a new window opens in front of him. Ding, ding. Congratulations user on finishing your journey. As of now, you'll be able to revisit any world you've previously visited. In addition, since this world counts as the end of your journey, you're now eligible for the new game mode, so everything gained during your journey becomes available and all restrictions are lifted. Note, please check your status notification page for further information. His smile grows wider and wider as he continues to read all the notifications he received when he returned back to his home world. He was very happy to learn that he would be able to summon any of his friends and cough girlfriend Koof so they can be with him in this world, not to mention all of his powers still being available to him. For a brief moment he closes his eyes to reminisce on all the adventures he's had since that fateful night so, so long ago. The lives he's lived, the victory, and sometimes the losses. It truly was a grand adventure. Images of the worlds he's been to flash through his mind. Worlds filled with monsters and demon lords, kings, queens, and all the different people in between, the origins of his race of Dragovian, a ninja world and an orange-wearing shinobi who would teach him the meaning of never giving up, a world of spirits and shinigami, worlds of fantasies, a world of giant metal knights, and a school with a lion in its banner and so many more. All right. Status. And thus Harry's new game plus begins. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. All right. Status. A familiar box appears in front of Harry and as he reads, a grin begins to form on his face. Days of grinding and fighting horribly powerful beings have made him an experienced and powerful fighter. He closes his eyes and chuckles as he reminisces about the peculiar world of Diskia, one of the many worlds and the last he visited that helped him break all kinds of limits, but most of all the crazy adventures of his friends Mao, Beryl, Sapphire, and all Maz dragged him on. He opens his eyes and stares at his races. Race. Dragon God. Sorcerer. Devil. Seraph. Otsutsuki. Shinigami. Hollow. Saiyan God. Click to expand. These were so hard to obtain, either they evolved or were combined with others and became something new, like Harry's Dragovian race for example which evolved into Dragon God. Most of his titles evolved once Harry gained access to divinity by slaying a god or fighting a powerful enemy considered a boss by the game or worst case scenario a reward for saving a world from destruction. The interesting thing about them was that some of them just gave Harry access to the skills of that specific race or allowed him to damage intangible things like the soul. The Shinigami and Hollow race allowed Harry to use Shinigami and Hollow techniques but it didn't grant him a Zanpei Kuto spirit. It was later that Harry found out the cause for this, it turned out that it was because of his Keyblades. His weapons were already sentient so they couldn't become Zanpei Kuto's nor give him a Bankai. Not that Harry needed them to do so, his keyblades were more than enough but the ability to cause damage to an enemy's soul that he gained from the races instead would be useful to him throughout his journey. This had also affected his Saiyan race, Harry got Zenkai's but was unable to become a Super Saiyan nor does he have a monkey's tail, however, once Harry became a Dragon God he gained a Super Saiyan God form and the race itself evolved into Saiyan God. He nodded to himself and moved on to his titles. Titles. Master of Death. Keyblade Master. A Demon Lord's Best Friend. Boyfriend. 
Best Cook. Devil Hunter. Heaven's Savior. Harim King. Demon Lord of Rebellion. Dragon Slayer. God Slayer. Master of the Elements. Sage. Cage Level Shinobi. Hero. Army Killer. Administrator of the Akashic Record. Horcrux. Devourer of Souls. Grand Healer. Turtle School Style Master. Demon Clan Style Master. Alchemist. Click to expand. Yeah, I'm never showing this to anyone. He rubbed his eyes tiredly as he sweat dripped at some of the ridiculous titles that he has gained during his long adventure. Yeah, I'm never showing this to anyone. He rubbed his eyes tiredly as he sweat dripped at some of the ridiculous titles that he has gained during his long adventure. Surprisingly these were very easy to obtain some changed over time and others appeared by reaching a milestone. For example when my Keyblades reached their ultimate forms. The Keyblade Wielder title evolved to Keyblade Master others like the God Slayer and Dragon Slayer were awarded to me when I managed to kill a God and Dragon of a very high level. Others like Sage or Master of the Elements were given to me by the game when I mastered the skills connected to the title. Still, some of these are very embarrassing. Harry chuckled awkwardly while scratching the back of his head. Though he glared at a particular title on his list. Horcrux. Harry growled as he remembers the moment he both obtained this title and the next one. Dash. Flashback. We see Harry meditating as he trains to master Senjutsu from the toads along with his orange-wearing friend Naruto. As Harry meditates he feels a pull from his soul. This of course confuses him so he decides to allow himself to be pulled into his soulscape. He opens his eyes only to see nothing but a white expanse spreading as far as his eyes can see. He looked around until a sound alerted him that he wasn't alone and quickly jumped back and prepares to attack only to relax when he sees a deformed baby-like being moaning and writhing on the floor. What? Harry stares in disgust at the being and approached it carefully. Once close he notices the pale skin, the noseless face, and red eyes full of hate and malice. He closed his eyes to get a feel of this being's energy and begins to feel out the creature in front of him only to open his eyes in shock. You're a soul. A piece of one. Harry growled in both anger and disgust who are you? And how are you inside of my soulscape? Dot. The being wheezes and chuckles darkly but doesn't answer, it just lies there as it glares at Harry with his red and hateful eyes, fine don't answer, but I won't have you in here any longer. He glared at the deformed being and placed his hand in front of his face and claws down gathering energy and forming a reptilian-like white mask with two long horns growing out of it towards the back of his head. Harry growled and then let out a terrifying howl that makes the deformed being widen his eyes in fear and shock as an unearthly pressure begins to push down on the deformed baby harshly. The being began to panic as Harry approached it and lifted him with one hand. The last thing this small shard of the soul of Voldemort would ever see is Harry opening his fang-filled jaws and a dark void before it ceases to exist. Once Harry was done devouring the deformed soul shard he lifted his hollow mask off his face and let it rest on top of his head. He closed his eyes as he begins to obtain the memories of the soul shard belonging to the Dark Lord Voldemort, all of the spells he has mastered, all the rituals he has performed in his sick quest for power, and the identity of all his followers but to him that's not important. No, what is his full attention is the final moments of James Andrew Potter and Lillian Potter, his mother and father. He watched as his father fought Voldemort valiantly, how his mother tried to protect him and sacrificed herself for him, her dying scream, and Voldemort's cold and cruel laughter. Tears fall down his face as he witnessed the final moments of his parents, the love they have for him, the injustice done to his family by Voldemort, the piece of shit who told the Dark Lord about the prophecy, and the traitorous rat who betrayed his parents. Ah, an enormous storm of energy begins to spread around Harry as the information overwhelms him, unleashing his power in a roar of rage. I'll make all of you pay, I vow to make each and every one of you pay for what happened to me and my parents. Flashback end. Dash. He closed his eyes and swipes the window to close it, deciding to skip checking his current level and already knowing there was no need to check. He already maxed them out. Besides he wouldn't have been able to come back to his world unless he became strong enough to destroy anything that gets in his way. I should get out of this place. He took a look around the small room and frowned. I really hate this room. Harry walked towards the door and punches it destroying it and the wall in front of it. Of course, this wakes up the other residents of the house but he doesn't care and continues to head towards the front door. Vernon and Petunia Dursley awoke in a jolt as a loud crash is heard throughout the house. What in the bloody hell was that? 
Vernon gets up in a hurry and begins to walk to check what the noise was when a second crash is heard, this time by the front door. He quickly heads down being followed by both Petunia and Dudley who were also awakened by the loud noise and being curious about it he followed his father downstairs to check. Dash. Tilda Surrey in front of the Dursley home. Harry reached the front door and punches it destroying it completely and sending wood pieces and shrapnel onto the front yard, he stepped out only to stop and smile brightly as he catches sight of Ishkigal standing quietly in the middle of the street, the moonlight shining down on her making her golden hair glow and the rube red eyes shine. She turned towards Harry and smiles softly she stretched her arm and reaches a hand out to him. Not even thinking about it twice he began to walk towards his goddess and lift his hand to reach for hers, he grabs her hand and holds it tightly while stepping up to her until he was in front of her and gently hugs her. Ishkigil hugs him back tightly and whispers welcome back Harry. Harry tightened his hug. It's good to be back Eris. They let go and smile at each other and Ishkigil can't help but notice how much he has changed. He seemed older wiser, and taller not at all the ten years old he's supposed to be. He has changed so much. And he has become so strong, I can feel it, she looks into his eyes and proudly smiles. Boy, both turn their heads only to see an overweight purpled-faced Vernon standing at the front door glaring at his nephew in both rage and surprise when he noticed him hugging some tramp, but what enraged him the most is how different the boy looked, standing there tall and proud with those fancy clothes which he was sure he nor Petunia got for him. Petunia stared at his nephew and can't help but notice his clothes too. Fancy black cargo pants and an expensive looking black with emerald tones jacket with one of those hoodies that are popular with the hoodlums. He seems taller, his black hair longer, and she noticed that he's not wearing his glasses anymore allowing those green eyes of his to shine. Dudley just stared in confusion. Vernon was about to step toward Harry. You shouldn't do that uncle. Harry glared at his so-called family and his eyes begin to glow in the dark of the night causing Vernon to suddenly stop, Petunia and Dudley, to flinch back only for them to widen their eyes in fear when a black silhouette in the shape of an enormous dragon appears behind their nephew and the girl. The silhouette opened its eyes and all they can see is two deep green reptilian eyes glaring at them, Harry grins at his relatives allowing his fangs to be seen by them as he watches his tormentors begin to shake in fear. I'm leaving and never coming back, I hope for your well-being that I never see you again. Harry spread his enormous dragon wings and lifts Ishkigal in his arms making her squeak in and blush in surprise. He then flapped his wings hard and takes off into the night sky leaving three shocked and terrified humans. Dash. As Harry flies in the night sky he started to chuckle at the faces of his so-called family. So, what's next Harris? We go to Kyoto, Japan. A good friend of mine lives there and she can help us. Last time I visited her she was complaining and crying about how no one takes her faction seriously, and how they always ignore them so I thought why not go there and have you join her faction. She grins excitedly while Harry deadpans at her. Okay, well as long as they don't expect me to bend a knee, I will join her faction and help them as best as I can. Now hold on tight. A dark corridor formed ahead of them and as they go through it, it quickly vanishes. Dash. Tilda Kyoto, Japan Yasaka's Palace. Yasaku and her young daughter Kunu are both beautiful kitsunes, Kaiubais to be exact as the nine tails swaying lazily behind them is proof of their status, they have blonde hair and bright beast-like yellow eyes. They seem to be relaxing after a tough day of work and study when they perceive an enormous energy signature appear suddenly above them. Yasaka jumps up in a panic Kunu, go with the guards. The young kitsune stands up in a hurry and runs towards the guards who spread around her protectively as Yasaka heads outside to confront whoever or whatever is the owner of such an enormous amount of energy. Meanwhile, Harry can be seen hovering above the palace looking around the city wow. It looks like a modern Konoa. Ishkigal giggled as she watches Harry excitedly look around. Konoa? Was that in a world you visited? Harry grins at her as he begins to float down. Yup. Konoa is the village hidden in the leaves, a shinobi village. There I learned the way of the ninja and many chakra techniques. Harry smiled softly I made some more some friends there too and they taught me a lot he softly lands in front of the palace and puts Ishkigal down gently while his wings go back into his back. Ooh Tilda. Ninjas that sounds interesting Harry, you have to show me what you've learned sometime she claps excitedly but then notices Yasaka come out of the palace in a panic. Hello. Yachan. She waved happily at her friend. Yasaka stopped suddenly when she heard her friend's voice. Ishkigal? Good calmy woman. You nearly gave me a heart attack. Ishkigal tilts her head in confusion. Huh? How? 
I visit you often enough for you to sense it was me arriving. Yasaka deadpans and sweat drops at her friend of course. You can practically feel the sarcasm dripping off of her but how am I supposed to sense you? When you arrive with someone unknown whose energy dwarfs anything I have felt before. She points at Harry who jumps a bit in surprise at being pointed at. Oh I see. Sorry about that ye chan he he he. Don't you he 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 me. The poor Kaiobai Kitsune glared at Ishkigal who waved her hands in front of her in surrender. Sigh. Well, who is this young man Ishkigal and why did you bring him here? Ishkigal looks at Yasaku and her eyes turn serious surprising the Kitsune this is Harry Potter, the master of death ye chan. Yasaku's eyes widen in surprise and turned to look at the young man who only waved and smiled at her. Can we go in Yachan? It's a bit of a long story but it will be worth your time I promise Yasaku stared into the eyes of her friend and lightly nods okay, let's head in, I just know this is going to be big. The kit soon turned around and began to lead them inside. Dash. Tilda Yasaku's palace in Yasaku's office. Ishkigal spent some time explaining their situation to Yasaka while enjoying some delicious tea. Kanu decided to join the discussion since Ishkigal is one of her favorite people. Kanu listens with her mother as the young goddess tells them the tale of what has been done to Harry and the power she bestowed on him. Yasaka turned to look sadly at Harry after Ishkigal finished telling them about his life and the hardships he has faced, being a mother she can't believe someone's family could be so cruel to one of their own. I see. And now that Harry is back that means he's become the most powerful being in this world but Ishkigal, for you to create such an ability must have weakened you severely. She turned towards her friend worry evident in her eyes. Meanwhile, Harry turned towards his goddess and looks at her with concern showing in his eyes. Ishkigal smiled at her friends. Yes, but I needed to help my master Chan so I don't regret doing it. She turned to look at Harry and she pats his hand gently. I'm fine, really. It might take me a while to recover but I'm fine, I promise. Yasaka stared at her for a bit but nodded after some time okay I'll trust you to be honest about this Ishkigal. The goddess just gave her old friend another smile and nods. Meanwhile, Kanu slowly approached Harry trying not to draw any attention to her. Harry however turned towards her and smiled yes. Can I help you? Kanu jumped a bit in surprise and blushed cutely as Yasaka giggled at her daughter's embarrassment causing Kanu to pout at her mother. I just wanted to see where you kept your keyblades, she begins to fidget with her fingers. I like the game so I wanted to see them. She looks down sadly but then she hears a sound and two bright lights flash for a second, she looked up and widened her eyes in awe as she looked at two very recognizable keyblades. T those are, Oathkeeper and Oblivion. Her eyes sparkled in excitement as her tails sway happily. Meanwhile, Yasaka stared intently at the weapons in Harry's hands. The white one is letting off some very powerful holy light energy. It is far above any holy blade I've known. And the black one, such darkness it's like it wants to devour everything. Kanu looked at Harry expectantly. Can I hold them, please? Harry chuckled and handed her the keyblades. Kanu holds them and lifts them above her head excitedly they're so light. Yasaka smiled while she watched her daughter happily begin to pose with the keyblades is that okay? Harry looks at her and smiles yeah. I change them into weaker forms so she won't hurt herself and besides my keyblades don't do anything unless I'm the one wielding them. Yasaka widens her eyes in shock. Those are weaker forms. I wonder how powerful they really are? She turned to look at Ishkigal who smiles at her and winked so Ishkigal tell me, why come here? What's your plan? Ishkigal nods and looks directly into Yasaka's eyes and the kitsune gulps in anticipation we want to join the yokai faction Yachan. Yasaka looked utterly surprised what? But why? You both could join any faction you wanted, why join the yokai? Well first because you're my friend, secondly Harry needs to get away from Britain and the wizarding world for a while, and thirdly you mentioned to me that your faction needs more powerhouses, that you're tired of the yokai being pushed around so I decided why not? Yasaka looked incredulously at her friend and then turned towards Harry and you Harry Khan. What's your opinion about all of this? Harry looked up and thought I don't mind joining, you seem like a good leader, and Darius trusts you, so as long as you don't try to force me to do anything I don't want to do, then I'm willing to follow you. The kit soon leans back and closed her eyes to think about the situation, sure, we need a deterrent for the other factions, especially the devils and fallen, lately they've been walking around and doing whatever they want on our territory, and quite honestly am tired of that. She opens her eyes and looks at her friend, what about your faction Ishkigal? 
the Mesopotamian faction is almost dead. Only I and my niece Ishtar remain so I don't mind joining the yokai. Yasaka stared at both of them and nods. Very well, then I welcome you to the yokai faction Harry and Ishkigal. Harry and Ishkigal smile and nod happily when out of nowhere they hear Kanu yell. Fire. The Earthkeeper then spits out a small fireball hitting the wall and scorching it a bit. Chapter 3, Chapter 3 Harry and Ishkigal smile and nod happily when out of nowhere they hear Kanu yell. Fire. And out of O Earthkeeper, a small fireball shoots out hitting a wall and scorching it a bit. All three turn in shock to look at Kanu who's doing a little victory dance, ha ha ha. Ishkigal and Yasaka jump as Harry suddenly laughs snapping them out of their shock trance. Yasaka looks toward Harry and asks, But you said that your keyblades wouldn't do anything unless you were the one wielding them? Harry gets up and approaches Kanu and gently grabs hold of the hand she's using to hold O Earthkeeper. Yes but there is an exception. He looks into Kanu's eyes. To think that out of all the worlds I've been to, it would be mine where I would find someone compatible. Harry lifts Kanu's hand above her head and holds the keyblade up there. Kanu. Would you like to become a keyblade wielder and for me to be your teacher? Ishkigal gasps and Yasaka looks confused. Kanu looks into Harry bright green eyes as her eyes widen in realization. I, yes, please, be my sensei. Harry smiles and his eyes shine joyfully, he looks at Oath Keeper and closes his eyes, in response the keyblade begins to glow in a beautiful white light. Light energy begins to gather at the tip of the weapon and forms a glowing pure white orb that suddenly begins to fly around the room before it stops and shoots down towards Kanu, and merges with her, filling her with warmth, as both Oath Keeper and Oblivion vanish from her hands in flashes of light. Congratulations. You have obtained a student and have received the title, Sensei. This title grants a bonus on your students' growth allowing them to learn from you faster. It is possible to pass down skills and spells to your student. Harry swipes the window close and turns to Yasaka. It seems O oh, Earthkeeper deemed Kanu's heart strong enough to wield a keyblade of her own. In time it will take form and she will be able to call it at will Ishkigal claps excitedly while Yasaka stares at Kanu in shock. How is this possible? asks Yasaka. My title of Keyblade Master grants me a perk that allows me to gain a student as long as one of my Keyblades deems them compatible, and it seems that Kanu is compatible with light base Keyblades that's how she was able to cast magic with the O Earth Keeper. Kanu stares at her mother with a happy look on her face, her tails wagging back and forth excitedly. Mum. This is so cool. I'm going to have my own Keyblade. I wonder which one will I get? Harry chuckles at Kanu. Most likely a basic one but don't worry, like mine it will grow and change form as you grow stronger. Yasaka meanwhile just stares at both Harry and Kanu. She's going to have a keyblade? Just by the amount of energy his O oh Keeper unleashed just now, I can tell hers is going to be a powerhouse like Harry's. But she'll attract the attention of the other factions. Some of those pompous devils might try to force her into their peerage. Yasaka bites her lower lips in worry, something Harry notices. Lady Yasaka Yasaka looks towards Harry only to jump a bit at the serious look in his eyes. Please don't worry, I'll protect Kanu with all of my power, as her teacher I vow this to you the air grows heavy and Yasaka can't help to gape at his words, the only thing she can do is slightly nod. Harry nods at her and Ishkigal reaches over to where Yasaka is sitting and gently pats her knee. You can relax your chan, once the other factions hear about Harry they'll be pretty distracted trying to find information about him. Luckily his relative's cruelty worked on our favor the goddess shrugs. Those fools never bothered to register Harry anywhere. No school or medical records and no birth certificate, technically he doesn't exist. Yasaka shakes her head sadly what horrid humans, sigh. At least we can control his information so don't worry Harry we'll make those records for you. Thank you Lady Yasaka Kanu jumps onto Harry's back surprising him a bit woe. Sensei, when are we going to start our lessons? I can't wait to get started. Harry chuckles lightly we have to wait for your keyblade to manifest first which might take a few days, but I can start teaching you magic and martial arts. Yasaka cuts in and don't forget that you still have your lessons to attend to. Kanu groans but moon. She pouts at her mother no buts young lady. You still need an education and besides you won't be adventuring until you're older. But Sensei went on many adventures and he's my age. Harry puts her down and pats her head. Hey, I might not look at Kanu. But I'm actually older than I look, usually I spent decades in a world before deejing and going to a new one, 
I've been to school all the way to college in some worlds so I agree with your mother, you need an education but don't worry we'll make time for me to teach you, and in a few years you'll be above almost anyone in this world. Kanu doesn't look happy but she understands. Besides she wants to make her new sensei proud so she reluctantly nods. Okay, sensei. Yasaka hides her smile behind her kimono sleeve. Fufafu how cute, she's already trying to make Harry proud but I'm glad she has a friend, sometimes I worry that she might be feeling lonely with how busy I usually am. Meanwhile, Ierskigal approaches Harry come on Harry, we have to find a place to stay. Yasaka gets up and walks towards Ierskigal, once in front of her she flicks her on the nose causing the goddess to flinch back and hold her abused nose don't be silly Ierskigal, you both will be staying here at the palace, Kanu needs her new sensei to be close if he intends to teach her correctly and Kami knows I need a female friend around here. Ierskigal rubs her nose and glares at Yasaka now, are you sure you chan The kitsune smiles and nods at her friend. Ierskigal beams at her okay, thanks, Yachan. Yes, Kanu fist pumps. The godly trio smiles at Kanu, unaware of the events happening in a magical castle located on Scottish land. Dash. Tilda Highlands of Scotland, Hogwarts. In the Highlands of Scotland. Across a giant lake and by a dark and sinister forest we find a majestic castle, and inside, in the headmaster's office, we see an old man. His white hair and long white beard are his most eye-catching feature if you ignore the garish and ridiculous deep purple with pink stars robes he seems to be wearing. Dumbledore stands there staring at the destroyed magical artifacts slowly burning in both fear and awe as he thinks back on the events of a few hours ago. Flashback. A horrible pressure started to flow from the magical artifacts that were monitoring the location, health, and wards of the home of Harry Potter, it was so powerful that it overwhelmed the artifacts causing them to catch fire and explode, waking the old man and his phoenix forks in a panic, he quickly puts out the flames with a swish of his wand that for some reason feels heavy to his hold and quickly asks forks to flame him to the Dursley's home which the phoenix agrees to with a soft thrill. Once he arrived he found the Dursleys at the front of their home looking like they just saw a dragon, he looks around and notices, the destroyed pieces of what he assumes is the front door all over the front lawn, he approaches the terrified family. Of course, Vernon began to curse and roar at him about his nephew, but he could hardly understand the oaf, so with a wave of his wand he silenced him, he turns to question Petunia, and what she tells him, causes him dread and fear. According to Petunia they were awakened by a loud crash and headed down only to hear another one by the front door, rushing out they see young Harry hugging a strange and unknown woman, but before they could do anything he turned towards them, and what happened next is what concerns him. What the woman describes to him seems impossible, that enormous draconic silhouette and green reptilian eyes but at the mention of the unholy pressure, he tenses up, the description of that pressure seems like the same feeling he got from the pressure that destroyed his artifacts. The fact Harry apparently flew into the sky with an unknown woman by spreading from his back and using what they described sounds like dragon wings is the most worrying fact, where did he go? Who was that mysterious woman and how was Harry able to release such pressure? Flashback end. After obliviating the Dursleys he came back to his office with Fawkes's help, but could only stare at what remains of the magical artifacts in silent worry not knowing that the next day his worries would only increase. Dash. Harry and Ierskigal spend some time chatting with Yasaka while having gone back to their seats, while Kanu is close by listening as Harry tells them of his adventures in one of the most difficult worlds he visited. And so, Goku-sensei and I tried to push Jaren back but the tough bastard blasted us off with a kid blast and grabbed my leg to throw me out of bounds, I was too wounded and tired so I was taken out. I found myself back in the stands and could only watch Sensei keep fighting with everything he had, it was one of the most intense battles I have ever witnessed but it also showed me that I was still not strong enough, so after Goku Sensei and Frieza managed to defeat Jaren by double teaming him and pushing him out of bounds leaving Android 17 the winner of the tournament, I decided it was time to move to the next world. The three women couldn't help but stare in awe at Harry's story in this world, but then Kanu jumps up onto Harry's lap but Sensei, what about the other universes? Were they really erased? Kanu asks sadly at her sensei. She found some of those fighters funny and cool, so she didn't like the idea of them being gone. Harry pats her head gently and smiles while Seventeen surprised everyone by wishing for all the universes to be restored, so the Super Dragon brought back all the universes that were erased. Kanu cheered happily. Yay! Exclamation mark Tilda do you think I could ever meet your friend's sensei? Harry nodded of course, once you master your keyblade you'll be able to travel between worlds and then he can both go and visit them. Kanu fist pumps while smiling cheerfully. 
Yasaka and Ishkaga can't help but smile at Kanu's excitement so Harry have you decided what to do with Voldemort and the Wizarding World? Ishkaga suddenly asks. Yasaka gives her a serious look. Voldemort? I thought he was dead, didn't Harry kill him when he was a toddler? Ishkaga shakes her head negatively no, he was defeated but no one knows how he survived. Harry cuts and he made horcruxes. Both women turn to him in alarm he made what? Both women ask at the same time he had made five horcruxes by the time I defeated him and accidentally made me into one when his killing curse bounced off of me both women gape at him in horror. It's okay, when I gained the races of Hollow and Shinigami I gained the ability to interact with souls though I didn't find out about being a horcrux until I came upon it during my training in the sage arts Yasaka looks at Harry in shock at the mention of him being a sage but shakes her head to focus we'll be talking later about you being a sage but first what did you do once you found the soul shard Harry coughs into his fist. I at it. Yasaka and Ishkigal deadpan at him. You at it? Both ask at the same time. Harry begins to nervously sweat sigh. It's a quirk of my hollow race. Hollows are dark beings that eat souls to sustain themselves selves and grow stronger, the good thing about that particular quirk is that I can look into the memories of any soul I consume both women continue to deadpan at him while Kanu looks a bit confused and thinking hard about something. Sensei. Yes, Kanu. What did his soul taste like? Harry can only look at Kanu with a serious look. Like spicy chicken. Both Ishkigal and Yasaka sweat drop ha ha. Ignoring the disturbing detail. Ishkigal nervously smiles. I'm guessing that that's how you know how many Horcruxes he made and where he hid them? Harry nods that's right. So to answer your questions, I plan to ignore the wizarding world for now and only take care of the vaults that Gringotts has for both the Potter and Peevil families and claim the lordships. As for Voldemort I'll be taking his Horcruxes and destroying them so when he shows his ugly noseless mug, I'll make him pay for what he did to my parents, also I'll be dealing with some of his followers. Harry gets up holding Kanu up with him and then sits her on his now empty chair, he pats her head and walks a bit away from the girls. Realize, Lilidmon, Bealsman. Two black pillars of light appear in front of Harry, and Ishkigal looks both excited and in anticipation, from the pillars of light two tall demonic-like figures emerge. One was dressed in black leather biker clothes and wearing a purple helmet, he grins at Harry while his three green eyes glow with power, his black feathered wings seem to eat at the light in the room. The other one is a beautiful black-haired woman wearing a black and deep purple kimono-like robe, her most distinctive feature is the golden-colored claw, she holds under her breasts and her black bat-like wings she seems to seductively smile at Harry. Yasaka's eyes widen at the amount of power these two beings are letting off, the energy seems to be even darker than a devil's. Dear Kami. Their energy is like staring into a void, and that power, they seem to be almost as powerful as Harry. Ishkigal grins. Wow you got two of the demon lord Digimon Harry grins back at her. Both Digimon turns to the three women in the room and stare. Liledmon smiles. Fufa Fu master Harry, would you introduce us to your new friends? Harry smiles but before he can say anything Kanu runs toward Bealsman and looks at him with sparkles coming out of her eyes you look so cool mister. Bealsman looks a bit surprised but grins at her. Ha ha ha. Thanks, little missy he ruffles her hair receiving a big smile from her, while Lilithmon smiles softly at Kanu who seems happy at meeting new people. Harry chuckles and responds to Lilithmon's request the little one there is Kanu. We're the same size sensei. And as you heard, my new student Harry chuckles again the two beautiful ladies are Yasaka, the leader of the yokai faction, and Ishkigal the goddess of death and queen of the underworld. Both Digimon bows slightly at the influential ladies. Bealsman then looks at Harry so what are our orders boss? Harry responds I'm sure you remember when I told you about the information I obtained from the soul shard I consumed back in the elemental nations they both nod well it's time to do something with that information he grins fairly showing his fangs and that makes both Digimon grin in malicious excitement. Lilithmon places a hand on her lips to hide her grin what's the plan master? You guys and I will be going to get his Horcruxes. as he turns to Bealsman you will go to the Malfoy's home and get the diary, then kidnap Lucius Malfoy and take him to the Horcrux located in the Crystal Cave on the shores of England, once in there make Lucius drink the potion in the cup you'll find there, and then take the locket you'll find inside the cup, kill Lucius and then come back here. He then turns to Lilithmon you will go to Gringotts and take the cup in Bellatrix's vault, to make sure you're not found use a dark corridor to get in and out quickly, afterward go to Hogwarts, once there go to the 7th floor and follow the game's map which will highlight the way to a painting of a man trying to teach some trolls how to dance ballet and walk back and forth three times, while thinking, I want a room of hidden things.
Take the diadem you'll find inside the room that'll appear in front of the painting. Harry then looks at both Digimon don't forget to use the game's map and objective list to help you he turns to Ishkigalaris did they ever catch Peter Pettigrew? Ishkigal tilts her head in confusion Peter Pettigrew? Think he was killed by Sirius Black. Harry narrowed his eyes. Who's Sirius Black? He asks with a frown for some reason that name sounds familiar. Ishkigal stares into Harry's eyes you should know Harry, you must have seen him in Voldemort's memories. He was a Death Eater and was imprisoned for betraying your parents by giving the location of their hideaway to Voldemort. Harry's eyes widen what? He wasn't a Death Eater and the one who betrayed my parents was Peter. I saw the moment he told Voldemort my parents' location. Ishkigal stands in alarm. What? But then why was Sirius Black arrested? He was known as your father's best friend. It's why his imprisonment for the Potter's deaths shook the wizarding world. Harry closed his eyes I don't know. But I plan to find out, where is he imprisoned? Ishkigal sits back down sigh. He and most of Voldemort's inner circle of Death Eaters were sent to Azkaban. If he really is innocent then that poor man has been going through some horrible experiences. Harry opens his eyes, Azkaban? Yeah, I know about that godforsaken prison and those monsters called Dementors. Voldemort was able to get them to his side during the war with him according to his memories. The fact that most of Voldemort's inner circle is there is just the icing on the cake, Harry grins, yes let's deal a massive blow to the noseless bastard. Looks like I'll be going to Azkaban and kill any Death Eaters I find in there and those Dementors I saw in Voldemort's memories. Also, I'll break Sirius out and ask him about what happened that night, we don't have to worry about the ring for now since it's a Peevil family heirloom so once I claim my lordships I'll call it to me along with the other two both Ishkigal and Yasaka could only stare as Harry grins and chuckles darkly. Harry turns to look at both Digimon well then we all have our objectives, let's get them done. Both Digimon nod and respond right. They both open a dark corridor and walk through. Meanwhile, in front of Harry, a window opens new quest. Time to hand out some payback on the monster who murdered your parents and take away some of his toys. Objectives. 1. Kill all Death Eaters imprisoned in Azkaban. 2. Kill all Dementors. Bonus. Break out Sirius Black from his unjust imprisonment and find out what happened that night five years ago. Rewards. 1. Random skill box. 2. Random skill box. Bonus. Title. Air Black. Harry looks at the quest prompt and as he reads the reward for the bonus objective a confused look appears on his face. Air Black? Interesting. I guess I'll find out once I'm done with all of this. He closes the window and turns to look at the three women in the room. Okay, I'll be back soon. All three women nod at him and watch him open a dark corridor and walk through. Dash. Tilda Diagon Alley, Gringotts Bank, Bellatrix's Vault. A dark corridor materializes inside the vault of the Dark Witch, Bellatrix Lestrange, and out of it walks out Lilith Mon. She looks around and notices the cup sitting on a pedestal in the middle of the vault. There it is, she walks towards it and looks at it, yes I can sense a soul within it, she grabs it and puts it inside her inventory. An alarm goes off from the room surrounding the pedestal but she pays it no mind and opens another dark corridor and walks through it, by the time the goblins go there to investigate she was long gone. Dash. Tilda Malfoy Manor, Wiltshire, England. Billsman walks out of dark corridor right in front of Malfoy's manor and looks around. His eyes are able to see the wards around the mansion. <clears throat> With those wards, I can kiss stealth away, he shrugs. May, it's not my style anyways but let's make sure they can't get away. He snaps his red claws and a dark dome appears on top of the manor completely covering it. Inside the manor, Lucius Malfoy awakes in a panic having felt his connection to the manor's wards abruptly being cut off. He gets up and reaches for his cane and unsheaths his wand from it wake up Narcissa. The lady sleeping beside him jumps awake Lucius what's going on. She gets up in a hurry and grabs her wand. Lucius looks at her with a worried and nervous look my connection to the wards was cut off. Someone must have gotten in, go to Draco's room and lock the door. Narcissa nods and quickly runs towards her son's room. Meanwhile, Billsman is already in Lucius's office, and a few house elves can be seen on the ground unconscious and spread around the office, let's see the map highlights this office so the diary must be around here, his eyes shine as he looks around the office when he sees a dark glow come from the desk, he walks towards it and raises a fist only to bring it down harshly hitting and destroying the desk. He bends down and reaches between the destroyed pieces and pulls out the diary. There it is he grins only to frown immediately when he hears, Avada Kedavara. 
A bright green orb of light flies off Lucius's wand but once it hits the creature's back it splashes off harmlessly causing Lucius to gape in shock for a second but he begins to step back in fear when the creature begins to stand up. That kinda tickled. Billsman turns to look at the person who dares attack him only to grin when the game points him out to be his second objective. Well, well. Looks like it's my lucky day. He begins to walk towards Lucius who in a panic begins to sling all kinds of spells at the creature only to see them splash off it harmlessly again, seeing his spells fail him he tries to apparat only to find himself unable to do so. He then was about to turn and run when the creature grabs him by the hand wielding his wand and be lifted off the ground. Billsman squeezes his hand and crushes both Lucius's hand and wand making him scream in agony. There, now you and I are going to take a little trip he opens a dark corridor and walks through while dragging a screaming and kicking Lucius Malfoy. By the time Narcissa and Draco came to check what happened, Lucius Malfoy would be long dead. Dash. Tilda Highlands of Scotland, Hogwarts. A dark corridor appears on one of the first floors of Hogwarts and Lilithmon walks out of it. Um, so this is Hogwarts? The magic around here is so thick, it seems they built this castle on top of ley lines, impressive. For humans at least Lilithmon begins to walk and by following the game's map arrives quickly on the seventh floor, following Harry's instructions she finds the room of requirement and goes in. She quickly finds the diadem by following the same dark signature of Voldemort's soul and takes it. All done she opens a dark corridor and walks into it completely unaware of the chaos she caused when her presence not only made the wards go off but shatters most of them with her presence alone. It seems like it is going to be a long night for the foolish headmaster. Dash. Tilda Crystal Cave, British Shores. Billsman appears by the entrance of the cave and begins to walk in while still dragging a screaming and scared Lucius Malfoy. Once inside after walking for a while he reaches a giant lake that seems to be filled with corpses of course this doesn't stop him and so he spreads his wings and takes off flying over the lake not caring about the screams of pain coming from his prisoner. He lands in a small inland in the middle of the lake and spots the cub Harry mentioned. He throws Lucius towards it and watches him bounce off the ground a couple of times but he ignores that and walks towards the cup and lifts it up to his face to take a look inside it only to see a shimmering liquid. He nods and walks towards Lucius with the cup in his hand. When he reaches him he sits him up and then grabs him by the back of his head with one hand and begins to squeeze with his claws causing Lucius to scream once again in pain. Only for Bealsman to force the cup into his mouth and pour the liquid mercilessly down his throat. Lucius struggles as hard as he can but the monster's strength is too much and the only thing he can do is drink the liquid forced on him until there's no more. Billsman lets go of his prisoner and takes the locket out of the cup only to frown when he senses that is lacking the soul shard. TCH, the boss won't be happy about this. Lucius struggles to breath as an overwhelming sense of thirst begins to consume him you wretched creature. Do you have any idea of who I am? Billsman grins at him and shrugs don't know, don't care. With a flap of his wings he takes off and hovers above the inland and soon it won't matter because today is the day you die. Billsman points a hand at Lucius and his arm transforms into Death Slinger a huge blaster capable of mass destruction Corona Destroyer. Lucius could only lay there as the enormous orb of energy heads toward him, the last thing he sees is white as he's consumed by the orb. Meanwhile, Billsman opens a dark corridor and flies into it as the attack detonated, completely destroying the entire cave off the face of the planet. The explosion was so big that I lit the sky for a few seconds luckily as it was in a far off place and in the middle of the night no one saw it. Chapter 4, Chapter 4. Tilda in the middle of the North Sea, Azkaban. High above the island, we see Harry hovering staring at the prison with a cold look in his eyes. His eyes begin to glow green as he activates his Rinnegan, a perk he gained after help Naruto and Sasuke defeat Kage in unlocking the Otsutsuki race. He looks around at the prison and he can see the silhouettes of people highlighted in red, marking them by the game as hostile enemies. Those are the Death Eaters. Huh? And those? The Dementors. He notices some creatures highlighted in black flying around the prison, some seem to be tormenting some of the criminals. He keeps looking around until he finds his target highlighted in blue there's serious black. Now how to do this? He rubs his chin with a finger as he thinks for a bit I have to get rid of the Dementors first and then take out the guards, luckily there's only four tonight. He turns to look towards the guardhouse where he sees four blue silhouettes that seem to be just sitting around on the first floor, he turns back to look at one of the Dementors. Scan. Dementor. A creature created through dark magic, classified as undead, it possesses an aura that absorbs positive emotions and causes its victims to relay traumas, it also feeds on human souls. 
It is thought to be immune to everything except the Patronus Charm which is a spell that uses positive emotions to create a guardian spirit to protect the caster. Weaknesses, Light and Fire Harry closed the window, so they have the same weaknesses as any other undead, it's just the level of magic strength, wizards can wield is not enough to go through their natural magic resistance. He closes his eyes and thinks about what to do. On his mind his orange wearing friend with his cheerful smile appears, causing him to chuckle when in doubt to do as that knucklehead would do he grins and crosses his fingers to Juu Cage Bunch in no jutsu. Multiple explosions of smoke appear around Harry, and from them, many shadow clones emerge go and kill those monsters, right? All the clones respond and begin to glow white as they disappear in blurs. Meanwhile, inside the prison the inmates are all either sleeping or sitting in a corner talking to themselves when they begin to hear horrible wails of pain from outside, they all look out of their cell's window only to be able to see flashes of light and dementors explode in motes of white light. As all of this is happening a dark corridor materializes on the ceiling of the guard house alerting the errors into drawing their ones, but it's of no use as Harry emerges from it at high speed, the guards are unable to catch sight of him could only gape when he appears behind one of the guards and chops him on the back of the neck knocking him out. Before they can react Harry jumps and spins towards another guard kicking him in the head and sending him to the ground out cold. The other two guard point at Harry with their wands stupefy. Two red orbs fly at Harry but they just splash off him sorry but that level of magic has no effect on me. The two guards gape only to see Harry vanish in a blur and appear in front of one punching him in the stomach causing the guard fold in half on his fist and then sent flying off until he crashes against the wall unconscious. Harry wastes no time and jump near the last guard on the chin lifting him off the ground for a few seconds until he comes down and crashes onto the ground completely out. Harry looks around and then snaps his finger and the guards get shrouded in shadows and disappear. A clone appears in front of him and salutes all Dementors have been eliminated boss. Harry sweat drops and nods okay, dispel yourself to let everyone else know to dispel too the clone nods and dispels, and a few seconds later he can hear the other clones begin to dispel too. Well, that was easy enough. He punches a wall and gets out of the guardhouse he takes off flying and goes around the prison until he stops in front of the barred window of Sirius's cell. He waves his hand and the wall where the window is located begins to melt. Meanwhile inside Sirius is sleeping on his bed or at least trying to but a noise and soft glow forces him to open his eyes, only to see one of his walls heat up and melt as it softly glows red until a big opening forms. He notices a small body float in slowing and land on the middle of his cell, he sits up and was about to speak when he notices the unknown person's eyes slightly glowing green making his eyes widen in recognition of that eye color. As for Harry, he could only raise an eyebrow as he watches Sirius escape at him take a picture, it'll last longer he grins when he sees Sirius jump a bit and shakily stands up walking towards what he now sees as a young boy and his eyes regain some of its old shine when he notices the messy black hair. H Harry? Harry smiles that's my name. Sirius can't help but chuckle Merlin, you have your mother's sarcastic sense of humor, too bad you have your father's bird nest of hair. W what? Comma, I got my hair from my father, comma god am it dad. You gave me this curse. Sirius couldn't help it and begins to laugh hard only for tears to begin to fall from his eyes as he falls to his knees laughing and crying, as Harry looks as the poor man breaks down, he kneels in front of Sirius and hugs it's okay Sirius. Sirius leans his face into Harry's shoulder I'm so sorry Harry. It was my fault. I was the one who told James to change secret keepers. Harry narrows his eyes, so that's how it happened. They used a Fidelius charm, why were you arrested? Sirius pulls back and looks at Harry I had a bad feeling. So I went to check on you and your parents but I only found Hagrid standing there with you is his arms. He told me that Dumbledore order him to take you somewhere safe so I gave him my flying motorcycle and took off to look for Peter. Harry closes his eyes, so the old fool was already ready, bastard must have been monitoring the house so he would know when Voldemort would attack. Sirius continues I went to Peter's apartment thinking he was hurt or was being tortured but I found him leaving it in a hurry and that's how I figured he betrayed us so I yelled at him and chased him down but the bloody coward blew up some gas lines with a bombarder. I was able to shield myself but the explosion killed a few miles and sent me flying, all I could see was Peter cutting off a finger, turn into the rat and get away, I was pretty hysterical and so out of it from the explosion so all I remember was being arrested and the next morning I woke up here. Harry nods and gets up helping Sirius stand I see. So the coward is still alive and hiding he looks away in thought well no matter he'll get what's coming to him eventually, anyways let's go Sirius. Harry and Sirius begin to float making Sirius's eyes widen as they begin to fly out of the cell through the opening made by Harry. 
Poor Sirius chokes on his spit a bit as they fly up to the sky only to stop and hover high above Azkaban you're flying. I'm flying. Merlin's saggy balls. Harry chuckles a bit. You haven't seen anything yet. Harry points an open palm towards the island and his energy begins to flare as a blue orb begins to form. Sirius can only look in shock as he witnesses the power his godson seems to wield. W what are you going to doing? Harry grins at him. I'm going to destroy this entire island along Azkaban and all those Death Eaters in there. Sirius's eyes take on a cold look good. Those bastards deserve it. The energy ball begins to grow enormously hey. Glad you agree. Big bang attack. The giant orb shoots out of Harry's open palm and hits Azkaban detonating and causing a giant explosion that lights up the sky raising Azkaban the island, and the Death Eaters from the face of the planet. Harry and Sirius stare at the big bright explosion as Sirius gulps. Holy shit, that was wicked. Harry turns to him and smile. Glad you like it, now let's go home. Sirius tearfully smiles and nods, and Harry opens the dark corridor and they both fly into it. Meanwhile once the explosion subsidies, on the water where the island used to be we find a small boat floating, and inside we find the four guards laying there and occasionally groaning in pain. Dash. Tilda Kyoto, Japan, Yasaka's office. Both Yasaka and Irshkigal are enjoying talking and catching up while Kanu can be seen taking a nap on her mother's lap when two dark corridors materialize. Lilidmon and Veilsman walk out from them, and both ladies turn to look at them. Irshkigal smiles. Oh? You're back she says as she turns to look at a clock on Yasaka's desk that was fast, only a few hours have passed. Veilsman grins. Well dark corridors made the trip faster and the game helps by guiding us. Besides the mission was easy enough. Lilithmon nods. Is Master Harry back yet? As soon as she mentions Harry's name another dark corridor appears and Harry walks out of it helping someone else walk through it. Everyone looks at the gaunt man in pity having noticed how skinny and weak he seems. Harry walks Sirius towards a couch and lays him down on it. Rest Sirius. We'll have time to catch up later Sirius smiles and slowly falls asleep and for the first time in years, he has happy and peaceful dreams. Harry smiles sadly and erects a barrier around him to prevent any noise from waking him. He then kneels down and places a hand on the floor healing circle. A magic circle appears below from where Sirius is sleeping and begins to let out a soft green light. A new window opens in front of Harry but he closes it mentally deciding to check it later. Harry gets up and walks back to everyone. Yasaka stares at Sirius for a bit before turning to look at Harry I take it that he really was innocent. Harry nods. Yes and it seems like Dumbledore is involved somehow, I'll make sure to ask him when he wakes up and heals, apparently he was just tossed into Azkaban so I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get a trial. Lady Yasaka could you help us and find out? Yasaka nods. Of course Harry, I'll get in contact with the Japanese branch of the ICW and ask for an investigation, don't worry we'll get justice for him. Harry smiles recognizing the term from Voldemort's memories, he bows lightly. Thank you so much Yasaka nods happily, Harry then turns to his Digimon friends. So how did it go guys? Both Digimon grin and salute, one of Harry's A's twitching a bit while Yasaka and Irshkigal try not to laugh at the face Harry was making. Lilithmon covers her mouth with one of her sleeves and giggles foo fa foo. Everything went without a hitch master she pulls out both the cup and diadem and places them on Yasaka's desk. Billsman frowns a bit boss it almost went according to plan and Lucius Malfoy is dead but something is wrong with one of the Horcruxes he takes both the diary and lock it out and places them on the desk. Harry frowns and walks towards the desk and his eyes glow green as he looks at the objects only to see three of them glow black but the locket is not being highlighted in any color that's because the locket isn't a Horcrux is just a plain locket, did you find it in the cup? Billsman nods. Yes, after I forced Lucius to drink the liquid inside I found it in the bottom of the cup. It didn't have the same glow as the dairy but I took it anyways. I'm sorry boss. Harry shakes his head negatively it isn't your fault Bealsman. Someone must have gotten to it before we did he rubs his chin in any case. Good job guys. Thank you both Digimon smile and nod happily and banish in pillars of dark light. Yasaka and Irshkigal stare at the objects with disgust but Kanu wakes up from both the noise and the black lights she rubs her eyes and stares still not fully awake as she gets up from her mother's lap but before she decides where to go she catches sight of Harry and a bright smile appears on her face. Sensei. She runs towards Harry excitedly and jumps into his arms off, hello Kanu Harry holds Kanu up as she holds him and smiles at him. Kanu lets go to stand beside her sensei proudly causing both Yasaka and Irshkigal to giggle. 
Ishkigal then turns to look back at the Horcruxes. What do you plan to do with these things? She points at the corrupted objects. Harry looks at the Horcruxes for a moment but then points a palm at them and Oathkeeper appears. He grabs hold of the handle and points the keyblade at the Horcruxes as a powerful beam of white light shoots out from the tip and hits them. A few seconds later three pillars of black smoke begin to flow out of the objects letting wails of agony as they're purified by the light until they the disperse in motes of light. Harry lets the keyblade disappear once the Horcruxes are gone leaving the three magical objects free of any dark magic. Kanu's eyes sparkle that light is so pretty. Harry chuckles and rubs Kanu's head gently it sure is. Now we only need to get the other two. I wonder where the locket is? He closes his eyes for a bit and then opens them. HMPH. I'm sure we'll find it eventually sigh. Ishkigal gets up and walks towards Harry what's the next plan then Harry? Harry smiles and looks at her. For now we rest and let Sirius recuperate, then we work on getting him his freedom he looks at Kanu and start training Kanu, afterwards once Sirius is free I'll go to Gringotts and claim my lordships. Ishkigal nods while Kanu looks excited about starting her training. Yasaka smile and gets up well then let's get you to a room she turns to look at Sirius. Is it safe to move him? Harry nods and smiles yes the barrier and magic circle will move with him. Yasaka nods that's impressive, I'll have him move to a room. Let's leave him here for now. Harry smiles at Yasaka and gives her a happy nod. Yasaka smiles and begins to walk with Ishkigal and Harry following her as Kanu excitedly speaks to Harry about her day. All of them look forward to a good sleep with what's left of the night unaware of the chaos and panic that the events of this night will bring about to the wizarding world only adding to the worry and fears of a meddling old fool. Dash. Time a skip. Next morning 10 a.m. Tilda Hogwarts, Headmaster's Office. We find a haggard and tired-looking Dumbledore sitting behind his desk, the eye bags under his eyes show the lack of sleep since last night the wards almost collapsed after a powerful intruder somehow was able to get into the castle, sending him and all the professors into panic but by the time they were done looking through the castle the intruder seemed to just vanish which should be impossible and for the rest of the night the headmaster spent it fixing and recharging the wards. Dumbledore sits there rubbing his brow with his hand tiredly and worried when his chimney lights up in green fire and the face of Cornelius Oswald Fudge appears Albus. Are you in there? Can I come through? Dumbledore sighs and takes a big breath as he gets up from his desk and walks towards the green fire of course Cornelius, come on in the green flames flare, and the Minister of Magic steps in. Albus just what's going? Lucius is kidnapped, Gringotts gets broken in and what's worst Azkaban is gone. Albus looks at the minister in complete confusion, he really doesn't care about Lucius, since he's been a pain on his bony ass for a long time but someone broke into Gringotts, and Azkaban is gone? Cornelius slows down and explains slowly, I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about Cornelius stares at the headmaster, you haven't heard? Albus shakes his head negatively no, we've been busy here, someone broke in last night and almost shattered all the wards, I spent all night fixing and recharging them Cornelius nods and sighs dear Merlin just what is going. Last night someone also broke into Malfoy's manor and destroyed a desk in Lucius's office, it seems that he or they were looking for something, and then according to Narcissa and her young son they heard Lucius screaming in pain and demanding someone or something to let him go, after the noise went down they both went to check and couldn't find Lucius anywhere. Albus widen his eyes in shock. Cornelius continues then a few hours later I get an owl with a letter from Gringotts telling me that someone broke into one of their vaults, one belonging to Bellatrix Lestrange, and managed to get away unseen. Albus could only continue to stare in shock at the minister, someone broke into Gringotts and got away? That was supposed to be impossible. Cornelius goes on and this morning I get Amelia Bones coming into my office in a panic and tells me that Azkaban is gone. Albus with a serious look in his eyes what do you mean gone? Cornelius begins to rub his temples gone as there's no sight of it anywhere the prison, the island, and even the Dementors have disappeared, there's also signs of a massive explosion and we found the Forerers posted on guard duty that night on a small boat unconscious and severely injured. Albus just couldn't believe what he was hearing was it destroyed? What about the inmates? Cornelius takes off his hat and begins to fidget with it nervously we believe so and there were readings of massive amounts of unknown energy, as for the inmates, dead Gringotts confirmed it, all the vaults belonging to them went inactive, all we could get from the guards was they were assaulted by small figure that moved so fast they couldn't see it and two glowing green eyes. At the mention of the glowing green eyes the old headmaster flinched a bit and begins to sweat nervously. He can't help to think about what Petunia told him about Harry, about that pressure and those glowing green eyes. Just what's going on? 
Is Harry involved in all this? Comma Alba Stumbledore the headmaster of Hogwarts can't help but feel dread fill his heart. The meddling old man has no idea of the monster that has begun to move but by the time he finds out, will be when he already has his throat in its jaws. Chapter 5, Freedom for a Mad Dog. Time skip, one week after returning to home dimension, Harry's Poff. A week has passed since the night I'd come back from his journey and a lot has happened in those seven days. I'd gained a student, joined a supernatural faction, dealt a massive blow towards my enemies the Death Eaters, destroyed some of Voldemort's Horcruxes, and enacted a jailbreak for, who I now knew was my godfather, Sirius Black, and those were just the highlights of that week. Of course, in between those momentous occasions, I'd focused on training my protege, Kanu, in various forms of magic and martial arts, something she thankfully found very enjoyable, and healing Sirius, which had taken a few days of intense effort on Eris and I's part. Thankfully as of now, Sirius is once more a healthy, mostly sane, and can often be seen playing a prank, or two, on a poor yokai, or dozen, usually with the help of either Kanu and or I being accomplices, or flirting with some of the female Inagami, who seem to be oddly attracted to him, I thought with some mild amusement. Apparently, the dogfighter was strong in him, who knew. Of course I'd spent a lot of my time talking with Sirius about my parents and their crazy adventures he'd had with my father and another friend, Remus Lupin, who also happened to be a werewolf. This led to me finding out about their little club, the Marauders. Though I'd ended up chiding him at some of the pranks they'd, rightly calling them bullying, Sirius did agree with me that maybe they'd gone over the top with some of the pranks. But to be fair, they were young and children don't really think long term nor their resulting repercussions to others around them. It wasn't until the day after I'd recused my dog fighter that I'd finally got around to checking my notification backlog from saving Sirius and the resulting rewards, one of which was, interesting, namely, getting a skill book for a skill I already had, which had never happened before now. The skill in question was called, Holy Fire Manipulation. Confused as to why this had happened, I'd pulled the skill book from my inventory and rechecked the description. With a quick glance at it, I quickly cottoned onto what was happening. Skill, Holy Fire. This skill allows the reader to learn the ability to produce and manipulate Holy Fire, which are white flames composed of light and fire. These flames can both be used to heal allies and burn away corruption and dark aligned enemies, such as undead and demons. Note, this spell is unable to harm light aligned creatures, such as angels or uncorrupted spirits. Addendum, this skill book can be given to, or used by users fellow team members, or anyone categorized as his or her student. Rereading the description once more to make sure I hadn't misread the addendum, it did seem like the GMS was trying to help me with training Kanu, by allowing her, and others I might take on in the future, the ability to benefit from my blessing as well. Shaking my head ruefully, even after all these years since Eris had blessed me with her gift, it can still do things that surprise me, with that mystery solved, I went back to check the other notifications, one of which stood out was informing me that I was now the proud owner of the title, Air Black. Ding ding. New title gained, Air Black. The holder of this title is the heir of the most ancient and the most noble house of Black. The Blacks were once an influential and extremely wealthy house of magic users who were well known from their dark spells and cunning political maneuvering. Unfortunately, due to war, infighting, and an unhealthy level of inbreeding, the once politically powerful house's influence has been greatly diminished, it still however holds a significant amount of wealth in the form of land, loans owed, and galleons. Note, spells that are dark in nature gain a 5% extra damage and duration. This buff will evolve when, if the user becomes Lord Black. Addendum, the Blacks were well-known flirts and horn dogs. 10% to all rep gains opposite sex upon initial meeting. Wondering how it was possible for me to even claim this title I went and asked Sirius about it. From his explanation, it basically came down to the fact that we're related through my grandmother, Dora Potane Black, and as such I'm close enough to the main Black family line that I'm legally able to be offered this title. My position as heir could only be threatened if Sirius has a child, who would supersede me due to him being a direct descendant of the Lord Black. You being my legal heir Harry, is probably the only reason that I'm still alive, Sirius admitted. If Lucius offered me, he would have lost whatever current level of access he has to the black political power and vaults through his wife Narcissus nor would their brat, Draco I think his name is, be able to claim heirship. That would have only been possible if you weren't alive to challenge the heirship, and since they couldn't find you, which is the only thing I'm grateful to Dumbledore for, they had to settle for second best, he explained before sighing. I honestly don't know what happened to Narcissa. 
We, the younger generation of blacks, were close once when we were children. Sirius mumbles sadly while staring off into the distance. We had to be, the older generation of blacks were truly awful parents to us Harry, so us kids all did our best to stick together to survive their madness. He shakes his head from side to side as if trying to shake off a bad dream. Anyways, enough about my family Harry, how about you talk about what happened to you after I let a grid take you to Dumbledore? He asked. I grimace, but he did need to know. My earliest memory was. I started. Telling Sirius what my life had been like after he'd allowed Hagrid to take me to Dumbledore and the resulting hell I'd had to experience after the old bastard had abandoned me with my relatives, Uncle Vernon, Aunt Petunia, and Cousin Dudley Dursley, on their doorstep some winter night, only to be starved and beaten to near inches of my life, repeatedly, almost caused Sirius to have an aneurysm on the spot. His eyes bulged and his face had gone this amazing shade of purple. It was just as I was getting seriously concerned for his health that he exploded in a string of cursing that would make sailors blush. The cursing was so intense and toxic that it caused both Eris and Yasaka to hurriedly rush to Kanu and I and plug our ears with their hands. I couldn't help but give Eris a deadpan look of are you serious? Which caused her to laugh nervously at her silliness. Sorry Harry, I forget you're a lot older than your current body would suggest. T.E.I. just rolled my eyes at her as she played the dumb klutz card. After Sirius was done expanding my own vast repertoire of curse words, which again, was a rather impressive feat, all things considered, I went on to explain what had happened after I received my blessing from my goddess, which caused his eye to open wide and stare at her in shock and probably quite a bit of fear and awe. I mean, it's not every day you get to meet a goddess of death and live to tell the tale of it, I thought amusedly. Even though I gave Sirius the vastly condensed and watered-down version of my life after leaving Earth it still took most of that day. Merlin's balls Harry. I expected your life to have been interesting, but this, this is beyond the pale. Sirius commented then down the rest of his whiskey. But I'm proud of you Harry and I know for a fact that if your mom and dad were still with us, they'd be damned proud of you too. Our talk continued well into the night, with each of us swapping tales of our exploits and cock-ups. The morning after my talk with Sirius, who was hungover, I found myself being dragged out into the massive palace gardens by my godfather in his dog form. It seems that my dog Farter, for some odd reason, believed that being in his dog form could help him cope with his alcohol-induced migraine. What he seemed to have forgotten was that in his dog form, he was far more susceptible to its instincts, which I enjoyed toying with by placing a mild confusion charm on a few tennis balls I'd created and having him chase them. It was as I was playing ball with my dog Farter that I spotted a rather excited Kanu running to and fro throughout palace halls as if she was looking for something or someone. It was during her fifth pass that I finally decided to call out to her and ask what she was doing, only for her to stop suddenly and trip over herself when she heard my yell. Ah, sensei. I've been looking all over for you. She yelled as she charged over, only to jump behind me when she spotted Sirius in his dog form bounding up to me with a ball in his mouth. Ah, sensei. There's a huge dog charging right at us. She yelped from behind me. Chuckling at her misunderstanding I explained what, or more who, it was. Ha ha ha, can, that's my dog Farter, Sirius. To Kanu this was an amazing discovery. She hadn't known that witches and wizards could transform into animals, which in her opinion was a rather awesome ability to have. So what you're saying sensei is that all witches and wizards can become this animagus thing and they can become any animal they want. She questioned excitedly hopping from one foot to another. Laughing at his protege's silliness, he explained further. No no, Kanu. Not any animal they want. A witch or wizard can only turn into one kind of animal, but that animal is random. Some may turn into a cat, others a dog, but once they transform into that animal, that's the only one they can use. Actually, I should say creature rather than animal, as I've read that some witches, wizards have been recorded transforming into bugs. My mention of the dreaded B word had Kanu making the icky face all young girls could pull off flawlessly. Sirius explained it to me the other day, that becoming an animagus is rather difficult and time-consuming and that it technically falls under the transfiguration branch of magic. Luckily for you, as you can already turn into a cute little fox so you won't need to learn this time-consuming magic. I noticed that Kana's cheeks blushed a little at my calling her cute, but she shook her head and then looked at Sirius as he sat at our feet chewing on a tennis ball before asking. Ah sensei, why is Mr. Sirius actually acting like a dog? Kanu asked. I laughed for a few moments, ah, well this is my revenge for his prank yesterday. You see, I placed a few spells on those tennis balls that makes him want to chase and chew on them like an actual dog, I explained. 
causing Connie to giggle at our mischief, which has caused her poor mother no end of headaches over the last few days. That's so mean, Sensei, she said between giggles. I shrugged while unsummoning the tennis balls Sirius was playing with, anyways Kanu, what is you so excitable this early in the morning? I asked her. But before she could answer, Sirius transformed back into his human form and gave Kanu a wave before rounding on me with a growl. You! He barked. You sneaky little blighter. I couldn't stop chasing those Merlin but damned balls and what did you apply to them that made me want to eat the damn things? He asked while shaking me back and forth. Now, now Sirius. I managed to gasp out, you know the rules about pranking. I replied cheekily, only to be growled at again. Thankfully, my protege jumped to my rescue. Good morning Mr. Sirius. She chirped happily as she waved at Sirius, then turned to smile at me. Oh, that's right Sensei. Look. She said while reaching out in front of her with an open palm. After a moment there was a small flash of light and gripped with her hand a keyblade. I finally got my keyblade Sensei. She gushes excitedly causing him and Sirius to smile and clap. Smiling, I reach out a hand and Kanu hands me her keyblade so that I could inspect it. As I'm checking it Sirius leans over my shoulder to take a better look at it before commenting. So this is a keyblade huh? I thought it would be more impressive, but it kinda looks like a toy. Kanu pouts at his comment which only causes him to chuckle. Meanwhile, I decided to use the skill, observe on the keyblade. Observe. Keyblade, Starlight. Another iconic weapon from the Kingdom Hearts series and was wielded by one of Disney's most famous mascots. Keyblade Starlight is a blade that has survived since antiquity. This keyblade is a perfect blend of both offense and defensive magic. Its current form is a little basic, but like almost all keyblade, it has massive potential to continue to grow and evolve. This keyblade is also slightly different from its original Disney version. In the fact that it evolves and changes form as the gamer, you, grows and evolves, growing ever stronger, thus completely getting rid of ever needing to get new weapons. Note, this blade grants its user the ability to manipulate fire in all its forms. Addendum, 10% to all rep gains with astronauts. Soul bound, Kanu. After confirming what I had suspected I handed back the blade to Kanu while turning towards Sirius and slyly kicking his ankle for his rude comment about Kanu's weapon causing him to yelp and jump in the air in pain. Smirking at a job well done, I turned back to my protege before saying, congratulations Kanu, now we can begin your training in swordsmanship. Kanu's small head nods rapidly before jumping up and down while throwing a few fist pumps happily. Yay, I've been waiting for this. I grin at her enthusiasm, I wonder how long that will last when she realizes it's going to be seriously hard work, I thought before turning towards Sirius. And you? What are your plans for today? I asked him. Glaring up at me while rubbing his sore ankle he answered, Well today Lady Yasaku is taking me to the ICW office, as I've finally gotten that trial I deserved in one of their courts. She has informed me that since I am innocent all I'll have to do is allow them to use Veritaserum on me and then give them my memory of the events of that night, while answering all of their questions. Hopefully, all things go well, and I should be cleared of all false charges by as early as this afternoon pausing for a moment to catch his breath before a wicked smile crosses his face, he he he, I really wish I could be a fly on the wall when Dumbledore and that utter waste of perfectly good air, Cornelius Fudge, find out I'm a free man later this evening. Smirking along with my godfather I nod in agreement, just be cautious when you're out there serious, Dumbledore and his cronies will be on the lookout for you, especially that old fool, I have no doubt that he's always flipping every table looking for me and he'll try to get close to you to get control over me. Sirius nods in agreement. I'll do my best Harry, I won't let him hurt you like that again, my godfather promises me. In any case, I am glad you're set to be free by tomorrow. We'll need to set a time to go to Gringotts as I need to claim my lordships and get our respective house affairs in order. Sirius just nods with a grin, well enough about that, I better make my way to Lady Yasaka so we can set off in time. He gives Karu a pat on the head and then walks off to meet with Lady Yasaka. Finally alone with his protege I turn to Kanu and ask, so, are you ready to start training Kanu? I again warn you, my training will be very hard and demanding. She looks at my face for a few moments before giving me a resolute nod as determination fills her eyes. Yes, sensei. I want to learn, I want to be strong. She answers. I just smile. Well then, I guess we better get started. Just remember, I'll be with you every step of the way Kanu. She just smiles widely. I reach out and place my hand on top of her head and cast one of my more useful spells. 
As I close my eyes a purple outline begins to shine around Kanu and she lets out a grunt as her body suddenly feels heavier. I've casted a special gravity spell on you. It'll continually increase the gravity of your body as you grow stronger and adapt to the increased weight. Once your training is done for the day, I'll remove the spell, but for now, just hang in there. Kanu nods and begins to slowly move around the garden trying to get used to her new weight while trying to swing Starlight around. Once she'd found her new sense of balance she turned toward me and nodded. I think I'm ready, Sensei. I'm honestly a little impressed by how quickly she got used to the extra weight. I wonder if it is something to do with her biology? I wondered. Or maybe it's because of one of my titles or is she just naturally talented? Maybe all three? Probably all three, I concluded. For now Kanu, I want you to swing your keyblade diagonally and horizontally a hundred times each way, I ordered. Kanu nods with a determined look and begins to do so while I keep watching to make sure she doesn't hurt herself by overdoing it. An hour later Eris walks by and briefly watches Kanu as she continues her exercise. Kanu, who is now sweating profusely, has been swinging her keyblade, starlight with its ever increasing weight for a while now, suddenly over swings, which unbalanced her, causing her to trip and land head first onto the pacing below her with such force that it actually crack it a bit. Wincing a bit at the sound, I moved to help her get up only for Kanu to jump up quickly and wipe away the small trickle of blood coming from her nose. I may okay. She yells out while doing a few fist pumps while picking up her keyblade to finish off the last few reps she has left to do. Watching this scene, Iyashkagal can't help but release a few sweat drops. W what even am I watching? Eris turns to ask me, to which I just wryly smile back at her. Dash. Time I skip, that evening. Tilda Scottish Highlands, Hogwarts, Headmaster's Office, Dumbledore's Poff. Albus Percival Welfrock Brian Dumbledore was not having a good day at all. Not at all, he thought morosely. Not even his favorite lemon drops were helping him today. It had all started to go wrong three days ago. Somehow that despicable Rita Skeeter woman had been able to find out about the wards almost totally failing that had left Hogwarts defenseless the other night, and as she was, wrote a vicious piece about that event in that rag they called, The Daily Prophet, which has caused every parent and their pet house elf to be on my ass. he thought irritably. If I could get my hands on that woman I'd, sighing and shaking his head. Now wasn't the time to deal with what-ifs. Now was the time to deal with all of the powerful parents who had their children studying here all threatening to pull their children out of Hogwarts. I can't have that. I'd lose all my extra benefits from skimming funds off the top of the school budgets. It also didn't help that many of the school's board now had him by the short and curlies and were demanding answers. Answers he couldn't actually give them, because he was just as clueless as they were. And if that hadn't been headache-inducing enough, I've had that fool of a minister. Cornelius Fudge, come barging into my office late last night, I groaned, the minister had shoved his head into the flue sweating like a pig and looking as pale as a ghost, demanding I help him sort out the political shitstorm he was already facing because of Azkaban's complete and total disappearance. Of course, by the end of that discussion, I wasn't feeling much better, I thought truthfully, as my mind drifted back to yesterday morning's early and very rude wake-up call. Flashback start, the morning after Azkaban's disappearance. Dumbledore. Dumbledore you've got to help me. Cornelius' voice bellowed out from my office's fireplace. Being startled awake from my nap on my desk was a very unpleasant wake-up call. Don't people know not to startle older gentlemen in their sleep? I thought angrily. What is it, minister? I said shortly, what is so important that it couldn't wait till much later today? I growled at him. Doesn't this man know what kind of stress I'm under currently? First, it's young Harry going missing with no one having a Merlin damned clue where he could possibly be. Then it's last night's intruder almost destroying Hogwarts wards, and now this, grinding my teeth in frustration. I wait for the oaf to answer. I'll just let him sit there kneeling on the ground with his head poking through the fireplace at an awkward angle. It's black. Cornelius yells, spittle flying from his mouth. I tilt my head. Black? What black? I ask, hoping to prod the fool into talking faster. Serious Black. He's not dead. Cornelius bellows. He's escaped. I found myself jumping to my feet in alarm before even I knew I'd done it and bellowed back at Cornelius. What? What do you mean Serious Black has escaped? Flashback end. Ah. I sighed as I rubbed my aching temples. Finding out that Sirius was still alive due to the goblins and had been effectively named Lord Black, was going to make gaining control over young Harry all the more difficult if Sirius can clear his name, I groaned internally. 
I knew this to be a fact because he was one of the only witnesses still alive, not in jail or clinically insane still to have seen the creation of the Potter's will. The will where they'd named Sirius as young Harry Guardian and Godfather, I ground my teeth in frustration. So now that the rogue was now free and was, technically, young Harry's legal guardian meant that he'd I need to find young Harry first and then convince Sirius that I know what's best for him and that he should take time to recover from his stint in Azkaban. I said aloud but I had really meant was, with the help of a few compulsion charms, loyalty potions, and maybe a curse or two. But where is that Morgana blasted, boy? I growled. I've had every member of the order trying to track him down, called in countless favors and still, no one has a Merlin damned clue where that brat has gone. I yelled while slamming my fists on my desk in front of me. Leaning back into my chair I continued to think about what had been happening and how they'd all probably backtrack to young Harry. At this point, he was almost positive that young Harry has something to do with poor Lucius's kidnapping and the destruction of Azkaban, which is highly alarming news without the fact that the brat might have also been involved with the break-in at Gringotts as well. There were simply too many coincidences happening all at once for them not to be linked to Harry in some fashion. He was starting to feel a strange and unwanted feeling that he wasn't fully in control any longer and it was slowly overwhelming him. He hasn't been this unprepared or lacking in information for decades. He'd just reached over and popped his favorite sweet, lemon drops, into his mouth when out of nowhere his office door slammed open, which not only made him jump in his seat but also caused him to start choking on his sweet. Coughing and almost hacking up a lung, I turned angrily toward the newcomer ready to verbally eviscerate the invader with my righteous fury and make the interloper regret he'd ever had the gall to barge into his domain without informing me, only to stop suddenly and take in the man. Standing before in the flesh this time was one Cornelius Fudge, who was once again sweating like a stuffed pig and as pale as a hospital bedsheet. A. A. Albus, why why you have tea to R. read this? The incompetent man stammered while forcing a mostly crumbled and damp piece of paper into his hands. Taking the now damp, from the minister's sweat, piece of paper from the almost hyperventilating minister of magic he made his way back toward his desk to read its contents. Dash. To the British minister of magic. Cornelius Oswald Fudge. Minister, this letter is in regard to the outcome of a court case for one Lord Sirius Black, third of his name. We, the judges from the Court of High Justice of the International Confederation of Wizards, write this letter to inform you, the British Minister of Magic, that one Lord Sirius Black, third of his name, has been found not guilty of all charges that had been laid against him on, 1st of November 1981, during a trial that had been held late this afternoon. Early this afternoon, Lord Sirius Black, third of his name, appeared at ICW High Justice Courts and demanded, loudly, that he actually be tried for the supposed massacre he'd been blamed for, but had never had an actual trial for. After Lord Sirius Black had been taken into our custody, which he did not resist, he was then thoroughly questioned under Veritaserum, which he had willingly offered to be placed under. Once our investigators had gathered all the answers they thought were relevant to Lord Black's case. They asked him to provide unaltered, under oath of magic no less, which was again given willingly, memories of the night of the Potter's murder and of the subsequent massacre he was accused of. All evidence was then thoroughly cross-examined by our experts and was found to be free of any form of outside tampering or corruption. Once all evidence was deemed to be irrefutable the court, in its infinite wisdom, then declared that Lord Sirius Black, third of his name, innocent of all charges laid against him. As such, we at the ICW now demand that the British Ministry of Magic announce Lord Black's innocence and provide recompense for unwarranted and highly unlawful imprisonment, it should go without say, but again to be thorough, that the kiss on sight designation that was placed on Lord Black be immediately cancelled. In addition, Lord Black has asked to be reinstated as guardian and given custody of his godson, Harry James Potter. This request was accepted as Lord Black gave his memories of taking the Godfather oath. The British Ministry of Magic has five days to comply with the above-mentioned requirements. Failure to do so may result in sanctions and heavy fines. We here at the ICW Courts of High Justice thank you for your time. Dash. He had needed to reread the letter three times before its contents fully sunk in, but with each reread he could feel his blood pressure rising and a vein on his temple throb painfully each time his heart beat. When was the last time I'd been so blindsided like this? He thought with growing shock. Meanwhile, as he stood there trying to regain control of his emotions, Cornelius was fidgeting nervously and when the oppressing silence became too much for the minister, he asked, Well Dumbledore, what are we going to do about this? Dash. Tilda Yasaka's palace, Kyoto, Japan, Harry's Poff. Meanwhile, 
On the other side of the world, we can see a hugely grinning serious black poking a very tired and sore canoe, who was currently laying spread eagle on the living room floor of the palace. You okay down there princess? Sirius asked amusedly. Canoe weakly groans. Uck everything hurts, including my poor tails. She whined pitifully. Sirius chuckles a bit at her misfortune, only to receive a wallop on the back of his head that had ended up making him eat the floorboard from Kanu's mother, Yasaka, this caused both Ishkigal and himself to laugh out loud at his misfortune. Taking pity on his poor protege, he walks over to Kanu and pats her on the head. You've done great today Kanu, I say encouragingly, you were able to adapt quickly and learn how to use starlight quite effectively, I'm very proud of you. This earned me a huge smile from Kanu only for the moment to be broken due to the glutton's stomach growling loudly in protest, making her sweat drop and causing everyone to grin in amusement at her. Lady Yasaka giggles at her daughter's situation. All right, let's go eat everyone. Today we're going to celebrate Sirius's freedom and Kanu obtaining her keyblade, she announces. Laughing, everyone gets up and walks out leaving only him to pick up Kanu. Shrugging, he does so and drops her onto his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. A-H-H-H-H-H. Sensei. That's not how you carry a princess. Kanu whines, grinning at her aggishly, I know. I replied and ran to catch up with the others as she screamed in protest all the way. An hour after they were done eating a recharged Kanu quickly runs upstairs to take a bath, Yasaka then turns towards him and asks, So Harry, I hear that tomorrow you're planning on going to Diagon Alley to claim your lordships right? I nod before replying. That's the plan milady, Sirius and I have to meet with our respective vault managers, him for fully reactivating the black family vaults and actually claim his lord ring and I need to go claim both the potters and Peevil's lord rings and ask the goblins if they have a copy my parents a will. Eris frowned for a moment before saying, I'm pretty sure they will have a copy of the will little master, but the real million galleon question is why it was never activated after their deaths. I felt my eyes narrow in thought, honestly Eris, I answered slowly. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with Dumbledore and his machinations for me, or at the very least he was the driving force involved with their will being blocked, as he's the only one with enough political clout to pull something like that off without too many people kicking up a fuss. While almost everyone was frowning in thought, Sirius decided to speak up, Harry, I also want to contact Mooney. I turned to look fully at my godfather before answering him, you mean Remus Lupin right? Yours and my father's werewolf friend? Sirius nods before replying, that's right, I want to find out why he never looked into your living conditions, Sirius narrows his eyes in annoyance. I might be your legal godfather Harry, but we both promised your parents to care and look out for you if the worst should happen to them, so far, we've both been piss poor at keeping that promise, but I was locked away and I'm not sure what kept Remus away. Closing my eyes I sigh softly, if I had to guess, I suspect it has again, something to do with our white whiskered wanker, Dumbledore. That old fool seems intent on ensuring my life is as miserable as is humanly possible. I muttered darkly before continuing, just make sure you don't tell him anything about me yet Sirius, not until we know for sure he isn't in Dumbledore's pocket. I turned back to Lady Yasaka, anyways, sorry Lady Yasaka, you were in the process of asking me something, yes? Lady Yasaka smiles and nods her head in agreement, that's alright Harry and yes I have a request for you if possible. You see... Some of the vampire clans want to create an alliance with us, but as I'm tied to Kyoto's ley lines, I'm unable to go personally. So I would be extremely grateful if you could go to Romania as my representative and meet with my opposite representative of the House of Carmela. From what I've been able to gather, one of the main reasons they're asking for this alliance is because they've apparently been having escalating conflicts with another vampire house, Teps. I felt my eyebrows raise in surprise, vampires? I ask, I would have thought they'd be too prideful to actually ask for help, especially from another faction? Eris decided to speak up, that's usually how it would go, but because they're undead they might have instinctively sensed you, Harry, your title as the master of death makes them keenly aware of you, not that they know who you are exactly, but they do know you are in Kyoto and most likely a part of the yokai faction, otherwise they wouldn't have reached out, she explains. Lady Yasaka smiled at me, besides, this is a great opportunity to spread your name to the other major factions, and that you are a member of my yokai faction. She chitters excitedly, it's really a win-win. It's also a good idea to make alliances with some of the other minor factions, as there are many that have become more and more unhappy with the biblical god factions. The devils keep reincarnating humans from other factions, the fallen keep arrogantly doing whatever it is they're doing and heaven's exorcists keep defecting and attacking all other supernatural beings in the name of the church. 
Yasaka shakes her head sadly before continuing. Although the leaders of those factions try their best to contain their issues, each of them struggles with the Devil's faction, the Moos keep having their progressive policies stonewalled by their elders who are mostly hardcore traditionalists called the Old Satan faction. In the case of the Fallen Angel faction, their leadership is too lazy to truly get their followers to listen and many of their stronger members are battle addicts and last, but not least, the Seraph faction are probably in the most precarious position out of all the other biblical factions, as they are not only unable really control or keep an eye on the church, but they have no safe way to replenish their numbers. As for reasons beyond me, God decided that his children can't indulge in a little fun, Yasaka comments cause Sirius's A's to bug out of his head at the very idea of not ever getting laid, so each time an angel falls, either in battle or become a fallen, they become that much weaker. She finished explaining. I nod in understanding, sigh. What a fine mess everyone is in. Anyway, I would be very happy to go and meet the Carmela House representative in your place, Lady Yasaka. I then turned to Sirius and asked him, so Sirius, what do you say, you old dog? Want to come with? Sirius grins widely, happy to be included in whatever shenanigans his godson will inevitably get into, and since he decided to join the yokai faction himself, adding the house black into their ranks, sure. Besides, I've heard that this kind of vampires are supposed to be very different from our wizarding kind and more importantly, the women are supposed to be extremely beautiful. I only rolled my eyes at Sirius being a horned dog, and don't forget they're also extremely strong and deadly, you perverted mutt. I grumble as Sirius only chuckles, causing me to shake my head in exasperation. Dash. Time I skip, the next morning. Tilda Yokai Headquarters, Yasaka's Palace, Kyoto, Japan, Kanu's Poff. The next morning, found both me and Sensei back in the palace gardens, as Sensei patiently tried to teach me how to call my Gi Blade, Starlight. Sensei was currently wielding his own evolved Gi Blade, or Earth Keeper in his main hand, while trying to demonstrate to me how to hold my blade properly, OK Kanu, Sensei said after he was sure I wasn't going to stab myself with my sword, a Gi Blade's true strength comes from your heart and your willpower. He explained, but before that, you need to be able to summon starlight whenever you need it. To that end I want you to close your eyes and focus on the constant warmth you can feel coming from your chest area, which I'm sure you've already experienced yesterday when you first called Starlight to yourself. I nodded. He was right, after all, I do remember. So I immediately closed my eyes while trying to concentrate on that feeling again. It felt like I'd been searching for hours now, searching for that elusive warmth I felt yesterday. But every time I think I can feel it, it seems to slip away. Stupid warmth, I growled. Why doesn't it just sit there and wait for me to grab it? It was like a slippery eel, always slipping and sliding from my grasp. It was just as I was about to give up in frustration when I felt it. I instantly reacted by reaching out and grabbing that elusive warmth toward me. Without even opening my eyes I knew I had succeeded. But when I did open them, I noticed instantly that the key blade had begun to glow softly with a soft white light. From the corner of my eye, I could see Sensei smiling gently as watched me. As I continued to hold the warmth, I could feel the light spread toward my body as it too began to softly glow in the same soft light as my blade. I don't know where Sensei got it, but he pulled out a large mirror and placed it in front of me. Looking at myself, I couldn't help but widen my eyes in shock. As I stared in awe of my body, I couldn't help but feel ecstatic and unbelievably powerful. And that was when reality hit me. Slowly at first, the glow faded from my body and within a few seconds, it dissipated fully and I found myself falling to my knees, my lungs greedily sucking in lungfuls of air as quickly as they could manage. I didn't even notice that Sensei had taken to kneeling next to me as he gently rubbed my head. Ah, Sensei's head pats are the best, I thought dreamily. Are you okay? He asked me softly, I know from personal experience that first intentional summoning can really take a lot out of you, just be grateful it didn't happen to you in mid-battle like it did for me, ha ha ha. Sensei laughed truthfully at himself. I could view a couple of sweat drops but I politely decide to ignore his awkward and silly comment and nod with a tired smile. Why yes sensei, I said between breaths, it felt amazing. It felt so warm and caring. I gushed. Sensei just snorted, of course it did Kanu, that light comes from you. That's because that's your heart Kanu. I smiled up at him while only slightly blushing at his praise. Out of nowhere Sensei and I heard clapping coming from behind us so we both turned to look towards whoever it was, only to find out that it was my mother and Lady Ishkigil who were both smirking at us. My slight blush explodes into a full one while Sensei simply chuckles amusingly at their situation.
After a moment more of laughing at me, my mother walked toward me and picked me up for one of her bone-crushing hugs. Well done Kanu. Now let's go get some food and then you can take a bath, she tells me. I pouted a bit at her instructions, or oh, mum, I'm not tired. I can keep going. I wheedled. Mom just smiled at me. Not for today, Harry has to leave with Sirius, and besides, you still have lessons later on. She chitters. No Tilda, save me sensei. I beg him. But all sensei does is smirk at me while waving my mother on. I quickly turn to give my best puppy eyes to Lady Irshquiggle, but alas, she only giggles at my pending misfortune and turns towards sensei. You ready Harry? Lady Irshquiggle asks sensei. Sensei grins and winks at her. Of course Eris. Hopefully, a lot of things will come to light after this visit. I just hope that we aren't seen by any of the old man's followers, I honestly don't feel like being harassed today. Sensei frowned. Lady Irshkigal simply gently pats his head and smiles at him. I almost feel bad for anyone who was stupid enough to annoy Sensei. Almost, I thought, but then shrugged it off. Anyone stupid enough to pick on Sensei really wasn't worth keeping around anyway. Mr. Sirius steps out onto the garden and saddles up to Sensei's side. Well, I guess it's time to go, Harry, as we're already burning daylight. Sensei simply nods at Sirius and with a hand wave. He opens a dark corridor for both himself and Mr. Sirius, who runs and jumps in with a manic grin on his face. Sensei simply shakes his head in amusement before giving me and mother a farewell wave and walks in. A second later the corridor vanishes. Lady Irshkigal smiles at me then cheekily whispers to me let go bug your mother. She needs to stop working so much and relax right canoe. She giggles as she pulls me toward the mom's throne room. Dash. Tilda Diagon Alley, Gringotts Bank, London, England. Harry's Poff. A dark corridor suddenly appeared right in front of the only wizard bank in England, making a few wizards and witches jump in fright at the spectacle, only to gape stupidly as they watched Lord Sirius Black fall out of what they can only describe as a solid wall of shadow. Well that's always fun, Sirius says to himself aloud. The next moment the nearby witches and wizards see a young boy calmly walk out of the same wall of shadow and grin in amusement at his godfather's antics. Ha ha ha, it is fun right? I laugh, anyways let's go. I say to Sirius and with a bright smile on our faces we make our way towards Gringotts, not noticing a short man with long, straggly, ginger hair known to many of the locals, as Mundungus Fletcher, who just happened to have witnessed their entrance. That's them all right. I gotta go and contact Dumbledore. As soon as both Sirius and I walked into the main lobby proper, all of the goblins froze as they felt an abnormal amount of both fear and dread crawl up their spines. Not noticing the goblins collectively shitting bricks in their pants, I made my way towards the nearest free goblin teller, completely oblivious to the fact that with each step I take toward the poor old goblin teller who has started to tremble in abstract terror of the little demons making his way toward him. So serious, what's this about you going on a date with one of Lady Yasaka Inagami? I smirk cheekily at my godfather. Sirius coughs and splutters for a moment before answering, H how did you know? That was supposed to be a secret. He sputters. I just laugh. Sirius, everyone knows, I replied. He sighs dramatically, before going on to brag about his date night with the Inagami named Yui. And then we went to the nearby forest to run. It was rather fun. I chuckle, that sounds more like you took each other for a walk hee hee. I cackled loudly. Sirius' eyes twitch a bit, probably remembering my prank from yesterday. Quiet you. He ordered me just as we reached the teller. Hello Master Tai paused and looked confusedly toward the old goblin teller, who was clutching at his chest, while his eyes were bugging out of his head while staring fearfully at me before finally gasping and falling flat onto the teller's desk in front of him. The silence was deafening. Both Sirius and I stare in disbelief. So, Sirius, I think you might just be the first wizard to have killed a goblin with your face alone. Sirius, still in shock, sends me a side long look, before replying, I call bullshit, you know all the ladies love me, Harry. While they were trash talking to each other as their own form of dealing with shock, everyone else within the bank could only look on in shock at the seemingly nonchalant conversation that they were having. This calm was suddenly shattered when the huge solid main doors near the far wall of the bank were suddenly slammed open and an even louder cacophony of noise echoed throughout the main lobby. Within the blink of an eye, both Sirius and I found ourselves surrounded by almost an entire legion's worth of very sharp weapons pointed at us. I take a moment to look toward my godfather and say, See, I told you it was your face that scared them. I snarked at godfather, who just sent me a withering stare in reply. 
Once the Legion of Anoid Goblins settles into defensive positions, a much better armor goblin walks in. There was even a convenient tag on his chest clearly telling all that he was the manager. The larger goblin stops in front of me stares for a moment then looks toward the now clearly very dead goblin laying face down at the teller. The awkward silence drags on and just when I thought he was about to say something the silhouette of a giant black dragon appeared behind me and seemed to snarl and open its huge glowing green eyes at the now clearly terrified goblin manager. I couldn't hear the poor goblin's mind, but I could guess that his current thought process probably amounted to something like, I am going to die, I am going to die, I am going to die. I continued to lightly smile as I patiently waited for the goblin manager to stop having his mental breakdown so we could actually talk. Sirius, bless him, was totally clueless about the current hardships the goblin manager, and every other goblin in the building for that matter was currently under and had decided to speak up, which to my amazement, actually caused the goblin manager out of his nightmare-induced hallucination. Um, goblin manager, sir, in our defense we hadn't even had the chance to say anything before this goblin seemed to simply kick the bucket. Poor work ethics I say, seeing as he couldn't wait until we were finished with our business. He callously says while shrugging. I couldn't help giving my godfather my most impressive deadpan to date. But he only shrugged again in response. While Sirius and I had our little banter, the goblin manager finally managed to regain some type of composure. Cough cough. He started by clearing his throat before asking, are all right, you you are mage how can G Gringotts help you G gentlemen today? Before noticing my stare at the still probably semi-warm dead goblin next to us. Uh, don't worry about him G gentlemen. He points rudely at the very dead goblin. He was old. It was bound to happen at some point. We're just very sorry you were the ones to experience his clearly total lack of good service. I just nod patiently toward the goblin, while Sirius was still a bit confused at why the goblin seemed so nervous at the moment. I wonder if they're simply all down with something? Can goblins even get sick? Sirius' thoughts were clearly visible on his face. In an attempt to move this mess along, and to hopefully move away from the dead goblin laying next to him I ask, well, my godfather and I are here to talk to our respective vault managers, if you could send us to them or call them here, we would both be very grateful. The goblin manager nods, yes, yes. We can certainly do that for you G gentlemen, if you would simply tell me your names I can take you to your vault managers. Sirius still looks toward the goblin in confusion and suspicion, goblins are never nice to wizards. I know I've been locked away for a long time, but this is just disturbing. They're acting so politely. It's like he's terrified of something, oh well not my problem. While Sirius was having deep thoughts, I decided to speak for the both of us. I'm Harry James Potter and my companion is Lord Sirius Black. The goblin manager rapidly nods and waves at the both of them to follow him. As soon as they've both left the room, the entire legion of security goblins drop to their knees, some even begin to vomit right then and there. Common thoughts between the remaining goblins ranged from, that child was not normal, to, I will die a happy goblin if I never see that little monster again. Harry's sheer presence was enough to make hardened goblins warriors want to run for their lives, some actually looked at the still very dead goblin and cursed the lucky bastard for actually dying so quickly while they had been stuck within spitting distance of that little monster. Chapter 6, What's Yours Is Mine And What's Mine Is Still Mine. E.N. Tilda Gringotts, Management Level, Harry's Poff. As Sirius and I are led through long hallways I examine the many doors found on each side of the hall. Through the small windows on some of the doors, I can see numerous goblins hard at work, but as I neared the doors the goblins all seem to tense and seem on edge. I wonder what's wrong? Maybe they're working too hard, I thought idly as I walked past not noticing that some of the goblins I'd already passed from the view of, fainting on top of their desks while others shuddered as if they'd been exposed to something arctic. In any case, it's not my problem, I thought as I turned my gaze back towards the goblin that was guiding us. Not long after walking through a pair of large solid steel sets of gates we were led into the rather large chamber whose roof was supported by a number of huge pillars that rose so high that they faded into the darkness above our heads. At the end of this chamber, like all good chambers seemed to do, was a throne that was currently occupied by what he had to assume was the king, or head manager, of the British Gringotts. Welcome. The King Goblin started, Lord Black and Air Peevil Potter Black to my halls. I am Ragnarok, sixth of the name, King of Goblins of Britain and I ask you, why have you come to my home? I watched from the corner of my eye as my godfather bowed from the waist with his hands held straight at his sides, which I copied immediately, not because I felt any respect for the goblin, but because my godfather didn't one does not show up your father in such situations. 
please your grace, feel free to address my godson and I by our given names, otherwise we will be here all day saying air this and lord that. Sirius offers graciously. Ragnarok only nods in acceptance, not offering the same in exchange, but that's to be expected from the king. Your grace, my godson, and heir and I have only come to claim what is rightfully ours by blood and magic. We were not expecting to meet with you, your grace, simply our account managers, nor had we expected to arrive at such an awkward moment, Sirius stated calmly, but I could see the strain tighten around his eyes. Ah, yes. That was a rather poor example of our usual services, Lord Black. Our people do love to work after all, but sometimes they do push themselves a little too far. Please accept our apologies for such a showing. As compensation, all services for today will be free of charge. Ragnarok said amicably. Now, other than meeting your account managers, is there anything else you might need from the people? Your Grace, my godfather and I are currently living in Kyoto. Are there any Gringotts branches within Japan and if so, where would we be able to find them so we can avail ourselves of their services? I asked politely. Because being polite never hurts. Ragnarok slowly shook his head before answering. No, I'm afraid not Harry. We haven't been able to open a bank on Japanese soil due to the faction or factions that are in charge of that region, as they're even more reclusive than your fellow wizards and we haven't been able to contact their leadership. I was slightly surprised to find out that the goblins were even aware of other factions, which I commented on. While it's true we're now a reclusive people we still keep an eye out of the going on of the world above. It is the height of folly to ignore potential danger and we goblins are no fools, he answered with a rather cruel sharp tooth smile. We goblins have been aware of the three main factions since ancient times and have on numerous occasions in our history even been dragged into their many reckless wars. Ragnarok shook his head, so have your fellow witches and wizards and while it isn't taught in your schools, Ragnarok scoffed when he said school, I do know that the unspeakables are fully aware of the three factions, but I am unsure if the higher up within your government take the three factions seriously or not, as many either refuse to believe that there are things out there with that much power or are generally too afraid to let this information spread out to common populace out fear that the Mulborns would leave and join these factions. Not that I would blame them of course, ancestors know they'd probably do better there than with their own people, Ragnarok finished snidely. I had to agree with Ragnarok's theory. Say what you will about the Pulard agenda, I thought, but they're not totally stupid because while they might hate Mulborns, they also know that their economy, workforce, and population would collapse without them. Now, Ragnarok started to say as he got up off his throne, now that we've gotten the questions out of the way, I do believe it's time to settle what you've come here for. If you would follow me, I will lead you to where you need to go. Falling into step behind the Goblin King, while keeping a respectable distance, we will lead back out into the maze of hallways and before long were guided toward a group of offices with large golden plaques with various names printed in Black's bulb texts on them. Stopping in front of one of the doors with the simple word Black emblazoned on it, Ragnarok signaled toward the door. Ah, here is the house of Black office. Sirius nods before turning to look at me. All right Harry, it shouldn't take too long to finish what I've come to do. I'll wait for you in the lobby, as I'm sure you'll be busy catching up with your manager for a while. I sigh resignedly before smiling and nodding in agreement at my godfather before he walks into the office with a grin on his face leaving Ragnarok and I to resume our walk. Oddly enough this time he decides to walk at my side while occasionally giving me sidelong looks. We walk for maybe five more minutes before he comes to a stop, causing me to do the same. He doesn't say anything for a long moment, causing me to tilt my head in confusion as I wait for him to spit out whatever he is on his mind. Whatever it is, it's causing him to look mighty nervous, I thought puzzledly. Coughing quietly to clear his throat Ragnarok asks politely, Ah, I've been meaning to ask Air Potter, but why haven't you responded to any of our correspondence attempts over the years? I only looked at him confusedly before answering, Your Grace, I am sorry to inform you, but I have never, not once, received any mail from you, or for that matter anyone from the wizarding world, in my life. For a brief moment, the Goblin Lord's face went eerily still before he asked again, not even the summons letter we send when you reach the age of six? The look of confusion on my face must have been clearly visible because he quickly explained, Ah, so you were unaware of it then? I of course nod before explaining, I've never received any mail during my imprisonment with Dursleys. I know this for a fact because my relatives, and I use the term very loosely, Uncle Vernon and Cousin Dudley would have taken great joy in forcing me to watch them burn any and all letters addressed to me while laughing in my face as they did so. So again, no, I've never received any sort of letter from Gringotts, I wasn't even aware this bank existed until recently. 
Though my use of recently is a little looser than most as I'll probably outlive sons if I'm careful enough, so what's a century or two compared to that? Whatever I said was causing Ragnarok to sneer, but he quickly reigned in his composure when I raised an eyebrow at him. Ahem, yes well. You see Air Potter, we've been trying to contact you because your, supposed, magical guardian, one Albus Percival Welfrock Brian Dumbledore, has been constantly harassing your account manager, Gornuk. From the reports passed along to me by Gornuk, Mr. Dumbledore has been trying to not only gain access to your family's vaults but has, on numerous occasions, tried to write a betrayal contract. Of course, the old fool has been unable to proceed, thankfully, due to the fact that Lord Sirius Black has always been your actual legal guardian. My eyes narrow dangerously at what I am being told and for the briefest of moments, I'm pretty sure my eyes took on their dragonic look since I saw Ragnarok jump in fright and take a step away from me. I see your grace, then it is a very good thing that my manager has done his job and done it well. I spit out in annoyance, before signing and asking, was there anything else that that old fool tried to do? It took Ragnarok to gather his wits after the slight scare I'd seem to have given him before he answered, why yes it's been reported that he holds possession of your family's heirloom, an ancient invisibility cloak, which had been loaned to him by your further but he has since refused to return it on the grounds that he's holding it for you. Ah, so that's where death's cloak is, I thought before continuing my conversation with the Goblin King, ah, if that is all. Then it doesn't matter your grace, as that cloak is a Peevil heirloom which was passed down to the Potters, so once I claim the Peevil Lordship I will be able to summon it and its sibling items to me. Dash. Tilda Gringotts, Management Level, Ragnarok Spoff. Trying to fight off the feeling of intense dread that has been crawling up and down my spine since meeting the little monster, who was currently in the guise of a small human child. I couldn't help but feel my eyes widen in alarm as I stared at the young boy who has just stated that he was not only claiming the Potter Lordship, but also the Peevil's family as well. I thought in alarm. Two houses that are of the most ancient and the most noble rank at that. Ancestors damn it. This boy isn't normal at all. With that presence of his and ownership of two powerful houses and being the only heir of a third, he thought while rubbing his temples in an attempt to stave off the migraine he could feel building behind his eyes. Thankfully, Gornuk resisted that old goat, as the boy seems to hold a grudge towards that old whiskered wanker, with my curiosity sated, I nodded at the child before continuing to guide him to Gornuk's office. I'll let him deal with the demon child for a few hours, I thought vindictively while also trying to work out how to get the little monster to ally with the goblin nation. Tilda Gringotts, management level, Harry's Poff. As I slowly followed at the goblin king's side, I narrowed my eyes in thought. I know for a fact that the Resurrection Stone is a Horcrux, thanks to Riddle's memories, but to think that Dumbledore had the cloak. Also, I don't think my father would have ever lent it to him, so Dumbledore had most likely taken it from Potter's cottage sometime after he dumped me into Durskaban. That means he probably knows about the Hallows, but upon thinking about a moment longer, I realized that it didn't matter in the end, because soon, soon I will be getting it back, and there will be nothing he can do to stop me from claiming what is mine. It wasn't long after our little talk in the hallway that I was led to another golden door, this one with the names Potter slash Peverell boldly emblazoned on its plaque. As soon as we neared the door Ragnarok stops and gestures towards it. Right then Air Potter, this here is the Potter's, Peverell Management Office, the Goblin, Cornuke, inside will help you with all your needs. Ragnarok turns to leave before pausing and looking back while pondering something, if possible Air Potter, I would like to make a request. I looked at the leader of the Goblin Nation, a little intrigued at what he wanted before nodding for him to continue with his request, of course your grace, if it's something I can help you with I'll be glad to do it, I answered him cordially. The king looked momentarily surprised that I agreed, odd, he must have expected me to say no, I I, ahem, pardon me, Air Potter. He coughs to clear his throat, if you would allow it, I would like to be present during your meeting between you and your house manager. I raise an eyebrow at his request, idle wondering if this was a common occurrence, seeing nothing to really lose by accepting his request, but still curious as to why I nod and ask. If that is what you want your grace, I do not mind, but may I ask why? Ragnarok grins widely, giving me a healthy flash of all his sharp teeth before responding, I have a feeling that this meeting will bring about interesting things and I would like to talk to you about forming an alliance between you and the Goblin Nation. This time it was my turn to look surprised, as far as I know from both Voldemort's memories and what Sirius has told me about goblins, they usually don't like dealing with wizards and almost always try to swindle as much gold as they can from you, but so far, 
they've been quite helpful and polite, but after thinking about the king's words a moment longer, I simply decided that it really doesn't matter in the end. Coming to a decision quickly I answer the king, that's fine your grace, I don't see any reason to deny you witnessing my meeting with my family's manager, as I am sure you'll be willing to answer any questions I might have that the potter's manager wouldn't have an answer to. The king nods his acceptance before gently knocking on the golden door before gently opening the door allowing us both entrance into the rather well-appointed office then waving me to enter first before closing the door behind us both. Sitting expertly behind a desk is a rather pale-looking goblin who seemed a bit surprised to see his leech following me into his office before collecting himself and greeting us both, gg greetings m'lord, I hadn't expected to see you with their potter. The older goblin stammered. Ragnarok shook his head at the other goblin, Cornuk. I'm here simply as a guest at the moment, please pay me no mind and seat to dealing with Epotter first. With his liege's permission Gornuke turned back towards me and introduced himself, ah, yes. Mm my apologies Epotter, I was just caught off guard seeing my king with you. It is a pleasure to finally meet you, my name is Gornuke and I have the pleasure of overseeing all of your portfolios, which are rather extensive. Please, my lord and Epotter, do take a seat. Would either of you like a refreshment? coffee or something stronger? The old goblin offered politely. Taking our seats the king and I both shake our heads at the offer of refreshments. Nod and quickly take a seat. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance as well Cornuke. I've reliably informed, I gave the king a small smirk, that you've been trying to contact me for a while, I would first like to apologize for not replying, but as I have just informed his grace, I have seemed to have had no luck in receiving any mail from Gringotts, or any mail at all for the matter and as such, I have been unaware of all attempts of contact, I informed my manager. Gornuk turned toward Ragnok, who had taken the seat next to me, who simply nodded in confirmation. I see. Then it's best we talk about it as well then as there has been a series of weird and rather vexing events happening. In any case, now that you're finally here, we can finally proceed to deal with them. Is there anything else I can help you with today? He asks. Gathering my thoughts I take a breath and then respond. I have come to claim my lordship rings and initiate the process of moving my holdings to Kyoto, Japan. As of now, both the Potters and Pivwells have joined with the Yokai faction, as such we no longer wish to remain members of the British wizarding community. Both pairs of goblins' eyes almost bug out of their skull at this declaration. Doesn't that young boy know that he is not only planning to single-handedly cripple the British Ministry of Magic, both politically and financially by moving two of the richest and politically connected ancient houses but us as well? Comma thought both King and his fellow goblin in growing horror. Seeing the growing alarm on both goblins, I couldn't help but grin roguishly at Ragnarok. I of course, would be open to speaking with the yokai faction leadership to open their borders and allow the goblin nation to open a branch in Kyoto. This will of course be in exchange for that alliance you spoke about King Ragnarok, but now instead of an alliance between just your grace and myself, it will be the yokai faction as a whole, which I am sure both you and Lady Yasaka would fund to be beneficial to us all. Cornuke, who looked like he was going to have a stroke at any moment, pulls out a small hand towel and begins to clean his sweaty brow while nervously flicking his eyes between his liege lord and the little demon who has taken a decade or more off his lifespan. Ragnarok said nothing for almost ten minutes before agreeing to my suggestion, subtle threat of ruination, of course Air Potter, we of the Goblin Nation would be thankful for this chance to expand our services to our eastern friends. I nod in acceptance then towards manager Cornuke. Now that we've dealt with the political aspect of my plan, I would also like to see if my parents left a copy of their will within my vaults and to find out why said will wasn't executed. Cornuke, now mostly dry of his own sweat, nods briskly before getting up and moving over to a large filing cabinet on the far wall. Opening one of its drawers and shuffling about for a moment or two, he pulls out a folder, before placing it on his desk and flipping it open, and starts to read through what I think is an itinerary report. Ah, yes here we go. There is indeed a combined will for Mr. James Andrew Potter and his wife, Mrs. Lillian Potter. Their will had been processed a month before their deaths. <clears throat> the old goblins paused for a moment as he mumbled aloud, It seems that just following your parents' murders, one Albus Dumbledore had the will sealed using his political positions within the ministry. Only there was no explanation whatsoever as to why it was sealed. The goblin picked up another piece of paper, giving it a quick once over before making a jerky nod of his head and continuing, you're in luck Air Potter, we do appear to have a copy of your parents' will, however it can only be opened by Lord Potter, which you would have been if you had received your lordship rings three years, since you're the only surviving member of the Potter's family bloodline. As such, 
when you hadn't responded to our summons we moved to inform your magical guardian, which Mr. Dumbledore proclaimed himself to be, that we unable to contact you, to which he claimed that you were currently in hiding for your safety and he would inform you himself regarding your lordships, which even at the time, I personally never believed he would, but I was unable to go around him. Gornuk sadly shook his head while I looked down in thought. Dumbledore again, I had already suspected the old fool to be involved in this mess, but suspecting and actually having proof are two different things. There must be something within the will that he doesn't want me, or anyone, to see. Shaking my head to clear away thoughts of stabbing the old fool, repeatedly. I look away from the floor and back up toward where my account manager sat patiently before speaking, there must be something within the will that he doesn't want me, or anyone, to see. Gornick nods once more then gets up and once again walks toward the office file cabinet, opens one of its drawers and pulls out a small red box and another folder, then walks back to his desk and hands them to me before commenting, that Air Potter is the Lord's Ring, which I recommend you put on first, if it accepts you, it'll make you an adult recognized by magic and then you will be able to read your parents will, which he taps on while it sits on top of his desk, nodding in agreement. I quickly take out the Potter's family lord ring and roll it around on the palm of my hand while taking a moment to examine it for a moment. The ring appeared to be made out of gold and with the engraving of a roaring griffin that are two small rubies for eyes. As I continued to look at the ring I found myself suddenly saying, ah, while I'm here, I will also be claiming the Peevil lordship, if you would, could please get that ring as well? I ask Gornuk, who only looked surprised for a moment but nods and leaves in a hurry. At my side. I can feel Ragnarok continue to stare at me expectantly, while I just continue my inspection of my family's ring before shrugging and shoving it onto my ring finger. Immediately after I do so the ring begins to glow a faint red before I feel it connect with my magical core, it doesn't take long for it to settle and resize itself to the size of my finger. I smile at the subtle feeling the magic within the ring gives me. It feels like it's saying, welcome home. Then the ring vanishes from view, but I could still feel the connection so it must have simply turned intangible, quite a useful function honestly. I noticed that I've received a new notification, so as I waited for Gornuk to come back from the Peevil vaults with the Lord's Ring I decided to read it. Ding ding. Title has evolved, Air Lord Potter greater than Lord Potter. The holder of this title is the Lord of the most ancient and most noble house Potter. The Potter's family bloodline is rumored to be one of the oldest families of magic users still existing till the modern era. Unfortunately, any records possibly able to confirm this rumor has either been lost to time, were not recorded in the first place or purposely destroyed. The earliest recorded history of the Potter family only dates as far back to the early 12th century, to one Linfred of Stinkcombe, who was then locally known as the Potterer and was a well-known pioneering potioner credited with creating the potions, Skelgrow and Pepper Up, which are still in use till this day. The Potters are also well known for their stance against corruption and tyranny and their members have been often recorded usually at the forefront, fighting against such at every turn. Sadly, the once great family was almost extinguished during the last wizard civil war against the forces of you-know-who. Family motto, Perquiesis mobilitas te stignitatum, femper fortis, in noble and quiet dignity, we remain steadfast. Note, potions made by the title holder are now 5 to 10 percent more potent. Addendum I, the potters are well known for making and drinking their own booze. 10% to all rep gains when dealing with alcoholics. Addendum 2, holding the title of Lord makes you an adult in the eyes of Mother Magic. I nod in satisfaction and mentally close the window, just in time to watch Gornuk come in with another small box in hand. This one was black with the name Peevil inlaid in gold on it, which he handed to me when he neared. Lord Potter, I was impressed that he'd already noticed the Potter's ring being gone. I must warn you, many potters throughout the ages have tried to wear the Peevil ring to become Lord Peevil, but they have all been denied by the ring and were then punished severely by family magics or in the worst of cases, had all their magic consumed by the ring itself. Gornick warned me. Well, that wasn't alarming at all, I thought dryly myself. I look at Gornuk and nod, I see. Thank you for the warning Gornuk. However, the reason for that is because they lacked something crucial to become Lord Peevil. I inform the goblin. I then opened the little black box and took the ring out. Looking at the ring I noticed that the ring itself was made of some kind of deep black marble streaked through with veins of gold, while its sigil was golden with what appeared to be an engraved with the shape of a triangle with a circle inside followed by a line straight through of both shapes. And that is that they weren't the master of death. I said as I put on the ring ignoring the gasp of shock coming from two goblins. 
The moment the ring was fitted onto my ring finger it started to glow with a grey blackish light until it settled and just like the pot a ring had before it, resizes itself to fit on my finger then like before, it becomes intangible and vanished from view. You're the master of death. They both shouted at the same time while pointing at me. Ragnarok and Gornuk gape at me and then at each other before turning back to me while I simply grin cheekily back at them. This carries on for a good minute before they both shake their heads in resignation at the same exact moment, which I found highly amusing. Yes, that's right. Master of death in the flesh. I continue to chuckle amusingly at both goblins. I'm not surprised that they know what that title means and not just it's a legend. After all, the goblins are an old race and they have knowledge about just everything that has happened or is happening, within the wizarding world. Now before we proceed any further, I have just one more thing to do. Come. I the master of death call upon you the deathly hallows to return to whence you belong. Dash. Tilda England, Little Hangleton, Gaunt Family Shack colon Tilda. In a little abandoned shack, that has long been abandoned and has since been further ravaged by time and neglect, something unusual was occurring from within it. Shining out through the shack's windows and various cracks was a bright flash of light followed by something small that shot out the ceiling and flew off in the general direction of London and at some clip at that. Reports would later say a micrometeor hit the shack. Dash. Tilda Scotland, Scottish Highlands, Hogwarts, Headmaster's Office. Inside we see a very happy Dumbledore speaking to a thin man with a large and hooked nose. The hooked nosed man has greasy black shoulder length hair and cold black eyes. This man seems rather unhappy. In fact, some would say he was in a very bad mood. The reason for this is that useless waste of man Mundungus Fletcher had caught sight of that cur black and the brat, Potter and had came running to tell Dumbledore who had then called him away from his lab down in the dungeons and now, now he's getting dragged into going kidnappy means, rescuing the brat, because the old goat apparently was unable to call back the rest of the order, since they were all over Britain looking for said brat, Potter. Meanwhile, Dumbledore gets up from behind his desk and begins to walk towards his faithful companion, Reed, Slave, Forks. Come now Severus. We simply must catch them before they leave Gringotts. The old goat said gaily. However, unknown to him, was that his good mood was about to be ruined when his wand holster began to glow brightly, followed by one of his desk drawers. The items themselves seemed to glow ever brighter until they, in a burst of light, sound and force, shoot out the window flying in high speed destroying the desk and sending Dumbledore whirling through the air and in, Severus's opinion, some rather impressive flips against one of the nearby bookshelf. Severus and Fawkes could only gape in shock at having witnessed what had happened. Meanwhile, Dumbledore can only groan in pain as he lays within the remains of what was a very expensive bookshelf filled with very thick, heavy, and very expensive books. Dash. Tilda England, London, flying over the streets, a girl's puff. Flying high in the sky and hidden with magic we see a cute little girl with a slim body, shoulder length blonde hair, and blue eyes, who appeared to be around nine years of age and flying on top of a broom, on her head she wears an oversized blue witch's hat. This girl's name is Le Fay Pendragon and she is a member of Golden Dawn, a magic organization where she studies magic. You see, she has a talent for magic casting and so far she has mastered all kinds of spells, even the forbidden ones. However, today she's on her way to Diagon Alley to restock her potion ingredients. She's not really a fan of wanted magic users, they're so behind the times and are often times too arrogant for taste, but their magical ingredients are always top notch, so she decided to bite the bullet and put up with the magical snobs. When she had almost arrived at the alley, there was a glowing object that flew by her at a dangerously high speed which almost caused her to fall off her broom by surprising her, causing her to let out a small ape. In shock, as she holds onto her hat tightly as the object zipped past by and unleashes a very strong gust of wind. When it had passed, she quickly looked toward the flying object only to watch it fly off at speeds not even she could match. What was that? It was brimming with mana and it seems to be flying toward diagonally. Enjoying the excitement of finding such a strange mystery, she smiles brightly and decides to follow the UFO maybe I'll find adventure. Or, or even some new magical thingy, she thinks excitedly. She had no idea that she was going to witness something that would change her life forever. Dash. Tilda Gringotts, Gornuke's office, Harry's Poff. It didn't take long for three small orbs of light to come flying through the ceiling and causing a storm of dust and dirt, surprising both Ragnarok and Gornuke. The orbs stop and float for a few seconds in front of me, before then taking their original forms, and now, floating before me I see the cloak, wand, and stone. 
I quickly reach out and grab both the wand and cloak and put them into my inventory. I really don't need them per se, but they might come in handy someday. I thought to myself, and I'd rather have them sitting in my inventory than someone using them with evil intentions. Once I'd finished putting away the cloak and wand I reached out for the stone and activated one of my skills causing my eyes to glow momentarily. I can see the clearly evil and dark aura surrounding it. Now that I've confirmed that the stone is indeed a horcrux I place it onto the desk in front of me while getting up from my seat and stepping back a bit. The goblins look on confusedly at my action, but I just grin at them and reach out with my palm open and then Oath Keeper appears in a brief flash of white light and I point it at the stone. It doesn't take long for a beam of light to shoot from its tip and even shorter before the soul shard began moaning and wailing in pain and despair, of course, makes both Ragnarok and Gornuk jump up and hiss in both anger and disgust at what they see before them. After a few minutes of this, I force out a little more power and with a final wail of pain the Horcrux is finally purified and vanishes in a puff of oily smoke. I smile for a job well done and sit back down while letting Oath Keeper go and as the Keyblade starts to fall it slowly vanishes in stream of bright motes of light. While the goblins curse in as many human languages as they know, which for an international bank, is a lot, I check my newest notification. Ding ding. You have been accepted by the Pivil's Lord Ring and have collected all of the three Deathly Hallows. Title has evolved, Air Pivil greater than Lord Pivil. The holder of this title is the heir of the most ancient and the most noble house Pivil. The Pivils were an ancient family of magic users who are recorded to have died out sometime between the 12th and 14th centuries due to no male heirs able to carry on their family name. The bloodline however has been noted in several prominent other magical families, such as the Gaunts, Blacks, and Potters. It is also rumored that the three Pivil brothers, Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignatus, are believed by some to be the subjects of the wizarding legend. Their tale of the three brothers, who each possessed one item of the fabled items called, the Hallows. Some however argue that it is far more likely that the brothers were simply the creators of the fabled items if they actually exist at all. Family motto, Mors in vita servit, in life, death serves. Note, holders of this title are known for having the devil's luck which adds 5 to 20 10 percent to all luck roll chances. Addendum I, Pivils were well known for gambling, usually with their lives. 10% to all rap games when dealing with adrenaline junkies. Addendum 2, holding the title of Lord makes you an adult in the eyes of Mother Magic. While Gornuk just stared at his desk where he'd just witnessed a soul shard being vanquished, I reached over to place the stone into my inventory with its fellows. Just as I'd done that Ragnarok turns to me and just growls out, and whose twisted cursed ancestor Horcrux was that? He demands. I close my eyes before replying, Voldemort's. The crazy bastard made several of the damn things, but I have destroyed all but one now. The Goblin King once again begins to curse something fierce, though I'm not surprised at his reaction. The process to create a Horcrux is not only something beyond horrendous, it was monstrous and the Dark Lord made five of the damn things. Well six, but that one wasn't intentional and doesn't count. After several minutes of what I believe to be a rather impressive string of goblin curse words, as no two sounded the same, Ragnarok has finally calmed down enough to talk. I turn to Cornuke, who is still wearing a look of pure disgust on his face, which again, I don't blame him before asking him, Cornuke, I would like to read my parents' will now. He just picked up the folder and handed it to me. I must admit, I'm a bit nervous about reading this document, as these are my parents' last words put to paper but I pull myself together and finally open the folder, I begin to read the letter within while quickly skipping past all the legal mumbo jumbo and getting to the bequests and final personal messages. This is the last will and testament of James Andrew Potter and Lillian Potney Evans. We, James Andrew Potter and Lillian Potney Evans being of sound mind and judgment hereby make this, our last will and testament, all previous wills are null in void. First off, we name Sirius Orion Black as Harry's godfather and his legal magical guardian. If Sirius is unable to fulfill his role of guardian then we wish for the following people to care for him in this order. Remus Lupin. Frank and Alice Longbottom. Amelia Susan Bones. Secondly, if we are dead, then Peter Pettigrew has betrayed us and the order, which would explain many of the deaths the order has recently experienced. We had Peter be our secret keeper when Albus Dumbledore, the caster of the Fidelius charm on our home in Godric's Hollow, suggested that we use Peter instead and use Sirius as a decoy. Please send a copy of this will to the Ministry of Magic, Department of Magical Law Enforcement, attention Amelia Bones to ensure the woman has a solid case. 
I skipped the next section, as it was mostly diving up portions of the potter's wealth to friends and family, which weren't many on the family side of things. To our son Harry James Potter, we leave you everything we have and it's our sincerest wish that you lead not only a fulfilling life but more importantly, a happy one. We also state that under no circumstances is our son, Harry, to be placed with Lily's sister, Petunia Dursley and her husband Vernon Dursley. They're spiteful and hateful people who would never treat Harry with the love and care that he will need growing up parentless. Harry, if you're reading this, then we're no longer among the living and we're so, so, sorry for that. We deeply wish we could be with you so that we could experience all of your moments throughout your life, like the moments of triumph, and all your silly mistakes. Your first girlfriend, or friends, wink wink, dad, the moments of joy, the struggles, everything. But no, no Harry, that we love you and we will always love you. Until the sun dies out and time itself stops having any meaning. We will love you, Harry. Forever. Sincerely. James Andrew Potter. Lillian Potter Nee Evans. Witnessed. Albus Percival Welfrock Brian Dumbledore. Gritting my teeth. I handed over the will to Cornuke, who quickly read it before placing it back into the folder on his desk, while I closed my eyes to both think and to calm down. I already knew my parents loved me and it makes me happy to read their last words of care and love but it seems my suspicions were on the spot. That old fool not only sealed my parents' will but he also acted as the only witness. How he managed that, I have no idea, but if I had to guess, I'd think magic was involved, I thought with dark humor. He clearly knew that Sirius was innocent, but he let him rot in Azkaban for almost eight years, and to top off the insult to injury, the old bastard went against my parents' expressed wishes and left me with the Dursleys. The son of a bitch is almost as malicious as Voldemort himself, I thought angrily. During my contemplation, I must have let some of my power leak because as soon as I opened my eyes again, I caught sight of both Ragnarok and Gornuk hiding behind the only desk in the office with only their wide open eyes looking at me from just above the rip of the desk. Um, sorry about that, I sort of lost my temper for a moment there, due to how much Dumbledore has tried to control my life, sighing loudly I continued, in any case, I thank you both for your time and help, I say while I get up off the borrowed chair then turn and bow at the waist as a show of respect. This seemed to calm both goblins down a tad as they moved to come out of their hiding spot. Gornuk nods his head rapidly, while Ragnok, whose voice was an octave higher than before, speaks up for the both of them. Oh of course Lord Potter, it is our pleasure to help you in any way we can. Gornuk will immediately start preparing to move all Potter and Pivoil assets to Kyoto as soon as possible. We hope that once talks are done concerning our alliance with the Yokai faction, you'll consider doing business with Gringotts again. He finishes. I smile and nod at Ragnarok's offer. Of course your grace. While we're on the topic of my estate again, please also sell all properties, as I have no need for a home in this Merlin forsaken country anymore. Gornuk speaks up, oh 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 of CC Corsell Lord P. Potter. It shall be done as you have asked. I have to say that it is a sad day that two of the oldest and richest magical houses are leaving to join another faction but we of Gringotts wish you a most rewarding endeavor going forward. I smiled and was about to speak again when a younger and smaller goblin dashed through the door making us all turn toward him in puzzlement. My liege, senior manager, I have news. A Mr. Albus Dumbledore is in the lobby demanding, loudly and obnoxiously, that Lord Potter is to be brought out to him at once. Ragnar growls out in anger. How dare this jump up goat buggering wizard come barging into goblin land and make demands of us. As Ragnarok was about to say something more he suddenly fell silent when a terribly cold and dark chuckle stops everyone on the spot and slowly they turn to the cause of such a dreadfully ominous noise only to jump back in fright as they caught sight of my cold and uncaring face and even colder look in my eyes as they started to glow ominously and take on their reptilian shape. The sheer bloodlust pouring off the young lord was felt from the very depths of Gringotts all the way to its lobby far above ground causing one Albus Dumbledore to shiver as if someone had just done a jig on his grave. Meanwhile, Sirius, who had been making his way back to the lobby, stopped suddenly as he felt the now familiar oppressive feeling of his godson had begun filling the building around him. Oh, ha ha ha, what idiot pissed off Harry. He asks his escort, only to notice that they are quickly retreating deeper into their tunnels, causing him to grin in amusement and he decides to simply continue on. The goblins stuck in the room with the demon in child form only wanted to die or at the very least, pass out. Thankfully as sudden as the pressure had appeared, it had also suddenly stopped and while the goblins caught their collective breath and hid any possible stains they may or may not have made, Harry began to walk towards the lobby. Let's go see what the old fool wants.
the young goblin, who just so happened to be an intern from the American branch of Gringotts, had only one thing to say regarding what he had just experienced. That old goat is about to get wrecked. Then he went back to trying to regain his breath while both Gornuk and Ragnarok nodded tiredly in agreement. Dash. Flashback start, five minutes ago. Tilda Gringotts, main lobby, Dumbledore's Poff. After being dug out of a pile of rubble and books, Severus and I rushed toward Gringotts with the help of Forks. Unfortunately, it seems that I've worn out my welcome with the goblins and their patience with my previous visits to Badger. I mean, convince them to allow me access into the Potter's vaults, but I don't let that stop me, I idly thought while ignoring the low growls coming from the viciously little creatures. Walking toward one of the creatures at random, bring out Harry Potter. The poor boy is in serious danger while being exposed out in the open. I must take him away for safety. I ordered the goblin, who only continued to stare at me for a moment before slowly shaking his head and looking at me in pity. This reaction was not what I had expected from the goblins, sword waving and threats of bodily harm yes, pity no. Thankfully, my fellow wand waving wizards and witches within the lobby stare on with awe and respect, as they should, but the goblins are looking at me as if I was insane, which was concerning. Fortunately, it seemed that at least one of those creatures seemed to understand English as I noticed him run off to wherever I hoped Harry was or to the manager. However, a few minutes later, just when I was starting to think that the little creature had gotten lost in one of their tunnels below, I, and everyone else within the building, felt an awful pressure and bloodlust pour throughout the building. Even Severus, who was a former Death Eater and has been in the presence of Voldemort himself, seemed perturbed and was now sweating and looking paler, if that was even possible, than he's had in years. I myself can't help but tremble at the dread that shivered up my spine. Only for the pressure to disappear as quickly as it had arrived. Following a few moments after the pressure had vanished, the large security gate, found near the back of the main lobby, opened, and walking out from that gate was one serious Orion Black, wearing his trademark wolfish grin. Dash. Tilda Gringotts, main lobby, General Poff. R, serious my boy. It's good to find you in such good health, Dumbledore pompously and loudly. Sirius just raises an eyebrow at him while giving a sidelong glance towards Severus before saying, I'm afraid that I can't say that I feel the same way as you headmaster. But enough about me, what are you doing here? And with Snivellus no less, Sirius asks while Severus sneers hatefully at him, but with a quick look from Dumbledore, he seems to settle down. We've come to get young Harry, Sirius. The boy's in serious danger right here in the open. So we have to get him back to his relatives as it is the only safe place for him. Dumbledore seems to actually believe whatever tripe he's selling. But the only thing he receives is laughter from Sirius. Ha 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 ha. You actually believe that, don't you? Ha ha. Harry in danger. Ha ha ha. As if, Sirius suddenly narrows his eyes and glares at his former headmaster. The only dangerous one is you Albus. Harry doesn't need your protection and he definitely doesn't need his so-called relatives the Dursleys. Severus being his slimy self can't help but speak up. Just be quiet black and hand over the pot to brat. Sirius was about to say something but stopped and begins to madly grin as he looks behind Severus. And who is this brat you're speaking of? A cold voice asks from behind Dumbledore and Snape, causing both men to jump and whirl around, only to see a young Harry Potter standing there glaring at them both. He looks so much like his father. But those eyes are clearly lilies, is what Severus thought. But this thought only causes him to become angry and in a foolish, in hindsight, decision he reaches out to grab Harry by the scruff of his arm. Arrogant and a show-off. Just like your pathetic father. Now come along brat. I don't have a lug. Severus started to say only to start screaming out in pure agony as the boy was able to, in an amazing display of speed, grab a hold of Severus's wrist and then proceeded to crush it and his bones into so dust. Needless to say, Snape squealed like a stuck pig. Don't touch me asshole. Harry all but snarled at the man now rolling around on the floor cradling his broken wrist. Everyone watching on from within the lobby winced as Harry then proceeded to pick up and throw the potions professor out through the bank's main entrance and over the top of a young girl wearing a blue witch's hat, who could only gape at the scene of a fully grown man being manhandled and thrown bodily over her head and sent crashing onto the streets below. Dumbledore of course, took a step back at such an amazing display of inhuman strength from a nine-year-old boy. Harry, my boy. You shouldn't have done that. Severus was just concerned for your safety, Dumbledore says in a clearly fake grandfatherly way while his eyes begin to do what Harry thought was creepy as hell, twinkle. Sadly, everyone who was watching on, thought the aging Hogwarts headmaster was finally going senile. 
Harry only scowls at the headmaster. Whatever, I don't have time to deal with this nonsense. Take your pet death eater and your crazy fire chicken and leave Dumbledore. I have far more important things to do today. Come on Godfather, we have to leave to do that errand before we can go back home. Harry states before turning away from Dumbledore and walking away. Sirius nods in agreement, knowing that Harry was probably speaking about having to go to Romania to speak with one of the vampire's clans. Quickly walking to catch up to Harry, who seemed to be slowly drawing the attention of the local populace, only to duck and dodge when they heard. Stupefy, yelled Dumbledore twice in quick succession, as he brandished his wand, which to many onlookers looked suspiciously like a different wand from his usual one, as he tries to knock out both Sirius and Harry with stunning spell only to have his eye almost fall out of his head from shock when he witnesses Harry catches his spell and crushes it with his bare hand. Harry sighs deeply, before speaking to the senile old man I was going to deal with you and your pet some other time, but I might as well give you a taste for what's to come. Know this Dumbledore. I'll make you pay for abandoning me to the Dursleys, who abused and tortured me for almost eight years, for knowing that Sirius was an innocent man and then letting him rot in Azkaban. For eight years. The bystanders who had gathered around could only stare in disbelief at what they were hearing, some felt anger and others felt disgust at what the boy was accusing the headmaster of. But Harry continued to speak, and possibly worst of all, for keeping that piece of shit of a human who was the one who told the prophecy to Voldemort. He's the true reason my parents are dead. And you, you. Not only did you save him from his just prison sentence, but you gave him a job. Teaching kids no less. Sirius, who had been enjoying watching his godson release some of the pent-up trauma he'd experienced growing up, only to snarl when he heard the later half of Harry's rant before turning towards Snivellus, who was still struggling to get up onto his feet, and pulling out his wand and yelling at Severus what? You bastard! Sirius roared while casting a few choice curses at the downed man. Meanwhile, Dumbledore was starting to panic. The brat not only knew about things he shouldn't but was yelling them for everyone to hear. Harry of course wasn't done. The wizarding world claims you're some kind of leader of the light. The most powerful wizard to have lived since Merlin himself, but that's just a ruse. A ruse you use to hide the manipulating bastard you are. But you know what? That's fine. Let's just see who really is the master of light. Harry waves his arm and once more his key blade, a Earthkeeper appears in a sudden flash of light he points it right at the old fool. Le Fay, who had been watching from the top of Gringotts stairs, has stars sparkling in her eyes as she recognizes the weapon that the boy was somehow using and excitedly began to wildly clap while the rest of the crowd can only gape in awe at the sight of such a uniquely beautiful weapon. Harry's body begins to let out streams of light that seem to dance around him before yelling at Dumbledore. Get ready. Dumbledore can only look on in shock, at not only the amount of magic the boy is letting off but at the sight of such beautiful light dancing around him. Just where did the brat get a hold of such power? And what is that weapon he's holding? And most importantly, why is he feeling such dread? Chapter 7, Punting the Fool. E.N. Tilda Diagon Alley, outside Gringotts, General Poff. Harry's body begins to let out streams of light that seem to dance around him before yelling at Dumbledore. Get ready. Dumbledore couldn't help but gape in shock at Harry's display of magic. Not only was it an impressive display of mystical lights, but also the sheer amount of raw magical power the boy was casually letting out. Harry's Oath Keeper begins to glow ominously at its tip. Let's see you deal with this. Sun ray blast, stars of light shoot out from the tip of Oath Keeper and speed toward Dumbledore causing the older man to jump back with his eyes widening in shock as he raised his wand causing a shimmering shield of magic to appear in between him and Harry's, only just blocking the shooting stars, which as soon as they had hit, they detonated in small bursts of sparkling light sending the old man flying up off his feet and then crashing back onto the ground. Meanwhile, Harry, who was floating a bit off the ground, snapped his fingers and a dome of light shimmered into existence surrounding him and the older wizard and sealing them both within, outside of the dome. Forks can be seen flying frantically around it, trying to get in, he even tried to flame inside, only to end up crashing into the dome and slowly sliding down to the ground where it lay there unconscious. Dumbledore, while moaning in pain, was slowly crawling onto his hands and knees while looking up at Harry, trying to calm him down, Harry my boy, you've gone too far, all I was just trying to do was protect you. It was a shame about what happened to Sirius, but he wasn't related to you by blood and the protections your mother's sacrifice created for you wouldn't have lasted as long as they have if you had lived with him. As such I need you to continue living with the Dursleys. It's the only way to keep you safe. Harry glares at the old fool and shakes his head in pity. You think you have all the answers don't you Dumbledore? 
All that power that your various positions have given you has gone to your head causing your brain to rot. Those so-called protections are long gone and the only reason the Dursleys aren't dead, as of yet, is because they too were victims of your schemes and manipulations. Taking a deep breath Harry continues, know this Dumbledore, when Britain's magical community screams, save us. I'll look at them, and whisper no, and then they will remember why Dumbledore. Just as I blame you, they too will blame you as well. Blame you for trying to make me a martyr, a sacrifice for all their sins. A tool that you would use and then discard, and they will see, as I have seen, that you're no leader of the light, you're nothing but a monster in the skin of man. The cold look in Harry's eyes sends a shiver down Dumbledore's spine but also angers him. Dumbledore felt a surge of anger rise within him and couldn't stop himself from yelling at the child throwing a tantrum, and what would you know? You're just a brat. What I have done was for the greater good. With just a single noble sacrifice, you would have saved the wizarding world Harry. Honestly, you should just be happy that with your single insignificant death, thousands of lives would have been saved. So I say again, it's for the greater good that you simply listen to me and die honorably, boy. Dumbledore snarled. Many in the crowd, which had now surrounded the dome, could only look on in shock and growing disgust at the words coming out of their once respected leader of the light mouth. The errors who had just arrived rushed forward only to stop in their tracks in disbelief of what they had just heard come from Dumbledore's mouth. Meanwhile Le Fay could only shake her head in sadness at how far the people her ancestors had helped and protected had fallen. She wondered how her ancestor, Arthur Pendragon, the once King of England, would have reacted to this man's words. Probably by punching him through the nearest wall, she mused. Harry just continued to glare for a few moments more while reflecting on what had just been said, it hurts to know that someone just wanted me to die for their own selfish goals, that someone went to such lengths to ensure that I was weak and unable to protect myself. The day I found out about the prophecy when I absorbed Riddle's memories infuriated me, almost to the point of coughing up blood. That these two fools could become so obsessed with it boggles the mind. But now after having lived for so long and having met so many people and learned so many things, I couldn't help but feel sad that someone could plan and manipulate so many lives so callously. Geez, I really hate selfish people like you. Harry mutters while looking up toward the sky in contemplation, Dumbledore, you're nothing but a tyrant wearing a facade, one of a gentle and kind grandfatherly old man, and the worst part? Everyone within the wizarding world believes it, and since you've come to power, they've become sheep, ready to be led to the slaughter, but it doesn't matter anymore, as it's no longer my problem. As of this day, the Potters, Blacks, and the Peevils have cut ties with the wizarding British community. Today we leave this cesspool of a country to join another supernatural faction and have decided to wash our hands of this country with joy in our hearts and a pep in our step. Harry smirks. Hearing this, Dumbledore jumps up quickly with anger and indignation twisting his facial features, as a gasp of shock can be heard coming from the surrounding crowd. No. No, no no. I won't let you ruin my plans with your stupidity boy. Dumbledore knew what Harry's statement meant for the wizarding world, let alone Britain's. The loss of three prominent families was a major blow, both financially and politically, not to mention that joining another one of those hidden in human factions meant that Harry was now aware of the other powerhouses of the supernatural world, meaning even further loss of control of his tool. I can't let him leave, Dumbledore thought with growing panic and so proceeded to unleash a barrage of spells only for Harry to easily bat them away with the Earthkeeper, sending the spells flying and crashing against the dome making the public flinch at the loud gongs and explosions against it. Meanwhile Le Fay stood still with shock. The Potters and Peevils were old, old, magical families, possibly even older than her own Pendragon's family. Not to mention the loss of the Black's political power and money and now they were all leaving the wizarding world behind, just as her ancestors had done so long ago. Is this what the Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Sorcerer, Founder of the Order of the Phoenix, Supreme Mugwump of the ICW, and Chief Warlock of the Wizengum what amounts to? all of those titles and achievements and you can't even bring down a nine-year-old? How pathetic. Harry mocks with a huge shit-eating smirk growing on his face once Dumbledore had stopped slinging useless spells at him and to catch his breath from the impressive amount of magic spells he tried to hit Harry with. Not giving the old fool too much of a break, Harry raises Oath Keeper and points towards the sky. His body and keyblade begins to glow in beautiful white light once more. Let's see if you can dodge this. Faith. A pillar of light comes bursting out of Harry and begins to spread around him unleashing beams of light all over the area inside the dome, Dumbledore in a speed that's impressive for a man of his age, begins to apparat and dodge the beams but some were too fast and end up grazing him causing burns and his clothes to get damaged. 
Harry's Oath Keeper then begins to glow in a golden light and Harry vanishes in a burst of light to appear in front of Dumbledore and proceeded to hit him with a downward swing sending him flying only to get hit from behind again as Harry appears in another flash of light, this proceeded to happen, again and again, the only thing Lurfay and the public could see were flashes of light and Dumbledore being bounced around until he lands on the middle of the dome and Harry appears once again this time in the air above the old man. He spins Oath Keeper in his hand and then points downwards towards Dumbledore who was trying to get up. Holy! Multiple orbs of white light form in a circle around the tip of Oath Keeper and shoot out at the same time. The old man barely had time to apparat before the orbs hit him instead they hit the ground and unleash an explosion of light. Dash. Tilda Heaven, 7th level of heaven, God's throne. Meanwhile in a place sitting above the clouds with a bright white ceiling high overhead. Guarded by a large gate that has a white stone path and stone buildings, which appear to be floating. This is the seventh heaven, the present location of the sacred gear system, and the God of the Bible's throne, where it once was the location where the God of the Bible resided within heaven, before his death. In there we find two haranking angels staring at God's system intently, some time ago it started to react to something down in the human world, and beautiful white light can be seen periodically shine and burst from the system. One was Gabriel. A beautiful woman with curly blonde hair and a voluptuous figure, who is known as the most beautiful woman in heaven. She is a seraph and she has twelve wings growing from her back. She turns to the other seraph. Bother, what is going on with father's system? I've never seen it act like this. She was nervous and a bit scared but at the same time hopeful, this was the first time in a long her father's system seemed to look so alive and that white light is so beautiful that she can't help but admire it. Michael, whose appearance was that of an incredibly handsome looking man with long blonde hair and green eyes. He has twelve wings growing from his back, and unlike other angels whose wings are white, his wings are colored gold, symbolizing his position as the leader of the heaven faction. He wears a red robe with a gold cross on the front of his white alb. He has golden shoulder plates with a white sash and a golden halo set above his head. I don't know Gabriel. It has never done something like this before or at least not since father was alive but I will send a few angels to investigate, it seems that whatever is causing these reactions comes from London both seraphs can only continue to stare in befuddlement at God's system as it seems to look both more active and alive with light. Dash. Tilda Diagon Alley, the dome of light on the street outside of Gringotts, Harry's Poff. Dumbledore reappears and looks in fear and shock at the explosion of light before turning to look at Harry cautiously. I must admit, watching the old man dodge spells like faith and holy like that was rather impressive even though he wasn't quite fast enough, I stare at Dumbledore after my spell is finished. He was hurt and bleeding from multiple wounds. He seems to be sweating and breathing heavily too, though he looks a bit proud of himself for being able to dodge my spell, too bad for him that I am holding back by a lot. Not bad. I float down to the ground and stand there for a second, too bad you already look dead on your feet, it's about time I finish this. I don't have the time to play with you any longer and besides, I'm sure someday I will be forced to come and finish what I started today, so how about I show you and all these people a legend rank holy light spell. Let's see if you can still stand after this, leader of light. I close my eyes and light begins to shine and glow around me, I begin to chant. O oh light that rains down on heaven and earth, bring my enemies to their destined annihilation, fortune's arc. Not for the first time today the crowd, Dumbledore and Lurfay could only look on in shocked amazement at the beautiful light show and the raw amount of magic that was visible around the area Harry stood. Lurfay was definitely impressed. Amazing. There were no mathematical formulas nor any magical build-up with those spells. They were fast, very fast. This was clearly some kind of quick trigger magic on a massive scale, but the most amazing fact was that it was so carefully controlled but soon everyone had their eyes widened at the end of the chant as Dumbledore raised his wand and braced himself, he begins to cast protective spells in hopes of weathering this magical onslaught. Protego Maxima. Fianto Ori. Repello Inimicum. I see Dumbledore in a desperate move cast the strongest protection spells I know exist for wand users and overpowers them with his magic but I know that it'll turn out useless this spell always hits. It can't be blocked and can't be dodged, as soon as I finish chanting and the orb of light surrounding me bursts. I watch as Dumbledore can only look up in shock when a giant magic circle forms above us and white lighting begins to fall from it on every inch inside the dome surrounding us and his protective spells fail as soon as the spell hits the magic shield shattering it easily. Ugh! Dumbledore's scream of pain is the only thing that can be heard as everyone is temporarily blinded by the light coming out of the spell. The spell runs its course and the old fool is standing there with eyes white and wide open. 
his mouth agape in a silent scream of agony, smoke and the smell of burnt flesh can be perceived by the public and me however I wasn't done. And grant us the divine protection of thy brilliance. Harry chanted. I gently swing o Earthkeeper and a rainbow colored light bursts out of my body and blasts Dumbledore off his feet until he crashes into the dome I created, he soon falls to the ground in a heap and stays unmoving, he's not dead I can still feel his energy but he'll be feeling that for a while. I grin to myself happy to have finally had some payback at one of the main reasons for my suffering but deep down I know it's not over, I'm sure that eventually I'll be dragged into this fool's plot once again but next time there won't be any mercy, I let go of the o Earth Keeper and it vanishes in motes of white light, I snap my fingers, the dome shatters with a sound of breaking glass and begins to disappear. Tilda Lafay's puff. Those spells were incredible. And beautiful. Such a pretty light display but they were clearly far above and beyond any of the typical wand user's capabilities. I doubt even a seraph could pull magical spells like that off, at least, not anymore, Lefe loves magic and she has dedicated a lot of her life to her magical studies but she has never heard or read anything about the existence of such spells, she begins to bounce from foot to foot in excitement. Ooh I wonder where he learned those spells, gasp, what other ones does he know? Maybe. Hopefully, he'll want to teach me. Flames of determination can be seen in Lefay's eyes while she fist bumps wildly into the air, causing the crowd around her to step away from her. Tilda Harry's puff. I stare coldly towards the unconscious and heavily injured old fool, I turn toward Ragnarok who is standing in front of the gates of Gringotts having witnessed Dumbledore getting thoroughly defeated. Ragnarok, do make sure that a copy of the will gets to Madame Amelia Bones, it'll take a while for Dumbledore to recover, so she can use that time to make sure this old fool pays for his crime. Ragnarok nods and inwardly is glad that the boy considers them allies now he didn't want to mess with such a monster. Screams of pain can be heard now that silence drowns the area, everyone turns to look at the source of such screams of agony only to see an angry serious black slinging spell after spell at a crawling Severus, I walk towards them when I see the errors begin to approach Sirius and with a wave of my hands a powerful gust of wind sends them flying and crashing against the buildings around the alley. Once I was beside Sirius I could see the tears streaming down his face, my heart throbs painfully at the pain in his eyes. Sirius. It's okay, don't dirty your hands with such garbage. Sirius stops and falls to his knee crying. This bastard is the reason James and Lily are gone. If we let him go he'll just be set free with the help of Dumbledore. I gently pat him on his shoulder. I know but let me take care of H. I was cut off by arrogant and obnoxious laughter. We turn to look at the source and we see a bleeding Severus laughing mockingly at me, and Sirius he stops his laughter and glares at us. T that's right T. I can get away with anything. It's the only good thing about dealing with that old buffoon ha 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 ha. And I don't regret it. T that bastard Potter stole my lily from me. S she was mine. Mine. That's why you and him had to de-die. But no oh. Not you, you little shit. Had to not only survive B but you also somehow defeated the Dark Lord. Severus screamed aloud only to stop when he started to cough. Sirius was about to say something but then he felt Harry's power begin to increase, his eyes widened, and turned to look at Harry only to see his eyes glow he gets up in a hurry and turns towards the public. Everyone get away. Run. He begins to run and the public in a panic began to scream and get away as quickly as they can, only to see a young blonde girl wearing an oversized witch's hat raise her hand and a powerful looking barrier forms around Sirius and her, Sirius turns towards Harry only to see him take a deep breath and with a roar unleashed a torrent of flames at the down Severus who could only look in fear as the raging inferno rushes towards him in high speed. As soon as the flames hit the slimy bastard he doesn't even get a chance to scream, he was instantly cremated on the spot, everyone in the area can feel the intense heat coming out of the dragon-like flames, everyone was sweating and some were even scorched by the heat itself while the girl struggles to keep the barrier up, Sirius witnessing her struggle screams at Harry. Harry, stop. You're going to kill everyone. This snaps me from my enraged state and soon I let up my breath attack. I look at the street only to see it reduced to molten rock and ashes for Severus, there was nothing left of him. I sweat drop and the public begins to panic and run away while the girl tries to catch her breath but a look of amazement can be seen in her eyes. I breathe out heavily and hot white steam comes out of my mouth while I glare back towards where the slimy son of a bitch once was. Burn in hell bastard. Sirius runs back to Harry and whistles at the devastation brought about the street. Merlin Harry. That was so cool. I chuckle at my godfather glad that his tears are gone. Yeah but I think I overdid it a bit. Sirius barks out a laugh. 
What was what Ishkigul said to me when she and Kanu were teaching me how to play video games? Ah, there's no such thing as overkill. I stare at Sirius and can't help but laugh at Sirius's statement. Yeah, that is true. So, feeling better? He nods at me and gives me a soft smile. I smile at him and we begin to walk towards the entrance where a shocked and scared Ragnarok can be found staring at the devastation brought about the street. Thankfully the bank swords protect him, and the bank from the heat as he sees that some building were quite damaged from Lord Potter's attack. Sirius and I arrive with the Goblin King and smile at him. Well Ragnarok now that that's finished we have to leave. Thank you for your time. I bow at the waist of the Goblin King followed by Sirius. Ragnarok shakily nods. Sirius and I step back a bit and I raise one of my hands and gently wave it, opening a dark corridor. We give the old Goblin King one more grin and turn around to leave. Tilda la phase poff. He's leaving? No I have so many questions. He can't leave yet. I don't know where I would ever see him again. What should I do? What do I do? Perhaps it was her panic or the fact that she didn't have too much time to think but at that moment Le Fay's body reacted on its own and she started to run as fast as she could to catch up to Harry however Harry's ridiculously high luck stat bared his ugly mug, causing Le Fay in a moment of clumsiness to trip upon Albus Percival Welfrock Brian Dumbledore's unconscious face not only breaking his nose but also leaving a shoe sole like bruise on his face. Of course, this sent the poor girl flying at high speed screaming. Carla. Tilda Harry's poff. Sirius and I hear a cute and girlish scream making us jump and quickly turn around only for me to be tackled in the stomach by a blonde and blue missile. Ack, blood sprays from my mouth and my eyes bulge in shock from the missile. Of course, this ends up sending me and the missile crashing into Sirius who was gaping in shock. Oh of Sirius, the missile, and I get sent flying through the air and into the dark corridor which closes as soon as he goes through leaving a sweat dropping king of goblins and a groaning old fool lying on the floor who was completely forgotten for hours until Ragnar called the ministry to come pick up their garbage from the front of his bank. Dash. Tilda Romania, Carmela Territory, General Poff. An internal conflict has begun between the factions of vampires due to the Teps faction coming into the possession of a sacred gear with the power to tip the balance of power between factions. But this causes the vampire faction to compete for control of this sacred gear causing a civil war to erupt between the Teps and Carmela vampire factions. This powerful sacred gear is in the possession of Valerie Tepps, a short blonde hair and red eyes girl who is at least 15 years old. She's pushed and abused to awaken the power of her sacred gear, the Sephiroth Growl. The Tepps faction is planning to use her power to enhance their soldiers by removing the traditional weaknesses of vampires. The Tepps faction attacked the Carmela faction in an attempt to raise its power and territory. Of course the Carmela faction became disgusted by the Tepps side actions and viewed it as them spitting on their pride as vampires. However as of late the Tepps clan has begun to attack and kidnap humans in the surrounding areas around the Carmela clan's territory. This begins to cause worry among the vampire elders and such they reach out towards other factions for support. Most turn their backs on them. However, the Yokai faction accepts in exchange for an alliance. This, of course, makes the Carmela clan glad since the vampires had sensed the awakening of the Master of Death and had sensed him to be in Japan. In an open field away from any human towns and surrounded by trees we find the Carmela clan's envoy. It was in this area where Yasaku and Elman Hilda Karnstein said envoy decided she would meet with the envoy of the Yokai faction. She's been waiting patiently sitting on a blanket and reading a book under a big beach umbrella. She's is a pulled vampire and the sun and her don't mix so she's using it to create a bit of shadow. It's been a few hours but she did get forewarned that the envoy had other matters to attend to. So she doesn't mind to wait. It was only when a black pillar of what she can only describe as solidified darkness appeared that she looked up from her book only to sweat drop at the pile of limbs that came flying out of the darkness. The pillar of shadow soon disappears as she stares at the three individuals who are groaning and trembling in pain on the ground. Tilda Harry's poff. Damn it and my accursed luck stat. I sometimes wonder if the system simply enjoys putting me into these situations just for shit and giggles or if it's Ishkigal's weird sense of humor that the game is adapting to. Dash. Tilda Yasaka's palace, kitchen, General Poff. Meanwhile, in Kyoto in the palace kitchen, we see a panicking Yasaka and Kanu fighting a monster that seems to be made of both tomato soup and cheese while Ishkigal who is wearing an apron sneezes out of nowhere. Aku Tilda. The monster stops its attacks on both Kitsunes and says bless you creator and then continues to attack the mother and daughter duo. Ishkigal can only sweat drop as she can't believe what's happening. Dash. Tilda back to Hariko. Tilda. Ugh, Sirius, did you catch the numbers on the bus that just hit us? 
I moan from my position on the floor while looking up at the sky in disbelief. Meanwhile, Sirius, who was laying face down on the ground as his soul was slowly leaking out from his mouth, ah what a beautiful and warm tunnel of light. Oh, James. Oh and L. Lily too. Eh? Why do you have that bat Lily? Lily? I sit up in a hurry and quickly grab Sirius's soul before it can continue to fly away causing the soul to squeak out ick. As I proceeded to shove it back down his throat, stop walking toward the light. Mom is going to re-kill you if you die idiot. I shout at the semi-dead man. Hearing the quiet and feminine groan of pain coming from behind me, I turned around only to see a small blonde girl who had been wearing what seems to be an oversized witch's hat on the floor not that far from us. She seems to be struggling to get up. And just who are you? I ask while standing over her. The girl jumps a bit in surprise and turns her head towards me from where she's lying. I can see her blushing in embarrassment at her blunder. I, I am Lefe Pendragon, she answered, loudly. I wince at her volume but chuckle inwardly, she must be really embarrassed he he. At least now I know it wasn't an attack, she has no darkness in her heart. I only see a warm and kind light coming from within her. I get up and walk towards her and reach a hand towards her and smile. Nice to meet you, Miss Lefay. I am Harry Potter and I've got to tell you that your first impression was super effective. I say while I wink at her, making her blush as she reaches for my hand and I lift her up onto her feet. Now standing face to face, she shyly stares into my eyes while I smile back at her as the wind blows gently at our hair. Chapter 8 Chapter 8 Tilda Elman Hilda's Poff Elman Hilda Karnstein can only look in confusion as she watches these three individuals interact with each other, but her attention is soon drawn towards the young boy, something about him makes the hair at the back of her neck stand up and that aura of death and destruction is a bit overwhelming. To her he feels like a predator having his jaws at your neck and all you can do is close your eyes and wait for your end. He must be the master of death, to think that the boy who lived would be the chosen one to carry that title, fate sure is a fickle mistress. We were right to believe that he joined the yokai faction too, it really was the right move to reach out to Yasaka Sama. Unfortunately for the petty vampire she was so distracted that she didn't notice a recovered Sirius shakily get up and walk towards her with a curious look on his face, she was taken out of her thoughts and was completely caught by surprise when she was lifted by her armpits, she was so shocked that she couldn't even react and just froze. Sirius grins and lifts what he believes to be a very pretty doll Harry look, someone left this pretty doll, we should take her with us for canoe. I'm sure she would like it. Both Harry and Lefate turned their gaze towards Sirius only to gape and freeze the moment they saw Sirius standing there with a vampire in his hands, the bloody moron was presenting her like a hard-earned trophy with a grin on his face, Harry couldn't help but nervously say um, Sirius put her down. But Sirius was just too excited to notice the nervous looks that both kids were giving him and kept talking. Oh uh, ooh, we could buy some outfits for Kanu to play dress up with her. And she can have tea parties with her too Harry and Lefay can only sweat drop as they watch the vampire's left eye twitch in annoyance. Um. Mister you really should let her down. A worried Lefay speaks up making Sirius stop and grin at her. Oh? Hello there, who might you be? And please call me Sirius said a cheerful Sirius having finally noticed the young girl standing there. He recognized her as the girl who made that barrier that prevented him and her from getting extra crispy from Harry's dragon breath. I'm Lefay Pendragon nice to meet you Ms. I mean Sirius the girl corrects herself and introduces herself and Sirius was about to speak again when a soft voice cut him off. Would you kindly put me down Lord Black? Sirius jumps up in surprise and stares at the back of the doll's head slowly he turns the doll around to face her only to start sweating at the annoyed deadpan he receives from her. Harry chuckles a bit at his godfather's predicament. Sirius, that's a pure larded high class vampire you're holding there Harry grins cheekily as Sirius jumps in panic and quickly puts the vampire down, bollocks. I'm so sorry. Elman Hilda was embarrassed and she knew for a fact that if she had a pulse, she was sure she would have had an impressive red face, but she collects herself and brushes her crimson and black Victorian style dress and courtesies. It's a pleasure to meet you Lord Potter, Lord Black and Lady Pendragon of course Selman Hilda knows about the people in front of her, especially Harry James Potter the boy who lived, there wasn't anyone in Europe who haven't heard of him my name is Elman Hilda Karnstein, envoy of the Carmilla Vampire Clan. Harry and his company nod it's a pleasure Lady Karnstein, as you know I'm Harry James Potter, Lord of the Most Ancient and the Most Noble House of Potter, Peveril, and Ed Black and of course this is my godfather Sirius Orion Black Lord of the Most Ancient and Most Noble House of Black and this pretty young lady is La Fay Pendragon, please feel free to call me Harry and I'm sure Sirius and Fay Chan wouldn't mind to be addressed more casually. 
Sirius and a blushing Lefe nod and Elmenhilda smiles in agreement. Then feel free to call me Elmenhilda. I believe Yasaka Sama informed you of the situation, correct? Harry nods yes she told me of the raising conflict between vampire clans but I would like to get a more detailed report. Elmenhilda nods with a smile of course, if you can follow me I'll guide you to the Carmilla clan castle and inform you of the details. Harry and Sirius nods while Lefei looked a bit panicked but then Harry turns towards her want to come with us? I'm sure you didn't tackle me just for fun so I'm pretty sure you wanted to talk to me about something, we'll talk once Elmenhilda finishes her report, is that okay? Lefei nods rapidly while blushing causing Harry to chuckle fondly and smile at her, he begins to walk while he signals her to follow them and Lefei runs to catch up with an excited smile, it seems like she's going to go on an adventure today. Just like she wanted. Dash. Tilda Romania, Carmilla clan castle, Harry's poff. After a while of walking, we were guided towards a carriage pulled by two horses, I asked Helman Hilday about it since I was curious as to why they would still use carriages and she told me that most vampires were old fashioned since they have lived for a long time and had acquired a taste for the simpler things however that doesn't mean they don't use modern technology it's just a preference. It took about one hour to get to Carmilla Castle, it was big and very old but as we went inside we noticed that it was quite modernized, Elman Hilda informed us as we were getting a tour that the castle was home for most of the Carmilla clan who was a female oriented clan, of course, this meant that they needed a lot of space and such the castle has been expanded with space magic on the inside, of course, Elman Hilda introduced us to some of the vampire elders, they were polite since all three of us were from very old houses and at some point even had dealings with our ancestors. They were surprised when I told them of me and Sirius having left the British magical community and joined with the yokai but they understood all too well as to why, they were very aware of the Pulard agenda and the mistreatment non-humans suffer under the British magical society's prejudice. After the tour of the massive castle and the meetings with a few of the elders we were taken into Elman Hilda's room and she had us sit, while we were waiting for tea and snacks she proceeded to explain the situation in more detail. We were shocked and appalled to find out that the conflict was started by the Tep's vampire clan, as a male dominant clan they follow different traditions and rules, they liked to be cruel, merciless and keep human slaves as blood banks and even as pets, this, of course, brought the church's attention and an increase of exorcists was sent to deal with all vampires, this brought the death of many vampires causing a meeting to called and most vampire clans agreed to find a more humane method to procure blood, new laws were created and peaceful negotiations began with human governments for donations and the buying of blood and thus this became the preferred methods to acquire their sustenance, however, the Teps and a few smaller clans weren't happy for the changes but resigned themselves to follow the new laws since they lacked the power and number to oppose the other clans in favor of peaceful coexistence with humans. That is until one Valerie Tebs was found to be in the possession of a sacred gear of longinus rank, the Sephiroth Growl. It was the only reason the girl was kept alive since she's half-human and the Tebs were racist against those of half-blood. Of course the poor girl had to suffer abuse after abuse in order to awaken the full capabilities of her sacred gear but the gear itself refused to manifest. Eventually she tried to escape a few days ago along with a young half-blood friend named Gaspar Vladi but they were caught and Valerie was taken back after being badly injured, no one knows what happened to Gaspar, but it's the common belief for him to be alive since his body wasn't found and the traces of demonic energy was found around the area, leading to the belief that he was reincarnated into a devil and taken under the care of a devil house, this made my eyes narrow, Yasaka had informed me of the method created by Ajika Beelzebub one of the four Mu, in order to recover their species numbers, I wasn't a fan of this method since it seemed that many devils forced some of their so-called peerage member into reincarnating into devil but I understood the need they must have had. I close my eyes as I seep my tea. So the Teps clan plans to use this Sephiroth growl in order to get rid of their weaknesses and strengthen their army. In other words, they plan to overthrow the elders and their new laws. Elman Hilda frowns and nods. They already started to rebel, there have been skirmishes all around our territory and mass kidnapping of humans in the surrounding towns not to mention the murders, they've been acting like animals. They bring shame to the vampires. I sigh, what a mess. But I think there's something else going on. According to Elman Hilda they have been getting bolder with their attacks and they still don't have access to the Sephiroth growl, so someone must be supporting them from the shadows. But who? I open my eyes and stare at the petty vampire in front of me, she gives me a subtle nod confirming my suspicions. I see. Well Yasaka did ask me to help any way I can. Officially this is us helping an allied faction so first thing first, we rescue Valerie Tepps from them, this will be a major blow to their plans and operations, afterward we will deal with the attacks and find information on anything suspicious going on around here. 
I'm sure you and the elders are aware that the Teps clan is getting support from somewhere, we have to find who. Sirius nods with a grin and speaks up. There's a couple of contacts the Black family has here in Romania, I'll get in contact with them and see what I can find. This'll be fun. He barks out a laugh and I smile at him. La shyly raises her hand and we turn to look at her. I'll be happy to help in any way I can, in exchange I would like to make a request from you Harry Sama. I nod at her in agreement. Thank you Fei Chan, I'll be happy to grant any request for you as long as in my power to do so but we'll talk later okay? I smile at her and turn towards Elman Hilda who is softly smiling at us, her red eyes glow happily. Thank you, we didn't know what else to do things were slowly growing out of control and the last thing we want is for the church to keep sending even more exorcists to deal with us. I'm afraid to say that things would have escalated and possibly started a war, if the Teps would have gained access to Miss Valerie's sacred gear we would have suffered even more losses. I nod in understanding, if the Teps get access to the Sephiroth Gralith would make dealing with Teepees more difficult even for the church. Sirius see what you can find with those connections you mentioned, me and Fei Chan will go and rescue Miss Valerie I turn to look at Elman Hilda. Do you know where they're holding her? Elman Hilda nods yes, she was taken to Brand's castle, unfortunately, she's been locked up in the dungeon and we haven't been able to confirm her condition, she was reported to be heavily injured during her recapture. The patty vampire eyes dull in sadness as she looks down. Brand castle? You mean Dracula's castle by Brasov correct? She gives me an odd sigh. Don't worry, we'll get her out and I'll personally protect her I turn towards La Fei thanks for helping Fei Chan, and don't worry I'll protect you too. Le Fay blushes but nods resolutely yes, Valerie San doesn't deserve to be treated like that, we'll save her. I smile and pat her head gently causing her to stutter a bit. Of course, we'll rescue her, we'll start tomorrow afternoon so we'll have an advantage during the day. Everyone nods and Elman Hilda signals towards one of the maids, she has blue eyes and pearly white hair please take our guest to their prepared rooms and prepare one for Miss Le Fay. The maid bows politely and we get up to follow her and rest from the events of today. Dash. Time a skip, three hour later. Tilda Harry's guest room. The trio can be found lounging around Harry's room. Sirius is laying on the carpet in his dog form napping peacefully. La Fay and Harry are sitting on the bed, and they're about to talk about La Fay's request. Tilda Harry's puff. I smile at Sirius while watching him kick up from time to time. He must be dreaming about chasing something he he. I quietly chuckle to myself and turns my gaze towards La Fay who is also giggling at Sirius. So Fei Chan, what do you want to talk about? It's not every day someone tackles me like that. Le Fei can't help but blush at the reminder of her blunder and shyly begins to fidget with her hands I'm so sorry Harry Sama, my body just moved on his own, and then I must have stepped on some thrash left on the ground, the next thing I knew was me flying off towards you. I smile at her and nod. It's alright, it sure was an impactful first impression thought Le Fei pouts at me as I chuckle at her reaction. Quickly she composes herself and speaks up. Those spells you used, I have never seen magic of that scale. Where did you learn them? Can you teach me? And how did you have so much control over that much mana? I lean back a bit at the intense look she's giving me which she notices and jumps back a bit in realization and shyly looks at me. I sheepishly scratch the back of my head as I look at her. <laughs> Holy and Faith, our master rank light elemental spells and fortunes arc is a legend rank spell. I can teach you but my magic system is different from this world's so I'm not sure how much you'll be able to learn. Le Fay cutely tilts her head in confusion. Master? Legend rank? Another world? She seems puzzled at my words so I clarify them for her. Thanks to my goddess Ishkigal, the queen of the underworld's blessing I was able to travel to different worlds, I learned magic from all of them so they tend to use a different magic system than this world's but my blessing helps me use them by making it easy for me through a skill named perfect control, as for ranks? They go like this. First is the beginner rank which covers your classic fireballs, lightning bolts, and etc. Then after mastering those spells by the constant use of them, you unlock the intermediate rank, which covers eruptions, windstorms, ice tornadoes, and the like. Then we have master rank. These spells are the pinnacle of mastering an element and they have a wide area of attack. They also have other effects that often are more intense, as they're widespread. Of course with perfect control you can increase or decrease the power level of any spell. For example for the simple fireball spell. Without perfect control, all the spell would have mounted to is just launching a big fireball at your target, but if you have perfect control, you can freely modify the spell to your liking. 
I'll use two examples, you overcharge the fireball and condense it, then by launching it at your target, the result is a big explosion of blue flames, another example is condensing the fireball and then blasting it in a widespread motion while maintaining the flow of mana, the result of that? A shower of superheated fireballs raining down on your targets. Lefay gapes at my explanation and I don't blame her. The fact that perfect control can modify spells to this scale is both amazing and terrifying. As for legend rank spells, those can only be learned by those that have mastered both the elements and magic casting, plus having a massive amount of mana, or an overly large magical core is also necessary. These spells usually combine two or three elements together and the spells themselves can carry extra effects. For example, Fortune's Arc, is a spell that uses both light and lighting elements, also it's a spell that has a piercing and seeking effect. It can't be blocked or dodged and that's just the first part of the chant, the second not only damages your target again with a blowback effect but the light you release from it not only heals your allies completely but also buffs them. At this point, Lefei's eyes widen in further shock. T that's honestly terrifying. Usually a magic user has to build up or charge mana and perform a mathematical formula to successfully cast a spell. It helps to have a magic circle or a fox eye like my staff but your magic was almost instantaneous and you were moving around at the same time. Lefei shakes her head in disbelief. Magic users are usually weak to physical attacks that force us into close quarters but with you, that isn't the case. It's amazing and I want to learn. Please, teach me. I stare at her. She seems determined and excited to learn but I frown in contemplation. I'm not sure if I can't teach her completely. Without perfect control, she won't be able to modify the spell's sigh. What do I do? As I was thinking of a solution the game seemed to give me the answer. Ding ding. Would you like to take Lefei Pendragon as your second student? Yes, no. Your title of sensei will allow for the gamer you to pass down skills, spells, and techniques, however. You can only pass one down at a time and then you will have to wait a cool down period before you can pass down another. Skill scrolls and books can also be used on a student since the game will also affect them now. I smile at the game's notification and mentally click on the yes tab. Sure I'll take you on as my second student, I have another in Kyoto. She's the daughter of Yasaka the leader of the Yokai faction, though she's my student in both the Keyblade and other things I chuckle a bit be prepare, as my student I'll be teaching you more than magic and expect you to give it your all. It'll be tough and you will be in pain but I promise you, that you'll be the strongest magic user on this planet. Lefei stares at me for a moment but then she jumps up and fist pumps a bit. Yes, Harry Sama, I'll be the bestest student ever. I pat her head and gently take her hand and I close my eyes. Ding. Would you like to pass down the skill perfect control to student Lefei Pendragon? Yes, no. Mentally I choose yes. Meanwhile Lefei is blushing at the sudden handholding until she notices a small light emerge from her new sensei's chest and merge with her. In her mind the full knowledge of the skill perfect control gets engraved, she shakes her head and can only gaze in shock, she feels like she can do anything with her mana now, she notices that I give her a knowing smile and a nod which she excitedly returns. I spend the next few hours explaining what I was going to teach her and answering Lefei's questions. She was curious about my Keyblade Oathkeeper so I told her about me being a double wielder and having a second one, she also tried to see if she would get chosen to be a Keyblade wielder but sadly neither Oblivion nor Oathkeeper reacted to her she looked sad but I told her that either way I'll teach her everything I knew, of course, I also told her that it'll be hard to teach her since I have to go back to Kyoto and I had Kanu to teach too but Lefei just then and there decided that she was going to quit her magical organization and join the yokai faction, that way her new sensei can teach her and her fellow student more easily, after all, when will she ever have the chance to learn magic from other worlds again? The conversation and planning took most of the day until we noticed it was late at night, a maid came in and told us dinner was ready, I awoke serious with a spray of water, and he awoke with a yip and chased me down the hall trying to bite me in the ass as a happy and cheerful Lefe ran after us. After a delicious dinner, we all went to our room to sleep and rest, we have a young lady to rescue tomorrow after all. Dash. Time a skip, next morning. After a peaceful night of sleep. We got together and had breakfast early in the morning along with Elm and Hilda who decided to keep us company and eat breakfast with us, apparently, vampires can eat regular food but they don't gain any nutrition from it, they need blood to sustain themselves after all. Afterward, we went our separate ways, with Sirius who is going to meet the black family contacts, who I'm sure are more on the shady side of things, so chances are that he'll be able to get some good information.
Meanwhile Mila Fay flew towards the famous Brand Castle and landed a few miles away from it however a surprise was waiting for us there. My eyes narrow in suspension as we see too much activity outside the castle for vampires at this time of day. My eyes glow as I activate my Rinnegan and I look around at the many guards walking around, immediately I notice the demonic energy in some of them. Some even had some type of corruption and in the basement which I'm guessing is the dungeons I find a weak energy signature. It isn't moving but I believe I just found our target, Valerie. Those I believe are devils. But what about those flying about with black feathered wings? Le Fay looks around and points at some of them. Those are fallen angels Harry Sama and there seem to be stray exorcists around too. I turn my gaze at her. Fallen angels? It seems like an angel's wings turn black when they fall in this world, I see. And stray exorcist? What are those? Le Fay looks at me and proceeds to explain. Stray exorcists are excommunicated exorcists that have committed sins under the name of the church, usually they're unhinged individuals who lost themselves to bloodlust. I turn my gaze towards the guards. I see. So we have devils, fallen angels, and stray exorcists. It seems my suspicions were correct, the Teps clan has been getting support from these factions, that also explains why they have been so bold with their attacks lately. Le Fay nods. Yes but I don't believe that the factions themselves are involved in this Harry Sama, more than likely they are rogue members of both the fallen faction and members of the old Satan faction. I nod at her, in understanding, Yas Arko explained to me about the civil war between the new devils faction and the old satan faction, the old satan faction lost but they were still around and it seems that they threw their lot with the rest of the rejects. So something else is going on then? Um, let's see, there are quite a lot of them out here but they're not that strong except for two devils who are inside, probably speaking with the leader of the Teps clan. I believe Elman Hilda told me his name is Marius Teps, once his father died he took over and began this aggressive conquest. Le Fay looks a bit nervous so I pat her head gently, as I try to calm down my new student I get a new quest from the game. Ding ding. The new quest Save the Vampire Princess has been received. Objective, rescue the injured Valerie Teps and save her from losing her mind and soul from her sacred gear. Bonus Objective 1, kill both ultimate rank devils supporting the vampires. Bonus Objective 2, kill Marius Teps, leader of the Teps vampire clan. Reward, a new ally and friend. Bonus reward 1, random skill book. Bonus reward 2, random holy sword. Mentally I close the game's window and grin at Le Fate to ease her worries. I know this must be scary to you Fei Chan, but don't worry I always have backup. I get up and walk away a bit. Realize. Three white pillars of light appear and the wind picks up forcing Le Fate to hold her hat tightly against her head with one hand suddenly three beings begin to take form, Le Fate stared in awe at the beings taking form in front of her, one seems feminine and is wearing what looks like shiny green armor, the other is male and is wearing a blue and silver full armor and the last one was the strangest, it looked like a mix between a bunny and a jester. Outside the castle, all the fallen, devils and stray exorcists jump in fear at witnessing three pillars of light rays up to the sky and at the three enormous energy signatures that suddenly appeared, the devil's skin began to steam and burn from the intensity of the light while the fallen can only shiver and look fearful at such pure light. Inside the castle, two devils and one vampire jumped to their feet in panic and began to sweat uncontrollably, these are three were Kray user Eos Moduus and Shulba Beelzebub two ultimate rank devils and leaders of the old satan faction, and with them, Marius Teps, Valerie's older brother and current leader of the Teps vampire clan, these poor fools have no idea that today is their last day alive. Chapter 9, Chapter 9. Tilda Harry's Poff. I couldn't help but smile at the familiar warmth that's always present with these three holy digimon. I turn to look at them only to be suddenly hugged and slammed into something metallic, a loud clang resounds around the area. Ouch. Hello Offenerman hee hee. The one now identified as Offenerman lets go and smiles brightly at me. I turn towards the other two and nod happily at them. Seraphiman, Cherubiman it's good to see you too. They both nod and smile at me glad to see their friend, Master again. Le Fay who just was busy staring at these strange beings and wondering who and what they are, she notices that the three beings in front of her are quite large and couldn't help but be amazed at the amount of power they seem to be letting off, but then she was suddenly grabbed and hugged resulting in her forehead slamming into Offenerman's armor with a loud clang too. Oi. I and the two other members of the Holy Trio sweat drop and wince a bit and can only give Le Fay a pitying look, we all have been victims of Offenerman's hugs at some point after all. An excited Offenerman turns to me, Master. Who is this adorable little witch? I nervously chuckle at her enthusiasm. She's my new student in the magical arts, 
Her name is Lefe Pendragon, but do be gentle with her Offenerman, she isn't as tough as me yet Offenerman jumps in alarm and lifts up a dazed Lefe up to her face and turns her around while checking for any injuries until she finds a bruise on her forehead. Oh, dear. I'm sorry Offenerman gently places her forehead on Lefe's and softly says. Heal a tiny light surrounds Lefe's body and the bruise disappears. Offenerman puts Lefe down and pats her head gently. There. All better Lefe shyly smiles at Offenerman while chuckling softly it seems like these two will get along quite nicely. Lefe? She turns to me. These are three are Offenerman, Seravaman, and Cherubiman. They are beings called Digimon and they come from a digital world, consider them my familiars and friends I smile as I see Lefe turn towards the holy Digimon and happily talk to them. The holy trio seem to get along with her according to the soft smiles they're giving her. I chuckle when I see her hug Cherubimon tightly making the poor holy Digimon blush, Cherubimon has always been shy even back when it was a tiny lotman. Alright everyone. We have a bunch of devils, fallen angels, and stray exorcists to deal with, I need you three to take care of the enemies outside of the castle. I point at the castle and we can see a bunch of beings running around in alarm, since they seem to have sensed us already. You're free to go about it as you want meanwhile me and Fei Chan will go inside and take care of our targets and the vampires hiding from the sun inside, the main objective is to save a vampire princess who is kept in the dungeons, she seems to be injured so I'll have to heal her as soon as I find her so make sure there aren't any enemies left if some run away that's fine, but the important thing is that we can leave here without risking her any further, the poor girl has gone through enough. Seraphiman nods and looks at the beings surrounding the castle. Hmm how curious, I would think Fallen and Devils would hate each other, but they seem to be begrudgingly cooperating with each other instead. I nod yeah, I noticed it too. I suspect that these are units that turned traitors from their respective factions and have joined the vampires of this castle to gain their favor. I'm still unsure what their main objective is but I'm sure one of them will be stupid enough to proclaim their plans like a cliché villain but I at least can guess that their plan will center around Valerie Tepps. The aforementioned vampire princess I turn towards Lefe and she gives me a determined nod, I return the nod and turn back towards the holy trio. All right then. Let's move out. Tilda General Poff. The trio takes off at high speed reaching the castle in a few seconds but Seraphiman stops first and floats in the sky. He points his hands at a group of fallen angels flying around in front of him who are getting ready to attack with spears of light. Strike of seven stars. Seven golden orbs of light shoot off at high speed going through multiple fallen angels completely catching them by surprise that they couldn't react fast enough to dodge, some distance away the orbs explode taking down even more fallen angels, and his hands begin to glow gold as he rushes at as many fallen angels as he can reach Saint Knuckles. The fallen angels burst in flashes of light as they're being punched by Seraphim and only leaving a few black feathers floating away in the wind. Meanwhile, Cherubiman stops in front of the groups of devils who only laugh arrogantly and begin to insult him. And what are you supposed to be? A clown? Begone silly creature don't waste our time. But all Cherubiman does is smile and spread its arms wide. Heaven's judgment. Golden lightning falls from the sky striking the devils instantly turning them into piles of ash. Cherubiman flies off and continues to smite the devils with a kind smile. Often a man appears above a group of stray exorcists and raises her hand. A beautiful golden lance appears in a flash of golden light on the palm of her hand and she grabs hold of it. Some of the strays exorcists look in disbelief and begin to call her Gabriel while others were glaring at her in hate. You, you. What is this bitch doing here? Shouldn't she be hiding in heaven like the rest of her accursed siblings? Offenerman is both curious and confused at their words. They must be confusing me with some other angel from this world but that's a lot of hate I sense in their hearts. It seems like the heaven of this world isn't doing its job properly, Offenerman shakes her head in disappointment, this, of course, infuriates the stray exorcists thinking that she wasn't taking them seriously causing them to begin shooting at her with their guns in anger, only to see the bullets bounce off of her, Offenerman's only reaction was to scowl at them in disgust. She points her lance at the group and it begins to shine in bright and golden light, Eden's javelin. The last thing the exorcists see is a beam of golden light heading towards them at high speed, Offenerman then flies off and begins to take down enemy after enemy with her lance in a beautiful and deadly dance, while Seraphiman and Cherubiman follow close behind her and continue taking down enemies on their sides. Tilda Harry's Poff As this is all going on, Lefay and I are walking calmly towards the castle gates, poor Lefay can only gape at the massacre she's witnessing, amazing. They're so easily going through all of them and they make it look so easy. Harry Sensei said that they come from another world a digital one. I wonder if I can get one as a familiar? 
She winced when she hears a few devils scream in agony as they were lit up like Christmas lights by Seraphiman's punches and Cherubiman's golden lightning, but suddenly she begins to panic when she notices a few guards rush towards them, only for her sensei to blast them with energy beams completely vaporizing them on the spot. W what was that? She asks curiously and surprised. I turn my gaze at her. That was a simple kid blast, it's something that I'll be teaching you to use as well as magic I don't want you to rely only on magic. Um you know what? Let's teach you some spells and variations I smile at the shine her eyes give off okay now forget everything you know about magic casting, for now, the skill perfect control will take care of everything for you. She nods with determination glowing on her face. Okay first create a simple mana orb. As I explain I absently blast a few devils with another kid blast that tried to sneak up from behind us as I look at Lefei trying to create an orb of Pumana. Lefei closes her eyes and cups her hands in concentration but surprisingly, her mana quickly moves and flows to create an orb between her hands, she opens her eyes and stares at the mana orb in amazement. This is unreal. My mana moved on its own, almost like it already knew what to do, her thoughts get cut off by a light chuckle. Did it surprise you? I see her nod with her eyes wide open in shock, I smile at her. It was easy for you because you already have experience as a magic user, your mana already knows what to do, you just needed a focus to support and maintain the flow of your mana, perfect control is perfect for that, now try to ignite it, I'm pretty sure you have already used fire magic before and even used a fireball spell, so your mana already knows what to do, you just need to have the intent to do it without magic circles or calculations. I see her nod in understanding and take a big breath, she concentrates on igniting the orb only to jump in surprise when the orb immediately ignites causing her to flail her hands around in a bit of panic accidentally launching the fireball into the air. We both follow it as it flies through the air, until it lands on a fallen angel's head, coincidentally that same fallen angel was already on his way to rush us when the fireball explodes on contact bathing the fallen angel in flames and causing him to fall from the sky screaming until he crashes onto the ground and stops moving, he just lays there unmoving being slowly consumed by the magical flames, we both sweat drop at the accidental cremation. Um, good job. I give her a thumbs up causing her to fidget embarrassingly and blush a bit. I begin to chuckle softly at her ok now do the same thing again, just this time don't panic and definitely do not launch it yet. I grin when she pouts at me but quick enough she creates another fireball. Alright now for the first variation, focus your mana into a steady flow and feed it to the fireball, focus on the intent to compress as much fire and heat as you can. I see her stare at the orb in focus and soon the fireball begins to compress and swirl into itself intensifying the flames and heat coming off of it until the fireball turns blue. Perfect. Now point it at the gates and launch it. Call out the name of the spell, Firebolt that should act as a trigger for it to launch. Lefe stares at the gate in concentration and plants her feet on the ground firmly. Firebolt. The blue fireball shoots out at high speed and crashes against the castle gates exploding on contact, a loud boom can be heard and a massive explosion of blue flames takes over a quarter of the castle destroying it and a few vampires waiting behind the gates to jump us the intruders. Needless to say, those vampires didn't even have time to scream before they were completely incinerated. Nervously I scratch my cheek hee hee, good thing Valerie is down in the basement. Probably scared the vampires out their capes though. Lefe gapes at the destruction she brought about with such a simple spell, she looks down at her hands in disbelief. That hardly took any mana. And it was on the same power scale of an ultimate level devil to think that it was just a variation of a beginner rank spell. I wonder how much more powerful the legend rank spells are? The one Harry Sensei used on Dumbledore was heavily controlled. She turns towards her Sensei who I smiling proudly at her. Great job. Now, how about we try a few different elements and variations, we can use those vampires as target practice I point at the little army of bloodsuckers coming out of the castle wearing cloaks and hoodies who stop their charge and sweat drop at my declaration, Lefe begins to jump from foot to foot while fist pumping excitedly causing the vampires to nervously step back in fear at the enthusiasm shining brightly on her eyes. Yes sensei. We continue our walk while I explain and teach Lefe the other beginner rank elemental spells, the slaughter brought about by the tiny and cute little which would become a legend spoken about by vampires through generations. Dash. Tilda Brand Castle, Throne Room, General Poff. Inside Brand Castle, 
the famous home of Dracula Teps, the vampire lord we find his heir and current lord Marius Teps along with two high-class devils, Kreuzeri Osmodus and Shulba Beelzebub these three individuals were in the process of making plans against the other vampire clans in hopes of overthrowing them and gaining control of their territories. But the two devils? They had more sinister plans, they belonged to a terrorist organization named the Chaos Brigade and the Old Satan Faction, they hoped to gain access to the Sephiroth Growl by helping the Teps clan, their plan consists of increasing the Chaos Brigade's power and army by using this sacred gear to get rid of their weaknesses. The leader of the old Satan faction Rise Vem Liv and Lucifer the son of the original Mil Lucifer also has plans to use the Sephiroth Growl to resurrect evil dragons and who knows what else he has plans for such powerful sacred gear. However, today these plans will be completely destroyed by Harry Potter. As these three plot and laugh arrogantly at the fate of their enemies, the castle begins to shake. Explosions can be heard outside and the sounds of battle consume the silence of the throne room, the three look outside the windows only to begin to sweat when they see a giant golden winged angel punch a fallen angel with light, the three jump up from their seats and gape. Michael? But how? And what's with that ridiculous amount of power? Shulba Beelzebub turns towards Marius and Kreuzeri in shock. We plan for the church to send exorcists at some point, not for the leader of heaven's faction to come himself. Kreuzeri? We're leaving. We can't have the angels finding out about us yet. Both devils try to teleport via magic circle but it shatters before it can even finish forming. What? Kreuzeri -E looks in anger and shock as he keeps trying to teleport. Shulba, something is cutting off our connection to our magic circle. Marius is sweating profusely he can still hear the explosions going off and see the flashes of light along with the screams of pain coming from both inside and outside of the castle and he begins to panic. Just what's going? Who would dare to attack us? And why would the Seraph Michael involve himself? Did the church find out about the Sephiroth growl? But suddenly a soft chuckle forces them to freeze and turn towards the entrance to the throne room only to jump in fright when they see two bright reptilian eyes glowing in the dark. Tilda Harry's Poff. Look Fei Chan two devils and a vampire, I wonder what devils would want with a vampire lord? Le Fei nods at me, yes, it is unusual for them to work together. Usually devils, specifically purer bloods don't work with other races, they mostly just treat others with disgust. I stare at both devils, I see. So you two must be the reason the Teps clan has been feeling bold enough to attack as of late and those devils, fallen angels, and stray exorcists must also work with you. Shulba and Kreuzeri -E begin to growl in frustration. This boy, what is he? The amount of energy he's letting off is off the charts. And he has managed to figure out that we're supporting the Teps clans. Shulba turns his nervous gaze towards Kreuzeri -E and hopes this idiot doesn't provoke this monster. Meanwhile, Marius begins to shake and pale even more which for a vampire that's mighty impressive. No. 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 This boy can't be the master of death. This feeling. And that energy exclamation mark dot 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 how? Huh? Is he here? Did the Carmela clan call him? Fear begins to overtake him and in an act of defiance, he roars and rushes at me at high speed. I grin at Marius's reaction to my presence and I prepare to punch his head off but a wind dome spreads around me and stops him cold as he crashes into it. Gale. Burst. And the dome does just that. It bursts and blasts Marius back sending him crashing against his throne. I turn to La Fay who has her open palm pointing at the downed vampire. I chuckle and smile at her, I am genuinely impressed with how fast she learns any magic spell I teach her, I nod at her and she smiles she raises her open hands and crosses them above her head, light begins to gather in her palms, starlight, little orbs of light begin to dance around her and then they shoot off towards Marius who was just about to get up but the orbs of light crash against him and the little orbs consume him in bright explosions, the two devils jump back as soon as the mere shine of the light orbs begins to burn their skin. Ah. The screams of pain are the last thing that is heard from Marius before he turns to ash. I pat Le Fay on her head gently. Good job Fei Chan, you really have a talent for magic but leave these two to me. You go a find Valerie I already showed you where to go. These devils seem to want to use her too, that's why they're helping the Teps clan. Le Fay nods and takes off running. The devils, of course, try to stop her by rushing at her but I appeared in front of them and blast them back with a wave of my hand. They recover quickly by spreading their bat-like wings and glare at me. Kreuzeri -E grows even more frustrated. TCH. Get out of our way human. And maybe we'll grant you a quick dear -ug. 
In a blur of speed, I appear in front of him and grab hold of his face and I begin to squeeze tightly causing the devil to scream and throw punches and kicks at me in an attempt to make me let go of him. You're the type to arrogantly talk too much huh? I hate people like that. I glare at the struggling devil in my grasp and suddenly he burst into white flames causing him to scream in pure agony until he stops and I let go of him. I watch him fall to the ground slowly and stared coldly as he turns to ash before he even hits the ground. Shulbe can only stare in shock and fear, that was holy fire. Only gods are supposed to be able to wield it in that speed. I didn't even see him move. His thoughts are interrupted by the monster in front of him. So. Mind telling me the name of your group? And what you were planning to do with Valerie and her sacred gear? All of these different supernatural races just don't ally with each other for no reason. I glare at the devil who seems to be struggling to keep it together however in an act of cowardice he takes off flying as fast as he can towards an open window. in response, I point my hand at him, drain. Shulba Beelzebub can only let out a grunt of pain when he feels all of his stamina and magic leave him causing him to stop his flight and fall until he crashes into a wall, he notices an orb of energy leave his chest and fly off towards the monster who seemed to absorb it, he slowly slides down to the ground. He lays there breathing heavily as he hears the soft footsteps of his enemy slowly approach him. You're not very smart are you? I mock the devil on the ground as I see him struggle to get up but he seems to give up and just lays there growling and glowering at me. You might as well finish me off. But know this the cow's brigade will have your head for this. I chuckle at this idiot, he just told me the name of his organization. Okay, Shulba's eyes widen in shock when I raise an open hand at him and then shower him with holy fire, he doesn't even have time to scream before he becomes another pile of ash in the room. I shake my head at the sheer stupidity of this individual sigh. Cow's brigade huh? They sound like a pain, I'll make sure to let Yasaka and Elman Hilda know, they might become a bigger problem later. I turn when I hear the rushed steps of Lefei and see her come into the throne room with an unconscious Valerie floating behind her. Sensei. She's badly hurt. Please you have to help her I run towards Lefei while she gently lays down the poor vampire onto the ground, I kneel beside her taking a look at her. She has broken bones and multiple lacerations on her arms and her legs, her clothes are in tatters and her body and face have bruises all over its eye. What did these bastards do to you? Gently I place a hand on her cheek, it seems that my warmth wakes her since two ruby colored eyes look up at me, I give her a smile. Don't worry, you're safe nothing will ever hurt you again. I promise she stares at me for what seems a long time but eventually she tears up and nods, softly I caress her cheek and I spy Paula fate tear up too, softly I chuckle and smile at her. I close my eyes and start to chant. Arise, O oh light of life. Healing circle. A shining orb appears over Valerie, refracting a circle of light onto the ground, the light begins to gradually heal all of Valerie's wounds until they're gone, Luffy eyes shine in excitement at the new spell. I chuckle again at Lefei's expression. That's an intermediate rank healing spell and yes I plan to teach it to you Lefei looks sheepish but still gives me a bright smile. A soft voice catches our attention. Um. T thank you. I look at Valerie who seems to regain her strength and wits. Gently I help her slowly get up. You're welcome. How are you feeling? Anything hurts? I question her. Just to make sure she's okay. She inspects herself and touches where she knew she had cuts and bruises but she doesn't feel any pain. No nothing hurts. I feel better than I have in a long time. She smiles and seems to be in high spirits which is good all things considered. Good. We were sent by the Kamala clan to take care of the Teps clan and rescue you, unfortunately, I decided to pretty much kill anyone in this castle, it seemed to me like they were planning something big with you and I thought it would be best to stop it now. She looks down sadly for a bit but nods to herself, she knew deep down that this was the best choice. Did Lady Elman Hilda send you? I nod. At her that's right. She was the one to contact the yokai faction for help which in turn sent me to help. Suddenly were interrupted when the holy trio fly into the throne room through one of the windows. Oh, are you guys done? They were about to respond when Trubiman grunted in surprise, we all turned towards him only to sweat drop when we spot Valerie hugging his left side tightly. He's so cute exclamation mark tilde and soft too. It seems like Valerie has a soft spot for cute things I was going to speak but found myself interrupted again by another grunt from Cherubiman. I turn only to sweat drop once again when I spot Lefei hugging Cherubiman's right side. He 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 I couldn't help myself sensei. She's the best right? Cherubiman looks like she was about done with life if her deadpan was any indication. I couldn't help but laugh at her predicament only to be followed by Seraphiman and Offenaman. 
Okay how about we get out here? I told them once we were done laughing. The holy trio nodded and informed me that a few fallen angels and vampires got away but I told them that, that was fine our main objective was Valerie after all, afterward they vanish in bursts of light, Valerie and Love vape out but I promise to summon Trebimon again for snuggles immediately cheering them up, we walk back outside and Valerie seems curious about the devastation inside the castle, dead vampires everywhere and what seems to be an assortment of elemental damage done to the surrounding area, she was surprised when I told her that Love was the one to cause such devastation. Once outside we walked a bit away from the castle and I turned towards it, Le Fay looks at me in curiosity. I'm just going to make a statement towards any other vampire clan or faction that wishes to endanger our allies and show you another legend rank spell. I pat her head as she basically begins to vibrate in excitement, Valerie looks at me curiously while I point my open hand at the castle. Oh countless particles that wander the very heavens, rain down and glorify the land. Meteor Storm. Both Valerie and Le Fay stare at the castle waiting for the spell to do anything only to gape when meteors literally begin to fall from the sky and crash against the castle destroying it completely and shaking the very earth at the collision. Of course, this is felt all around the world and the supernatural faction began to scan in a panic for the cause of such power and destruction. Meanwhile, I open a dark corridor and gently push the girls into it. As soon as we go through it and the corridor closes and the explosion consumes the location where we were standing in. Chapter 10 Chapter 10. A day has passed since the rescue of one Valerie Tepps, after a good night's rest she was mostly recovered from her ordeal and Harry along with Valerie and Lurfay took off to buy some clothes for their use, with the use of the dark corridor Harry was dragged all over the world for clothes, it seems both Valerie and Lurfay really did have a soft spot for cute things since Valerie picked a black hoodie with cat ears to wear she liked so much that she took another one in white for Elm and Hilda too, Lurfay, of course picked a cute light blue school uniform she fell in love with, along a tan jacket, though he didn't mind all the cute stuff too much, he even picked a few things for Kanu, Yasaka, and Irshquigal, along for some cool things for his dog Farta. Along the way Valerie told him about her life and about her dear friend Gasper who Harry promised to look for, earning him a bright smile from Valerie and in turn Harry told them about some of his adventures in other worlds and the many people he met. Eventually Valerie asked Harry to take her as a student too, she had heard from Le Fay wonderful things about Harry and she wanted to grow strong so no one could take advantage of her sacred gear something Harry can relate to and thus Valerie became Harry's third student however she asked to specialize in gun mastery since she was a fan of first person shooters games they played at two arcade during their shopping spree, and wanted to learn how to use firearms. Of course Harry agreed however he told her he didn't know how to use a gun but told her he would teach her how to use elemental bullets, he was so fond of using these types of attacks with his keyblade so it was something he would be able to teach her among some other things. He was also pretty sure he had a couple of magic guns somewhere in his inventory that she could use. Eventually, they came back to Carmilla Castle where they met an excited Sirius in his animagus form who jumped on Harry and started to frantically lick his face causing Valerie to giggle at the scene. Eventually, Sirius calmed down after Harry proceeded to flick tiny fireballs at him and he gave his report about the information he managed to gather with his contacts, not only confirming the name of the organization that supported the Teps clan as the Chaos Brigade but also confirmed that a lot of money was being moved around, especially to acquire rare ingredients and magical objects, amongst the most pricey objects he found were Phoenix Tears and information on the Excalibur Blades, this made Le Fay jump in panic and immediately contacted her family to let them know and also to inform them of her leaving her organization Golden Dawn and being under the tutelage of Harry Potter she also let them know of her joining the Yokai faction so she could stay close to her new sensei, something she will later find out did not go well with her brother, however, her daddy and mommy seemed oddly happy about her decision. And speaking about Excalibur Blades, it came as a surprise when Harry checked the rewards he got for clearing the Save the Vampire Princess quest he received. One was the Holy Sword Clarent, this surprised him and he immediately checked it with Observe. Clarent, Fate's Day Night Series Version. The Radiant and Brilliant Royal Sword. Originally stored away by King Arthur in the Armory of Camelot. Described as more dazzling than any silver, it is an ornate, sparkling white silver sword adorned with splendid decorations acting as a symbol of kingship denoting the right of succession of the throne. It is a treasured sword that has worth equal to, if not, exceeding Caliburn, that amplifies the authority of the king, the king's royal aura. In one possible future this beautiful sword was stolen and used by Mordred Pendragon resulting in the corruption of its once beautiful light becoming a demonic holy sword, however, this version is one that was never touched by Mordred and thus remained untainted. 
as Harry read the information about the sword and confirming that it was indeed powerful decided to chuck it towards Le Fei who struggled to catch it and said that's yours now Fei Chan. And I'll be teaching you how to wield it, so swordsmanship lessons will be added to the training regime. Paul Le Fei was left gaping at the powerful and beautiful holy blade she was holding which in return shrank and became thinner taking on a rapier-like form making it easier for Le Fei to wield and also confirming her as its chosen wielder. The second reward was unique too, a skill orb with a skill summoning, which would allow the user to summon elemental spirits to help in battle but he put it in his inventory since he already has his Digimon friends but maybe he'll find someone else to use it. Another surprise was Remus Lupin sending Sirius an owl mail, apparently, Sirius sent an owl mail while he was looking for information and demanded Remus to give a good reason for not looking out for Harry, it wasn't a surprise when the response was that Dumbledore refused to tell him where he was and that he spent all these years globetrotting in hopes of getting a hint of where Harry was but no matter how much he looked he couldn't find out anything, no one knew where he was or, and refused to tell him under orders of Dumbledore, this made Harry and Sirius happy. It was good to know that their furry afflicted friend was on their side and happily they sent him another owl mail to tell him to go to Kyoto, Japan and wait for them there, they also informed him that they had left the British magical community and joined the yokai faction something they were sure would greatly surprise him. The day passed with Harry and friends joking and playing around to the amusement of the vampire maids and Elmon Hilda who was doubly happy to be able to see Valerie smile after being abused and hurt for so long, she smiled and teared up a bit at the scene of Valerie giggling at Harry hitting Sirius with a stream of water after he had turned Harry's hair bright pink. The group was completely unaware of the panic Harry caused to the supernatural world or rather they really didn't care. Dash. Time skip, next day. Till the seventh heaven, God's throne. Four angels were having a meeting while keeping an eye on God's system, these four were the archangels and leaders of heaven and the church Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Aeryl four powerful seraphs, these four are in charge of the everyday maintenance of the system, political and research needs of said faction. Today they called a meeting to speak of current events and happenings along with the mysterious activity from God's system. Gabriel was the most concerned and hopeful as it seems like something is causing her father's precious system to actively respond to something happening in the human world, meanwhile, Raphael sent a few angels to investigate, according to the reports they've received from said angels that were sent to investigate the surge of holy energy, they found nothing but small traces of that strange holy energy, along with a heavily injured old man who was promptly ignored in favor of investigating further. They spent most of the day questioning a few of the magic users found around, all they found out were rumors of a boy who lived who abandoned his people and used light to bring down an evil and foolish old man this information confused them all but they decided to leave it at that and go back to heaven to report. Michael was mostly concerned because his connection to his father's system was deteriorating and he didn't know why, but just now Raphael and Earl reported another surge of holy energy, this time over Romania on vampire territory and the use of holy fire something that only his father and a few other sun gods were only able to use. Of course, they sent angels to investigate but all they found was a giant crater and three lingering holy signatures. Michael can only rub his brow in stress. What is happening? All of this doesn't make any sense and what was that holy energy? It almost overwhelmed our senses, even further didn't let off this much holy energy, Earl spoke up bringing Michael out of his thoughts. What are we going to do about this Michael? The devils and fallen might take this as an aggressive act from us and use it as an excuse for war. Michael stares at Earl in concern. Earl is right I have to get in touch with Azazel and Surzix, and let them know that heaven and the church weren't involved in this, hopefully, they know more about what's going on. Dash. Tilda Underworld, Grigory Headquarters. Azazel for the first time in a long time has concern vividly showing on his face. Last night a bunch of hysterical and heavily injured fallen angels returned to headquarters. Of course, they tried to lie about why and where they were attacked but Azazel and the others executives were already aware they were traitors. These fallen angels were interrogated and executed on the spot for risking war with the other factions but the most concerning thing about all of this is the information procured from the traitors. Three holy beings of massive power came down on them and basically destroyed them and two of these beings had similarities with both Gabriel and Michael. However, Azazel knows that those two wouldn't risk a conflict like this and that their power would reach that level, not since God's death that is. Azazel is sitting down by himself in his office thinking about the information he received and the report of the constant surges of power. Sigh. According to prior reports the Teps clan was rebelling against the other vampire clans causing a civil war, however, the Teps were obliterated in a single day along with an army of fallen devils, and who knows what else. 
Did the Carmela clan call for assistance from another faction? But who? And who would have such power? I'm going to have to let Michael and Serzix know about all this and about this group that seems to have formed right under our noses. As Azel was completely unaware that Kokabil another executive of Grigri was part of this terrorist group and secretly passed down any information they were able to get about the event. Dash. Tilda Underworld, Gremory Mansion. Ajika Beelzebub and Serzix Lucifer were having a meeting in Serzix's office. A stoic Grafia Lucifer nay Lucifer just standing beside her husband listening to the report Ajika is giving to her husband in concern. Ajika looks intently towards Serzix. Two days ago a massive signature of holy energy practically blew up our sensors and sent everyone in the research facility in a panic, but we were able to find that it originated from somewhere in London, we suspect it came from one of those hidden magical communities. Ajika closes his eyes and takes a big breath. However that isn't the end of it. Three more holy signatures were picked up by our sensors a day after, this time in Romania. Serzix they were massive, and they seem to have had a fight with a vampire clan. Serzix closes his eyes in worry. Do we know who they are? Was Heaven involved? Ajika slightly shook his head. No we don't know who it was and I don't believe Heaven is involved. They wouldn't risk war by doing something like this but that's not the most concerning thing. Pularded devils were killed. Serzix and Grafia's eyes widen in shock. What? Serzix stands up while slamming his hands on his desk. What were devils doing there? Who and why? Ajika stares at Serzix not surprised by his outburst. We don't know. The only thing we found out is that most of those devils belong to the old Satan faction. Among the ones killed we suspect Shulba Beelzebub and Kray Usuri Osmodus were in that list. Their energy signature was found in the area which was completely destroyed. Only a giant crater was found. Serzix sits back down and gapes at this information. Shulba and Kray Usuri are dead. They were ultimate class devils who would have the power to take them down? I'll have to meet with Azazel and Michael. We have to make sure this doesn't escalate into war. Dash. Tilda Cow's Brigade Headquarters, Unknown Location. Rise them live and Lucifer was infuriated. Not only are two of his generals dead but the Cow's Brigade's army took a giant hit. And to make things worse he lost access to the Sephiroth Growl. Suddenly a cold and emotionless voice frightens him out of his thoughts. Why did we lose so many soldiers devil? Rise them turns around in fright and shakily answers the question of this massively powerful being. Lady O Office. We don't know for sure but according to the few surviving members and our spy in the Grigri they were attacked by three holy beings, two are described to have a likeness to the Seraphs Gabriel and Michael. Office who is a petite black haired girl with emotionless grey eyes and elvish like ears narrows her eyes at the foolish devil in front of her. Those Seraphs wouldn't dare to attack devils or fallen. They wouldn't risk war, find out what happened and who did it. With that said she vanishes leaving a sweating rise of him. Damn stupid lizard. You'll get yours someday. He growls and disappears by a magic circle. He had other plans which now have to be changed. Damn whoever decided to stick there knows where it doesn't belong. Dash. Tilda London, St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. It's been almost three days since Alba Stumbledore's beat down and just this morning he regained consciousness. As he lay there in that lonely hospital room his mind raced as he thought back on everything that happened that day. How did that boy get so powerful? I know he was being starved and beaten constantly. He shouldn't be able to move like he did and he certainly didn't have that amount of magic he used last time I checked. I made sure to always monitor him and Arabella didn't mention anything weird happening to him. Just how did all of this happen? Poor Severus is dead. How could Harry have done that? And that double be damn Rita Skeeter. She practically destroyed my image on that bloody newspaper again. The old headmaster was in pain and frustrated, the healers weren't sure how to heal the injuries he received from Harry's impressive spells, and just now to make things worse he received an owl mail informing him he had lost all his titles and political positions, the only thing he was allowed to keep was being headmaster of Hogwarts and that was because he was the only qualified for the position at the moment, the backlash from his battle with the boy and his reckless words was enormous and it seems like both his political and public image took a huge hit. He was taken out of his thoughts by his healer coming in to check on him. Good afternoon Mr. Dumbledore, I regret to inform you that we still can't find a cause for your injuries not responding to any of our healing methods, we're still investigating and we have requested the unspeakables to research possible solutions. Dumbledore didn't know what to say, he wasn't sure what kind of magic that blasted boy used on him, however, a familiar voice spoke up. There won't be any need for that master healer. Both men turned towards the doorway and see Madame Amelia Bones standing there with a glare and the old man just knew his day was about to get worse. 
I already know the reason why those wounds won't heal so easily. The healer stared curiously at the head of the ERA department. You do? Could you inform me? I'm afraid that we have been stumped with this for quite a while. Amelia only took in a big breath and closed her eyes. The type of magic young Harry Potter used was that of holy magic, a variant of the light element, it is mostly used by gods and angels. That particular type of magic has a peculiar quirk, something I'm sure you already are aware of headmaster. Of course, Dumbledore was already aware of what that meant for him but only chose to glare at Madame Bones who only gave him a grin in return, she enjoyed torturing the old man quite a bit, and she turned her gaze towards the healer. That type of magic is holy by nature and if the person is pure of heart and genuinely good the magic spell wouldn't have any effect. Only those with darkness and sin in their heart could be this affected to it. Unfortunately, this means that the headmaster is going to have to heal the slow mull way she points at a still glaring Dumbledore. You and most of the purer bloods along with the ministry might be happy ignoring the rest of the supernatural world but most of us are aware of them and some old families like the Bones have had dealings with other supernatural beings. You messed up headmaster not only did your meddling cause three most ancient and the most noble houses to leave our community but you also attempted line theft and you're even guilty of child abuse and endangerment, among other things the goblins were very forthcoming with evidence. Luckily for you your name still had just enough pull that you didn't get any jail time and trust me I tried, however, the goblins were overjoyed to empty any personal vaults under your name and transfer any contents to the Potter vaults you know for annoying them for too long and attempting to fool them, TSK TSK headmaster the grin on Madame Bones widened even further. Albus was struggling to keep from raging, this blasted boy has practically destroyed everything he worked so hard to obtain. Madame Bones left the foolish old man to seeth in anger with a happy smile on her face, she might have not been able to imprison the meddling old fool but she enjoyed him being humbled quite thoroughly. Dash. Time skip, one week. Tilda Romania, Carmela Castle. Harry can be found sitting on his bed in his guest room going through his inventory. He's looking for a magic gun, guns for Valerie. Over the week he and Sirius moved about all over Romania looking for any remnants of the Teps clan and information about the Chaos Brigade, however, the information on the later has gone cold and thus he focused on training Lefay and Valerie, starting with adding gravity seals and physical conditioning like he did with Canoe. He's still teaching Lefay all sorts of magic spells but it seems that she has a talent with the sword too. Her bloodline seems to be strong in her both magical and with the sword. This was proven by the ease in which she learned new spells and adapts to wielding a sword even healing to time magics were easily learned by her and the young witch was loving it. I'm sure I have some magic guns here somewhere. I have to organize my inventory soon, I have too much stuff in here. Ah here they are, let's see. I'll give her these they seem cool and they have infinite ammo too. Harry pulls out both handguns and uses observe on them. Ebony and Ivory. Devil May Cry series. Semi-automatic pistols, designed to rapidly fire bullets instilled with demonic power and are one of the several firearms to appear in every Devil May Cry game series. The left-handed black gun, Ebony, has been modified for long-distance targeting and comfort, while the right-handed white gun, Ivory, was custom-built for rapid firing and fast draw times. These beautiful handguns are the go-to long-range weapons for Devil Hunter Dante, however, these are modified by the game to be able to take in any form of energy and thus making them usable for both the gamer and any member of his party. A grin appears on Harry's face as he gets up and begins to look for Valerie. It took a while but he found her in the castle's garden along with Lefay. They seem to be enjoying themselves talking and drinking tea as Harry hears their giggling. He turns his gaze at a sleeping Sirius laying on the grass, he sweat drops at his godfather laziness. Both girls notice him approach and smile something that makes a smile appear on his face. Hey girls, seems like you're having fun. Both girls nodded while Harry took a seat by them. He took out Ebony and Ivory and hands them to Valerie. Here, I found these in my inventory they seem powerful and they can use your energy to create bullets. I don't know how to use guns so that's something you'll have to learn by yourself but I do know how to make elemental bullets and charge bullets so I'll be teaching you how to do that instead. Valerie stares at the guns with sparkles coming out of her eyes. They're so cool. She grabs Ebony and inspects it carefully. She then takes aim with it and charges a bit of her mana into it. The gun sparked with red and black lighting, and then she pulls the trigger, a loud bang resounds all over the garden scaring the fur off Sirius, who jumped with a buck and began to run around in a panic causing Harry to chuckle however he was also amazed at the power displayed by the gun and it seems that Valerie was too, if the excited look on her face was any hint. She grins and stares at the guns. They're amazing Harry. Thank you. Harry nods and smiles at her. 
You're welcome. We should prepare to leave soon, me and Sirius haven't found any signs of the Chaos Brigade or of any leftover vampires from the Teps clan, I'm sure they'll stay quiet for a while since their operations were stopped. Sirius walks back towards them having calmed down and turned into his human form. I'm going to miss the vampire maids, they are very pretty. He turns to stare at one who was cleaning the windows who must have sensed his eyes on her since she turned around to wink at Sirius who just boyishly grin and wave at her. Harry smiled at his godfather's antics. And as keep telling you, they're quite powerful and dangerous so, dogfighter of mine. Sirius just barks out a laugh, what's life without any danger, Harry? Besides you're just jealous of your dogfighter's charm. Harry only raises an eyebrow at him, um, I have three girlfriends, so nope you can keep your charm. This proclamation caused everyone to freeze and to suddenly turn their head towards him, it actually worried Harry that they snapped their necks with how fast they turned to gape at him, Sirius of course had to get all dramatic, yes. Hear that James? Harry is already on his way to make us proud. I sweat drop and the girls just sweetly smile at me while their eyebrows twitch in irritation causing me to start sweating bullets. Sirius just had to make things worse by asking how they look, if they were sexy or if they were cute causing a black aura to begin to flow out of the girls, I silently pray to Ishkigal to save me. In the end, I ended up describing my girlfriends to my annoying dogfighter. One is a feisty red-headed mage who is very good at wielding a whip so I recommend not to piss her off Sirius, she will whip your bollocks off. Sirius sweats and pales a bit. The other is a ninja from a village hidden in waterfalls to keep the cure. She wasn't well liked in her village and she went through a lot but she's very friendly and very powerful. She's a Jinchuriki like my friend Naruto I've mentioned before. The girls look confused at the weird terms but Sirius is aware of how hard life was for Harry's friend Naruto, he smiled sadly at me in understanding. The last one is a bit wild but kind and friendly girl once you get to know her, in her world she's known as a demon lord and she's a dragonoid, she's petty and cute but don't let her looks fool you, she's capable of devastating entire continents quite easily. This surprised both Lafay and Valerie since this world has their own demon lords and now they find out that there's more in other worlds and that their sensei was dating one, something that annoyed them a bit. Sirius nodded and proudly slapped his godson's back. I'm so proud of you Harry. Now why don't you tell me the name of my future daughters-in-law? Harry was about to speak when Elman Hilda appeared and greeted everyone. Hello everyone, here Harry this is for Yasaka, we knew you would leave soon so we prepare an official document, cementing the alliance between the vampire and yokai factions, thank you for your aid. I smile and nod at her. You're welcome Elman Hilda, I look forward to working with you and your faction more in the future. Elman Hilda smiles and nods. When do you leave? Harry closes his eyes. Tomorrow early in the morning, we've been out here for quite a while and I'm sure Yasaka is waiting for our report, it sure has been fun spending time with your clan. Sirius nods and grins at Elman Hilda which causes her to sweat drop and try to jump back only to stop when Sirius caught her and lifted her by the armpits. I still think we should take her with us, she is adorable with that kitty hoodie. This of course made poor Elman Hilda sputter in embarrassment and begin to flail around, unhand me you mutt, let me do un. We all laugh at her reaction causing her to pout cutely, she sure has relaxed a lot around us for her to act like that. I can't wait to go back and see everyone, Kanu will be excited to learn she has two fellow students now and I miss Yasaka and Ishkigal. OST, answer by Frederick and Kaina. Harry looks up to the skin with a smile on his face, the wind gently blows and he closes his eyes enjoying the breeze. Tilda tamaral naid fumidashi tamabe yui tei uga motion. Office is floating in the sky as she stares at the giant crater that once was Bran's castle with a curious look on her face. Tilda Tagai Chai Gose Kaino Hate Nimaja Watayan Jiaozu. Michael stares in concern at his father's system as his connection with it slowly continues to deteriorate. Tilda Azu no Jibun Nitoi Kekita Rogaru Senmai Nasuzu. The four Mu are in front of the Devil Council reporting the death of many purer bloods devils, many elders seemed concerned and afraid but most seemed to be glaring in anger. Tilda at Wotori at War at Ararakuda Tandana. Na itai i ma wan anji nan fun nan bi u question mark Tilda. As Azel stares out his window with a frown on his face, not noticing Kokabi eel glaring at him from behind. Tilda o moi dashite o moi dashite. So get i zentai nan dat koto de zuramu. Wakanaya wakana kunats are. Kiz yuk ataki nayo. Kasanataku main achina. Kaizatsu ite demo butsu cat demo. Use your Nimonogaru Gara. Seikai wo sagashite. 
A bedridden Albus Dumbledore is glaring at the ceiling in his hospital room, and Minerva McGonagall is standing by his bedside glaring and frowning at him. In the ministry, Amelia Bones is yelling at her as while a grinning Moody is seen behind her. A tired-looking Remus Lupin is seen arriving in Kyoto with a happy and playful grin. Tilda Utagal ne I daruite kita hibi niku kai wa ne I ka. Ashi gamoch se me otasaki wa sage no fuyukai. We see a bored canoe doing her homework, with Yasaka who is drinking some tea and smiling at her daughter fondly. Tilda kanu I markako mirai no koto. I mada shinkai rino you no botsiku. Ami fury no kokoro wodu kamitsukit. Rise them is trashing his office in a fit of anger, he glares hatefully at the floor his eyes glowing with malice. Tilda Soshite Sonot Wosash and Obit Hoshikute. Lefe and Valerie are seen playfully packing their belongings the next day while smiling happily. Tilda Omoi Dashite Omoi Dashite. Koko Ninokoru Kasu Kanahibiki Simo. Wakanaya Wakana Kunats are. Oboa Taitayo. Kasanata Kutai Kutsuga. Hate Naihodo Niyutsukushitu. Kizu Kenai Mamada Ayogara. Michigai Wodadashite. Harry is speaking with Elm and Hilda while they smile and shake hands. Sirius is running in circles in his dog form happily barking. Harry opens a dark corridor and the group wave at a smiling Elm and Hilda as they begin to walk through. Tilda Omoidashite Tsukundat. Hanreet Kizu Itanda. Mukan Janan Mina. Kokura Garagachimatanda. Michigachimat Demo. Yushinachimat Demo. Katawo Curate War. A dark corridor opens in Yasaka's office alerting Kanu and Yasaka of Harry's arrival. Kanu excitedly jumps into her sensei arms while Yasaka smiles at them. Tilda Taima Wananji Nan Fun Nan Bu question mark Tilda. Harry smiles and points at Lefei and Valerie letting Kanu down and introducing them both to both kitsunes. Tilda Omoidashite Omoidashite. Sorgatai Zantai Nan Dat Koto Dazuramu. Wakanaya Wakana Kunats are. Kizuka Takunayo. Kasanata Kumaina Chini. Kaisatsu I Demo Butsu Kat Demo. Sugairu Hibigai Tashino Wa. Yuzu Renai Monogaru Gara. Seikai Wo Sagashite. Kanu happily hugs her fellow students. Ishkigal rushes in and the moment she sees Harry she tears up and lunges at him. Harry catches her with a smile on his face and hugs her tightly.